order, please. We are uh, going to begin the daily routine. We'll start with presenting and reading of petitions. I recognize the honorable member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction relative to a petition. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, the following folks are planning to be here today um, as basic income guarantee supporters. And are, then they're here. Amazing. Okay, I'd like to introduce uh, Mandy K. Raining Bird, Chair of Basic Income Nova Scotia. If you can rise as I say your name. Colleen Dow, Cumberland County Community Health Board Coordinator. Sarah Fleming, Colchester United Way. Amy Moonshadow, Anti-Poverty Advocate. And Pierre Stevens, Treasurer, Basic Income Nova Scotia. Welcome, nice to have you here with us today. I recognize the honorable member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to table a petition, the operative clause of which is, we respectfully request that the House of Assembly of Nova Scotia form an all-party committee to study the implementation of a basic income guarantee in the province of Nova Scotia that reflects the principles laid out by Basic Income Nova Scotia, Coalition Canada, Basic Interview Income Revenue de Base and the Basic Income Canada Network. And I have affixed my signature as required. The petition has been tabled. I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth North. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I would also like to table a petition with the operative clause reading, we respectfully request that the House of Assembly of Nova Scotia form an all-party committee to study the implementation of a basic income guarantee, BIG, in the province of Nova Scotia that reflects the principles laid out by Basic Income Nova Scotia, Coalition Canada, uh, Basic Income Revenue de Basse, and the Basic Income Canada Network. There are many signatures, and I have affixed my own as per the rules of the House. The petition is tabled. Thank you. We'll move on to presenting reports of committees. Tabling reports, regulations, and other papers. Statements by ministers. Government notices of motion. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas on April 1st, Nova Scotians will pay over 23 cents in carbon taxes per litre at the gas pump, with a Liberal carbon tax increase of 3.3 cents per litre. And whereas the PC party has always opposed the carbon tax, and all parties in the Nova Scotia House of Assembly have asked the federal Liberal government not to increase it further for the damage it is doing to our economy and for the hardship it is causing Nova Scotians. And whereas tomorrow in the House of Commons, members of Parliament will vote on a motion calling on the Liberal government to immediately cancel the carbon tax hike. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature call on Nova Scotia MPs to vote in the best interests of Nova Scotians by standing up against an increase in the carbon tax. Madam Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye? Aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried. Are there any further government notices of motion? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. 
Uh, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas pharmacy professionals have been an incredibly important support to Nova Scotians and our health care system through many challenges we've faced over the past few years, and whereas pharmacies do so much more than fill prescriptions and now deliver vaccines, provide primary care services, counsel patients, and prescribe medication for a range of common illnesses, and whereas pharmacies continue to play a growing role in our health care system, employing more than 1,000 pharmacy professionals and supporting countless Nova Scotians across the province. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House join me in celebrating Pharmacy Appreciation Month and recognizing our pharmacy teams for the important role they play in our health care system and thank them for their efforts. Speaker, I ask for a waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for a waiver. Is it agreed? Agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. Any further government notices of motion? Introduction of bills. I recognize the honourable member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Peer. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to make some introductions. Yes, please go ahead. In the gal gallery and overflow, we have a number of guests to watch the tabling of this important bill on... Whew. Oh boy, I, it's, Madam Speaker, um, this bill is one for the books. So from the CLC and the Federation of Labour, we have Matt Wynott and Danny Kavanaugh, NSGEU, Sandra Mullins, Tammy Gillis, Mary Otto, John Lugas, and members of Unifor who are on strike in Eastern Passage, Jennifer Murray, Shelley Amiot, Shauna Wilcox, Patrick Murray, Shannon Sampson, Adam Slonwat White, Michael McMullen, Billy Conrad, Lisa Hale, Jessica Garrett, Matthew Blois, Timothy Rogers, Lucian Foote, Troy Smith, George Lehman, Christine Green, Michelle Sampson, Kelly LeBlanc, George Corbin, Shelley Smith, Peter, Peter Troop, Michaela, Michaela Flower, and Darlene Holland, and many others. Madam Speaker, I wish the, I thank them all for their presence here in the gallery, and I hope they can receive the warm presence of the House. Welcome, enjoy your visit here. Uh, I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Peer. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I am very proud to table this document, this, uh, this legislation on anti-scab. So I beg leave to introduce a bill, an act to amend Chapter 475 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Trade Union Act, restru respecting strike integrity and worker protection, anti-scab legislation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Peer, begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 475 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Trade Union Act, Respecting Strike Integrity and Worker Protection. Bill 435, an act to amend Chapter 475 of the Revised Statutes, 1989, the Trade Union Act, respecting strike integrity and worker protection. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. Any other introduction of bills? I recognize the honorable member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. First, may I make an introduction? Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I know this uh, wonderful woman has already been introduced in the House, but I want to uh, introduce her again and ask her to stand. Ms. Colleen Dow from Cumberland North. And I want to acknowledge her and the work of all of Cumberland Housing and Homelessness Association, sometimes known as Cornerstone. They have worked tirelessly in our community, Madam Speaker, for opening a shelter and for those in need. So thank you so much, and please join me in thanking her. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to table a bill entitled An Act Respecting the Remuneration of Educational Assistants and Substitute Teachers. Thank you. 
The Honourable Member for Cumberland North begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act Respecting the Re Remuneration of Educational Assistants and Substitute Teachers. Bill 436, an act respecting the remuneration of educational assistants and substitute teachers. Order that the bill be read a second time on a future day. <laughs> Any further bills? No? Great. We'll move on to not notices of motion. I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Shebucto. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas, in October 2023, the government cut the amount of financial assistance available under the Heating Assistance Rebate Program, or HARP, from $1,000 to $600, while also cutting the income threshold for eligibility under the program by $10,000, from $85,000 to $75,000, and whereas in January 2024, the government cut eligibility for the $400 financial assistance available under the Home Energy Assistance Top-Up, or HEAT Fund, from an annual to a basis of every second year, thereby rendering every beneficiary of the program in 2023 ineligible to receive the $400 grant in 2024. Mm -hmm. And whereas these cutbacks have taken place at a time of intense cost of living pressure on precisely those most affected by this aggregate withdrawal of $800 in annually available help with heating, a time of grocery price inflation averaging just below 10% in the last two years, of average annual rent increases of 11% and of 14% power rate increases in the last 12 months, therefore be it resolved that the House instructs the Standing Committee on Public Accounts to consider the untimely and damaging impact of these cutbacks in assistance with heating, and further instructs the Committee to bring in a bill requiring the government to replace the financial support that has been withdrawn. Madam Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? No. There are several nays. The notice of motion will be tabled. I, rec I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel Sable Island. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Two-Spirit is a pan-Indigenous term that was created in 1990 in Winnipeg to start the process of reclaiming nation and culturally specific terms of identity amongst Indigenous peoples on Turtle Island, Two-Spirit resurgence being a part of a healing and decolonizing process and is celebrated annually on the spring equinox each year for the Two-Spirit Celebration and Awareness Day, and where an increase in Two-Spirit community visibility improves health outcomes of community members and contributes to a society in which all individuals are valued and celebrated for their unique identities and contributions, and where the government of Nova Scotia, and indeed all Nova Scotians, are treaty people, committed to the implementation of the Peace and Friendship Treaties, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada calls to action, the 2S, L, 2S Missing Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls calls for justice, and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Therefore, be it resolved that the House Assembly, the House of Assembly directs the Standing Committee on Health at the earliest opportunity to summon witnesses and provide an examination of how the Government of Nova Scotia can better support Two-Spirit people in Mi'kma'ki, including recognizing Two-Spirit awareness and celebration on the spring equinox of each year. Madam Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? Agreed. There are several nays. The notice of motion is tabled. Just a friendly reminder to our wonderful visitors in the gallery that there are to be no photos taken. Notices of motion. Any further notices of motion? If not, we'll move on to statements by members. 
I recognize the Honourable Member for Queen's. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Before I begin, I beg leave to make an introduction. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Speaker. In your gallery, the Speaker's Gallery, I am honoured to introduce Abigail Smith, a talented young athlete from Queen's County who has impressed us all with her skills and determination in the sport of judo. Abigail, I would ask that you and your father, Troy Smith, to please rise and accept the warm welcome of the Legislature. Welcome, enjoy your visit. I recognize the Honourable Member for Queen's. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to congratulate Abigail Smith from Brooklyn on being selected to compete in judo for Team Canada at the 30th International Thuringia <laughs> Cup in Germany. Uh, in addition to this impressive accomplishment, at the start of this year, Abigail was selected to be one of 12 True Sport Ambassadors for Nova Scotia in 2024. And I understand May is her month, so stay tuned and watch for Abigail. At just age, uh, just 15 years of age, Abigail has already achieved so much in the sport of judo. She continues to train tirelessly to achieve her ultimate goal of one day representing Canada at the Olympic Games. Immensely talented and determined, she also carries out her own fundraising activities to finance her training and competing, receiving enthusiastic support within the local community. Abigail recently posted that she lives in the best community in Nova Scotia. I say, Abigail, we are just so happy to have you. You are such an inspiration to young girls and to me, and I am your biggest fan. I wish you all the best. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Yarmouth. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to make an introduction before I make my statement. Yes, please go ahead. I believe we are joined in the gallery by members of the wine growers of Nova Scotia, uh, Emma Cassidy and Justine Lalonde. Uh, I believe Haley Brown is also watching, watching from home. Uh, I'd ask the members to provide uh, those members with a warm welcome to the House. I recognize the Honourable Member for Yarmouth. Madam Speaker, for 22 years, the wine growers of Nova Scotia have built awareness of the wines of Nova Scotia brands, serving as a voice for local wineries. They aim to work closely with all levels of government to grow the industry and expand market opportunities for Nova Scotia wines. Under the leadership of the current Executive Director, Haley Brown, Nova Scotia's wine sector has a strong advocate that strives to build excellence throughout every aspect of Nova Scotia's wine industry, as demonstrated particularly over these last few weeks. This important organization helps forge partnerships, attract investment, and catapults Nova Scotia wine onto the world stage, where our locally grown and produced products have continuously won international awards. Madam Speaker, join me in thanking the wine growers of Nova Scotia and the entire Nova Scotia farm wine sector who have ramped up our local economy with their efforts from one end of the province to the other. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg <clears throat> leave to make an introduction. Yes, please go ahead. My voice holds out. Thank you. Um, we are also joined somewhere today by Gina Luckett, proprietor of Luckett Vineyards, um, as well as Steve Ells, the president of Grape Growers Nova Scotia, and Carl uh, Cantillo, the of the wine producers of Nova Scotia. So I'd ask the members to give them the warm welcome of the house. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to recognize a cornerstone of Nova Scotia's wine and grape growing industries, Luckett Vineyards. In the year 2000, the entrepreneur Pete Luckett <coughs> bought 92 acres of land in the Gaspro Valley. Everyone, of course, will know Pete Luckett from his segment on Live at Five uh, and from Pete's Fruitique, where he introduced Nova Scotians to a world of vegetable and fruit produce and signed off with his signature catchphrase, toodle de doo Pete and his team, like so many wine growers in our province, work to overcome the climate challenges and develop their winemaking processes, and in 2010, opened the winery's cellar doors. The winery continues to serve Nova Scotians and tourists alike, and is a beloved destination for anyone looking to take in the best our province has to offer in food, drink, and beauty. I'd also like to recognize Gina Luckett, who has taken over management of the winery and is part of the next generation of wine growers in Nova Scotia. I ask the whole house to join me in recognizing Luckett Vineyards and all who contribute to this vital sector of our economy. 
just a reminder to the members to keep the chatter down, please. We also have the fans on, which is making it really difficult to hear. So uh, please just uh, decrease the chatter. I recognize the honorable member for Kings North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I make leave to make an introduction. Yes, please go ahead. Madam Speaker, there are a number of uh, winery owners and member, uh, people in the industry who are my neighbours in Kings North and friends. I do want to introduce uh, John Eichlenboom, the owner of 1356 uh, Church Street Winer, John McClarty and Lisa Law, Planters Ridge Winery, Melanie Eelman, Beausoleil Winery, Amory Mutart, Edgemere Estates Farm, uh, farm. So these are literally my neighbors. And I uh, also want to introduce Steve Ells, uh, president of the Grape Growers Association of Nova Scotia, a longtime friend. His father was uh, MLA for Kings North in this legislature, and also Glenn Ells. And also, uh, 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 I was privileged to be in business with his father in Kings Produce Limited and Agro Kings Canada Limited, which was a joint venture with the Republic of Cuba. So a very long uh, association with Steve's family, which have been tremendously to my benefit. I appreciate them very much. So, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, uh, on behalf of the PC Caucus and uh, myself, I want to say how much we appreciate the wine industry in Nova Scotia, the hard work that we do. We understand that they have been transformational in tourism in our province and their efforts to create a unique uh, culinary and uh, the wine uh, experience is deeply appreciated. By, by our caucus. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Sydney, member two. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I do also want to recognize uh, that we do have in the gallery today uh, representatives from, uh, Plant, uh, from Planters Ridge and Port Williams, uh, John McClarty and Lisa La and Wendy Collins. I ask you to uh, rise and be recognized by the host. And Planters Ridge Wine, refounded in 2010, John McLarty and Lisa Law left Ontario and planted roots in Nova Scotia when they bought an historic farmhouse in Port Williams and founded Planters Ridge Winery. They wasted no time planting their first grapes in 2011. Planters Ridge Winery opened its doors in June 27, 2014, and since then the winery has expanded to deliver locally grown and produced Nova Scotia wine. Planters Ridge has become an award-winning winery and has accomplished some of its own personal goals, such as becoming the first vineyard in Nova Scotia to, pro to produce the Viognay grape, I hope I'm saying that right, Madam Speaker, which they successfully accomplished in 2018. Madam Speaker, join me in thanking Planters Ridge Winery Winery and the entire Nova Scotia farm wine sector who have ramped up our local economy with their efforts. I recognize the honourable member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pierre. Madam Speaker, it has been 22 days since Auto Port Workers Unifor Local 100 went on strike. On day one of the strike, CN Rail brought in scab workers. For 22 days, workers have faced disrespect and indignity as CN and Autoport use the courts and scab workers to try and break the spirit and resolve of their employees. Bringing in scab workers prolongs strikes and escalates tensions. This employer rather union bust than negotiate fairly. This is precisely why anti-scab laws are needed. We stand in solidarity with the striking workers at Autoport. CN Rail must end the use of scab labor and bargain in good faith. Solidarity. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Kings North. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction. Yes, please in, go ahead. Madam Speaker, in your gallery we have a remarkable young lady who is at the top of her field both academically and uh, athletically. Haley McDonald is uh, the recipient of the Governor General's Medal as an academic All-Canadian which is an incredible achievement. Madam Speaker, I will ask that Haley and her parents, Chris and Scott, stand to rise and warm up, accept the warm welcome of the house. Welcome to the, well, no, welcome to the house. Um, I recognize the honorable member for Kings North. Madam Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Haley McDonald of Port Williams, who has recently been honoured with a Governor General's Medal for Academic and Sporting Excellence. <laughs> Haley was one of eight honorees selected among 4,900 student-athletes who achieved U Sports academic all-Canadian status in the 
22-23 season. Haley is Acadia University's all-time leading scorer, the winner of the Atlantic Sport University Sport Women's Basketball Most Valuable Player Award and the James Bayer Memorial Scholarship Award. She was named First Team Youth Sports All-Canadian for her excellence on the court while maintaining a 4.08 grade point average that she complete, as she completed her master's degree in sociology. Haley is an exceptional role model for young athletes as the founder and director of Lights Out Elite Skills Basketball Camp for girls grades 4 to 12. Please join me today to congratulate Haley McDonald as a top eight academic All-Canadian. I recognize the honourable member for Cole Harbour. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I too would like to make an introduction. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Today in the gallery joining us are guests from Grape Escapes. Please stand as I call your name. Colleen O'Reilly, Terry McCullough, Randall Dennison, John David Goosens, Susan Downey, and Alan Saunders. I ask the host to greet them with a warm welcome, please. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cole Harbour. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, today I rise to recognize Grape Escapes, a locally owned business that offers tours to Nova Scotians and tourists alike to many of our beautiful wineries. You can hop into one of their vehicles in Halifax or in Wolfwell, Wolfville to get the experience and knowledge from their local tour guides and safely enjoy some wine, delicious bites across various wineries that they stop at. Grape Escapes recently uh, just had their 12th season in 2023, operating wine tours seven days a week from May through October. Madam Speaker, Grape Escapes makes for the perfect tourist attraction to, many, to the valley, but also serves many Nova Scotians wanting to explore wineries in our province or celebrate life events such as birthdays and uh, bachelorette parties. Because of our wineries, tourism, business, Grape Escapes thrives. It showcases all that Nova Scotia has to offer. Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank Grape Escapes for, and the entire farm wine industry sector who have ramped up our businesses in Nova Scotia. I recognize the honorable member for Antigonish. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction. Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, so I rose earlier to recognize Farm Appreciation Month, and since we have so many guests today, I, um, I couldn't find the folks I was planning to introduce. So my sincere apologies. So in the gallery today, we have representatives from the Pharmacy Association of Nova Scotia, and I don't want them to leave without accepting the warm welcome of the House. So Lori Deals, the chair of the board and pharmacist, please, there you are. <laughs> Lovely to see you. Martha Lowe, communications manager for the Pharmacy Association, welcome. And also uh, Kayla Byron, who's a pharmacy technician. So please Please give them a belated warm welcome in the house. Yay. <laughs> I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel Sable Island. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction relative yes. to my member statement. Um, uh, I, I ask all members to extend a warm welcome to folks who I don't see in the gallery, but I know they're somewhere in uh, the People's House today and hopefully watching downstairs. Um, I'd like to recognize some folks from Lightfoot and Wolfville, Mike Lightfoot, Rachel Lightfoot, um, Josh Horton, Chris Campbell and Steve Lee. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel Sable Island. Madam Speaker, one third of the Earth's soils are degraded. Degraded soils have less life and structure to hold water and plants. They also lose their carbon content, which is emitted into the atmosphere as CO2, worsening climate change. There's lots that can be done to help our soils be healthier. This past July, Renner's Regeneration Canada and the Atlantic Canadian Organic Regional Network worked with Lightfoot and Wolfville Vineyards to host an innovative event on the principles of soil regeneration. 
Head wine maker Josh Horton led the way through Lightfoot and Wolfville's certified organic and biodynamic vineyards. Making the connection between land and science, Dr. Victoria Levesque from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada presented her research on organic input for regenerative vineyards and how it leads to better yields. Participants also enjoyed a meal by Lightfoot and Wolfville chefs Brittany Livingstone and Kale Harlow using ingredients produced right on the land. Madam Speaker, I thank Lightfoot and Wolfville for hosting this important event. There has been a request to revert back to uh, government notices of motion, but as you all know, we can only do that with unanimous consent. Do we have consent to revert back? Yes. Okay. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Community Services. Madam Speaker, uh, could I do an introduction first? Okay? Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, Madam Speaker, I rise today to make an introduction to the three representatives from People First Nova Scotia, a self-advocacy group of members who have been labeled with an intellectual disability. Their vision is that all citizens have an opportunity to live equally in their community. I ask the gallery to recognize Lita Jarvis, a member of People First for over 25 years. Lita hosted the Rebuilding Hope Conference last November as Nova Scotians came together to learn about the remedy. Gina Widden, as the Vice President of People First Nova Scotia, has been a member for almost 20 years. Uh, Jeannie, I'm sorry, was part of the Freedom Tour Nova Scotia documentary and has helped set up several new chapters of People First. And Cindy Carruthers, the Executive Director of People First Nova Scotia, a champion for cr of creating change in community. Madam Speaker, people with disabilities in Nova Scotia, their families, caregivers, and advocates were at the heart of the transformation of the Disability Support Program in Nova Scotia as we move towards a truly inclusive Nova Scotia. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Community Services. I hereby give notice that on a future date I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas People First supports individuals who have been labelled with an intellectual disability to speak for themselves, advocate for themselves and make their own decisions. And whereas Nova Scotia is committed to the human rights remedy and transforming support for people with disabilities and moving toward truly inclusive communities across the province. And whereas people with disabilities in Nova Scotia will be empowered to make their own choices and decisions on the supports they need to live a good life and community and ultimately help us build a more vibrant, diverse and welcoming communities across Nova Scotia. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of the House join me in congratulating Lita Jarvis, uh, Jeannie Whitten, Cindy Carruthers, the Disability Rights Coalition, People First and all peoples with disabilities in Nova Scotia on this much deserved recognition and com be committed to doing our part to support the remedy and help build a more inclusive Nova Scotia. Madam Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? Agreed. agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye? Aye. Contrary minded? Nay. The motion is carried. I recognize the Honourable Member for King South. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Oh, sorry. My apologies. I should have notified everyone that we're going back to member statements. I recognize the Honourable Member for King's North. King South. King South. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to make an introduction. Yes, please go ahead. So, uh, today we are joined in the gallery uh, by folks from Demanda Grand Prix Winery and uh, I ask them to please stand and receive the warm welcome of the house when I call their names. Kyla Dunn, Lee Chipman, Nick Morris, Matthew Morris, Tanya McGuinness and Jim DeCock. I recognize the honorable member for King South. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize Domaine de Grand Prix Winery. In 1994, Hans-Peter Stutz saw a vision and the potential of no that Nova Scotia had to offer and came from Switzerland to take on Domaine de Grand Prix Winery. The oldest farm wine winery in all of Atlantic Canada, Grand Prix has paved the way for stimulating the local economy and the wine sector in the Annapolis Valley and throughout Nova Scotia. 
Grand Prix prides itself on making wine that is made from 100% Nova Scotia grown grapes and fruit, and their efforts are recognized through numerous provincial, national, and international awards and accolades they've received over the years. The Stutz family, including Hans's wife Anna, son Jörg, and daughter Beatrice, have continued to grow and expand their business over the years, and I can't wait to see what they do next. Madam Speaker, join me in thanking Demand to Grand Prix Winery and the entire Nova Scotia wine sector who have ramped up our local economy with their efforts. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. While the Practice Energy and Movement Centre is located in Dartmouth South, uh, one of the co-owners, Laura Keeley, lives in Dartmouth North. Thus, I feel uh, qualified to make this statement. Recently, the Practice, co-owned by Amy Tatry, was awarded the Canadian Choice Award for Best Yoga Studio in Dartmouth. The Canadian Choice Award recognizes small and medium-sized businesses that are at heart and this, that are at the heart and soul of this country's uh, business community. Located along the shore of Lake Bannock, the Practice aims to create space for community movement and stillness through yoga, cathartic cardio and meditation. Just over a year ago, members of our very own NDP caucus and staff attended a yoga class at the practice in support of the YWCA. I ask the House to join me in congratulating Laura, Amy and the practice team on receiving this great honour and thank them for keeping Dartmouth and we in the NDP caucus moving and mindful. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Kings West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Before I read my member statement, may I beg leave to make an introduction? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, in the East Gallery today, uh, I, I'm very honoured as the MLA for Kings West to have uh, four guests who've uh, come from CFB Greenwood here today uh, to uh, help mark the uh, celebration of the 100th year of the RCAF this year. And uh, as I call your name, I'd like to ask them all to stand. Um, so uh, Colonel Jeff Davis, base commander for CFB Greenwood, um, Corporal Sarah Ruff, Lieutenant Sophia King, and Acting Base Warrant Officer Steve Bates. Um, any of us who, who uh, represent a military community in our constituency, we know the, the, the wonderful uh, contribution that our military makes in our communities and how much they, they give to our social fabric of our area. So I want to uh, ask all members of the House to please, they are the best of us, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to ask all members of the House to give my guests a warm welcome today. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Kings West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. April 1, 2024 marks 100 years of service for the Royal Canadian Air Force as a distinct military element. The centennial milestones place the RCAF in a unique position to honour its distinct heritage, recognize its tremendous people, and generate excitement for its bright future. I am honoured to represent a constituency with an RCAF base 14 Wing Greenwood. The RCAF's legacy is woven into the fabric of Nova Scotia, and 14 Wing Greenwood serves as a testament to its enduring impact. The personnel stationed in Greenwood exemplify the values of courage, integrity, and excellence. As we reflect in the past century, this is an opportunity to look forward to the future with optimism and resolve. This year, 14 Wing Greenwood will be hosting many celebratory events, including the return of the amazing Air Show Atlantic. I ask all members of this House to join me in celebrating 100 years of the RCAF and thank all those who serve. May we continue to uphold this legacy with pride and dedication for years to come. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Annapolis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to make a couple brief introductions before my member statement. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. In the West Gallery, I'd like to introduce, who's uh, previously been introduced, Carl Cotino, President of Avondale Sky Winery, also Chair of the Nova Scotia Wine Growers Board. And beside him, I'd like to introduce Kelty McNeil of Benjamin Bridge, one of my favourite people on the planet. I think my wife knows that. Uh, welcome to you both in the House, and I encourage everyone to give them a warm welcome. Thank you. Welcome, enjoy your visit. I recognize the Honourable Member for Annapolis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize Avondale Sky Winery. In 2019, the Catino family bought Avondale Sky Winery and Restaurant and have continued the mission to keep the winery local, sustainable, and flourishing. Avondale Sky harvests every grape in the vineyard by hand, and their wine is 100% local. 
The winery has won multiple awards, including the Lieutenant Governor uh, Award of Excellence in Nova Scotia Wine, and we're all very proud of them for making award-making wine with their 100% Nova Scotia grown grapes. Madam Speaker, join me in thanking Avondale Sky and the entire Nova Scotia farm wine sector, and welcome to many of whom are here today. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Needham. Madam Speaker, workers in our province deserve protections. As we speak, CN Auto Workers are on strike. Unifor Local 100 are asking for good jobs and fair pay. The House of Commons recently passed a bill through second reading to prevent the use of scab labour during strike action and labour disputes. Other jurisdictions across our country have a form of anti-scab legislation, and Nova Scotians deserve the same protections. Anti-scab legislation is a smart move and one that all parties should get behind. Do it for every person who put their ballot in for you. All of our constituents, all Nova Scotians. I would ask all members to join me in solidarity with our workers on the line and on the job. Our workers in this province deserve protections in solidarity. I recognize the honourable member for Argyle. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to make a quick introduction not related to my member statement. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I do want to quickly draw the member's attention to the, I believe, West Gallery or East Gallery? East. Uh, East Gallery uh, joined, uh, joining us today is my mom, Odette. Uh, decided to take in some of the uh, goings on here in the legislature, and always happy to have her here. So. Nice to see you. Welcome. I recognize the honourable member for Argyle. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize a local non-profit dance organization, Kidzak. Kidzak was formed in 2000, 2006 by dance instructor Deanna McCarran, who wanted to make a difference in the lives of young people through music, song, and dance. It has since grown to over 300 members from the ages from ages three to 18 who learn dances like hip hop, acrobatics, break dance, and dancer size tots. In its new studio location in Tuscan, an empty space was converted into a small cafe, The Dancing Bean, providing a welcoming place for kids to hang out and for parents to visit while their kids dance. Madam Speaker, I ask all members of this House to join me in congratulating and commending Kids Act members on their dedication to dance. Treasure the camaraderie, embrace the memories, and continue to wow audiences with your energetic performances. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to make an introduction. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We have several guests today from Lightfoot and Wilfill that were recognized. I'd like to recognize them again. I believe some of them are in the gallery. We have Mike Lightfoot, Rachel Lightfoot, Josh Horton, Chris Campbell, and Steve Lee. Lee. If you could all rise and receive the warm welcome of the House. Welcome. Nice to have you here. I recognize the Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to recognize Lightfoot and Wolfville, which is owned and operated by co-founders Jocelyn and Michael Lightfoot. Michael is a seventh generation Annapolis Valley farmer and the third generation to farm the current land where the winery sits today, a beautiful property in Wolfville. Jocelyn is a certified sommelier and a number of their children have worked in the business. The Lightfoots began planting grapevines for wine production in 2009 and the first wines under Lightfoot and Wolfwood label were released in 2015, with the winery hospitality facility opening its doors to the public in 2017. The Lightfoot family has farmed in the Annapolis Valley for eight generations and put their blood, sweat and tears into the land that is now a successful and award-winning winery. Madam Speaker, join me in thanking Lightfoot and Wolfville and the entire Nova Scotia farm <coughs> wine sector who have ramped up our local economy with their efforts. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax, Shebecto. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to mark the achievement of their first collective agreement by the mechanics, service technicians, service support and parts staff at O'Regan's BMW on Kemp Road in Halifax, making them the first unionized service centre at a Halifax area car dealership. Yeah. The 22 members of Unifor Local 4005 at O'Regan's ratified a three-year contract in January a contract which moves top-rate technicians from $28 to $34.50 an hour. 
and provides 2.5% increases in all job classifications in years two and three of the contract. The new collective agreement also provides for paid sick days, RRSP matching, and 11 paid holidays. A first collective agreement is always a milestone for a new union. And this is particularly true for uh, uh, when it's the first union in a new sector. The members of Unifor 4005 at O'Regan's BMW deserve every credit for what they have accomplished. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honourable member for Shelburne. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize Tammy and Dwayne McClellan and congratulate them on opening District 33 Winery, a 14-acre vineyard and tasting room located in the picturesque Jordan Bay in my county. District 33 Winery first produced their wine and cider this past summer to amazing reviews and were nominated by the Chamber of Commerce for the Rising Star Award. Although September Hurricane Lee wreaked havoc on the grapevines, that didn't stop them, Madam Speaker. Production continues. Their L'Acadien Blanc was chosen as the official wine for the Nova Scotia Annual Lobster Crawl 2024. And Madam Speaker, I respectfully ask all members join me in wishing them every success in the future. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honorable member for Bedford Basin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to make an introduction for my member state. Yes, of course. Today in the gallery, we have several members of the Grape Growers Association of Nova Scotia, and I would ask the guests to rise. Some have been previously introduced, surprise, surprise, uh, but I ask them to please rise to receive the warm welcome of the House. Please welcome Steve Ells, M Melanie Eelman, Anne-Marie Muttart, Naeem Khan, and Vanessa Lentz. Welcome. I recognize the Honourable Member for Bedford Basin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. For 35 years, the Grape Growers Association of Nova Scotia has provided education, training and research to help grow the best quality grapes possible here in Nova Scotia. With more than 100 members, the association has been instrumental in the success and growth of the grape growing and winemaking industry in our province. Their work on a strategic vision for the industry led to 20 wineries and 1,000 acres of vines under cultivation by 2020. Members of the Grape Growers Association have allowed the industry to flourish and have expanded the market for wine made from good quality Nova Scotia grapes. Um, I, I'm very fond of their products. Um, Madam Speaker, I ask all members of this House to join me in thanking the Grape Growers Association of Nova Scotia and the entire Nova Scotia farm wine sector who have ramped up our local economy with their efforts. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I ask that after I read my member statement that members may join me for a moment of silence. Madam Speaker, today I rise to honour the life of veteran Russell Clark of Amherst. Mr. Clark, who would have turned 100 today, passed away last Wednesday. In his youth, Russell Clark served with the North Nova Scotia Highlanders Militia, and when he turned 18 in 1942, he joined the Royal Canadian Artillery and went overseas on July 20, 1943. Gunner Clark was posted to Bramshot, England, and on D-Day, he was assigned to traffic control and there watched the first casualties come back across the channel. He later served on the Dutch-German border, where he aided in stockpiling ammunition for the push against the Rhine River. After the war, he became a lieutenant with the militia in his hometown of Amherst and was always proud to participate in Remembrance Day ceremonies and countless other local events. Plans were underway to hold a 100th birthday celebration for Mr. Clark in Amherst this past Saturday, but unfortunately he passed away before that could take place. Madam Speaker, please join me in extending condolences to Russell Clark's family and in honouring the life of this true Canadian hero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Please stand for a moment of silence.
I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Peer. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to recognize the Tompkins School Choir under the creative guidance of their teacher, Nancy White. I have been privileged to watch this beautiful choir for two years at the Remembrance Day services at Branch 78. Listening to the Tompkins School Choir is an experience. The thought and care put into their performances of each song is what makes this choir a true experience, Madam Speaker. Their rendition of Highway of Heroes by the Trues will leave you in a sea of tears. Trust me, I know. I want to thank Nancy White and the Tompkins School Choir for sharing their time, talent, and love of performing with us. I look forward to hearing them again soon, and Madam Speaker, it should be said that they are elementary students and their voices are beautiful. And uh, again, I just want to recognize them in this house. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as the 53rd Annual Juno Awards approach, antis anticipation bills, especially for Cape Breton's own Morgan Tony. Morgan and his Mi'kmaq County Folk Fusion Fiddlers EP Resilience has been nominated for the Traditional Roots Album of the Year at the Juno Awards, Juno Awards this weekend here in Halifax. Morgan, as a fiddler and singer, has a unique blend of Celtic folk and Mi'kmaq melodies that he dubs Milkmatic. The 24-year-old Morgan, who hails from Ogmacook First Nations, is not only a mus musician, but is a cultural ambassador as well. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to please join me in recognizing Morgan Tony and to wish him well at this weekend's Juno Awards and continued success in the future. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Dartmouth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg leave to make an introduction before my member statement. Yes, please go ahead. Today, on behalf of the Lost Bell Winery, we have Jill Delaney with us in the gallery. And I ask Jill to please rise in the East Gallery and receive the warm welcome of the House. Welcome. I recognize the Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Dartmouth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Lost Bell Winery is one of Nova Scotia's newest wineries built on the land and legacy of Sat Fami Winery, the third oldest vineyard in Nova Scotia. And I'm proud to say St. Fami was also led by Suzanne Corkum as Nova Scotia's first female winemaker and as general manager Jill Delaney and the team at Lost Bell Winery are writing the next chapter of this vineyard and carrying on the legacy of this historic business. Jill and her colleagues, Tony Barkhouse and Glenn Fraser, are working to launch a new winery experience with a tasting room that will showcase their delicious wines. Madam Speaker, please join me in thanking Lost Bell Winery and the entire Nova Scotia farm wine sector who have tremendously ramped up our local economy with their efforts. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel Sable Island. Madam Speaker, I rise today to honour the Wabanaki Two-Spirit Alliance. The Wabanaki Two-Spirit Alliance is a group of Mi'kmaq, Wostuliak, Passamaquoddy, Abenaki, Penobscot, Innu, Inuit and the Métis of Labrador First Nations Two-Spirit people and includes volunteers, researchers, academics, knowledge holders, youth and elder Wabanaki Two-Spirits and allies. Their mission is to represent the emotional, spiritual, mental and physical well-being and interests of Two-Spirits and Indigenous LGBTQ plus individuals and groups in Wabanaki territory. That includes Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI, Newfoundland and Labrador, the Gaspé region of Quebec and Maine based on beliefs and values in the framework within the Peace and Friendship Treaty. On March 13th and 14th, the Alliance hosted a regional gathering of 2S LGBTQIA plus organizations in Halifax to take collective stock of where we are and where we need to get to. Over 60 people attended from about 40 organizations. Madam Speaker, I would like to thank the leaders, elders, staff and volunteers who helped pull together this historical gathering that will surely have long-term positive outcomes in Mi'kma'ki. I recognize the Honourable Member for Colchester North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
Madam Speaker, I rise today with great pride to commend the exceptional talent and hard work of Rowan Durning of Spencer's Point. Rowan recently showcased his incredible freestyle skiing skills at the Canada Cup in Sun Peaks Kamloops, where he astounded audiences with his skill in the freestyle big air event, securing a well-deserved silver medal. Uh, Madam Speaker, not stopping there, Rowan also impressed in the slope style event in er earning him a bronze medal. Madam Speaker, on February 28th, Sport Nova Scotia named Rowan the Cleves Source for Sports January Athlete of the Month Senior Male. Madam Speaker, the community of Colchester North is busting with admiration for Rowan's achievements and we eagerly anticipate cheering him on in his future endeavours on the slopes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Madam Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction before my member statement. Please go ahead. Today in the gallery we have a few representatives from Benjamin Bridge Winery. I'd ask they stand uh, as I read their names. Uh, we have Heather Smith, Kelty McNeil, Eric Ferraro, Ma Marie Eve Joshua and Ashley McConnell Gordon. I would ask the, for, the, for the House to give them a warm welcome, please. Welcome. I recognize the member for Clayton Park West. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize Benjamin Bridge Winery. Benjamin Bridge was founded in 1999 by Jerry McConnell and his late wife, Dara Gordon, who shared a passion for contributing to a sustainable rural Nova Scotia. Benjamin Bridge is Canada's most acclaimed sparkling wine house, nestled in Nova Scotia's picturesque Gasparo Valley, known for their ionic Nova 7, my favorite wine. Jerry and Dara's uh, twin daughters, Ashley and Devon, now lead the small family like team and continue the vision started by their parents 25 years ago. Madam Speaker, join me in thanking uh, Benjamin Bridge Winery and the entire Nova Scotia farm wine sector who have ramped up uh, our local economy with their efforts. Thank you. Order, order. The time is now <coughs> 2 o'clock, almost 2.01. We will begin questions by members put to ministers and uh, we will finish with a few minutes or a few seconds extra at the end. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, Madam Speaker, it took three weeks of sustained pressure inside this House and without for the Premier to actually finally meet with the grape growers and local wine producers in Nova Scotia. We know, however, that based on freedom of information requests, that the Premier had met with the two commercial bottlers uh, times, many times since 2022. Madam Speaker, why did it take three weeks of public pressure and bad headlines for the Premier to do the right thing, meet with our local fine representatives, and uh, agree to pause this dangerous plan that he had in place that could have jeopardized them all? I recognize the Honourable Premier. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And we're big, big, uh, big fans of the industry for sure, supporters of the industry over the years. Uh, uh, brings uh, incredible potential to grow that industry. So uh, I'm pleased that we had a, a productive meeting last night. I know leading up to that, uh, the ministers had been, had been meeting with the group. I was happy to be able to meet with them last night. But, but I think I think the reality is is that there's so much potential uh, for for the, for the province in that industry, but in so many other industries. We need to grow the economy of the province. That's all we're trying to do. I I, I hope the member doesn't take doesn't take a, a offense to trying to uh, grow the economy of the province. That's what we're trying to do. We, we don't always get it right. When we don't, we, we try to we try to try to fix it, and we'll do that here too. As well. I recognize the leader of the official opposition. Madam Speaker, it's, it's very clear that you don't grow the economy by putting $250 million of our economy in farm wines in jeopardy. That's not how you grow the economy. That's how you kill our rural economy. And the fact is the Premier met with commercial bottlers two years ago. It took sustained pressure from this chamber and from the industry representatives who didn't take this issue laying down, and I'm proud of them for not doing that, for him to actually meet with them and agree to pause with this. Why did it take so long for the Premier to realize how important this sector is and that his plans could have jeopardized the whole thing? 
recognize the Honourable Premier. Uh, th thank you, Madam Speaker. And I just, uh, I certainly don't want to give uh, the member the impression that he had any impact on this decision. He, he certainly did not. Uh, we've been we've been supporters of it, this industry for for quite some time. Uh, I, I think that it's uh, there's agreement that there are different sectors to the industry. They can coexist. We need to get that right. Uh, there's there's a desire. Uh, from stakeholders across the spectrum to grow the industry. I share that desire. Uh, we'll, 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 find, we'll get the right path forward. I'm confident in that. Uh, that's what we all want. We all want better things for, for Nova Scotia. We grow incredible grapes here. Incredible grapes here. The, the potential for the industry is, is, is not just potential, it's being realized that we're seeing it in increasing sales. So we'll continue to, to look for ways to, to make sure that we do what's right by all Nova Scotians. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his final supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm absolutely not taking credit for this. What happened is very obvious. The Premier got caught doing the wrong thing for the wrong reasons, and he didn't have a leg to stand on. First, this was a trade issue. Now it's an economic development issue. There's been no evidence produced that either of those things had anything to do with this change. Madam Speaker, the Premier says he's pausing the subsidy to commercial bottlers who are importing juice to compete with local wine growers. But we've heard from the Minister of Finance that the government has already dished out money to commercial wine bottlers already. Could the Premier please confirm if that's happened, if this program in fact hasn't been paused, and how much money has been pr provided to commercial bottlers in forms of subsidy? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. The program has been in place since January. There's, there's multiple programs. They all initiate at the same time. Uh, so we, we're going we're gonna to work to make sure we get it right. We've agreed to that. Uh, we'll work in that in good faith. We're sincere. Uh, we want to grow. We want to grow, grow the sector, and and the members should just be careful with his with his phrases. I mean, uh, getting caught is something that happened with the member with the Auditor General's report on the theft of public money. That the Auditor General was very clear. The Liberal Party tried to conceal until after an election. We're not caught on anything. We're acknowledging. We're acknowledging that there's a way to maybe get this a little better. We're committed to doing that, and we will make sure that that happens. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the leader of the new Democratic Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Let's talk about the economy. Workers in our province have our backs day in and day out. Unfortunately, their employers don't always have their backs. Look at the auto port workers, for instance. Less than eight hours into failed conciliation, leading to the now 21-day strike at the auto port in Eastern Passage, the employer brought in scab labour. And because our province does not prohibit the use of scabs, the auto port workers, everyday Nova Scotians, being slammed by the cost of living and wages that don't keep up, are now negotiating for a fair deal in a weakened position. Is this what the Premier meant by a better paycheck guarantee? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to I recognize what an incredibly uh, difficult situation the labour dispute is. Uh, three weeks is, a, is an awful long time, and um, I, they are everyday Nova Scotians. In fact, I had a chance to, to share with some of them today. That's where my grandfather spent his career actually at the auto port. I uh, lost my grandfather at work one day. I suffered a heart attack in the, in the lunchroom there. So I have a, uh, it's a small province, it's a small world. I have a, a certainly a lot of emotions around, around the auto port and I have great respect for the people that work uh, at the auto port and the incredible service that they, that they provide. Uh, and I'm hopeful that this can be resolved at the table and people can get back to work. The leader of the New Democratic Party on her uh, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'm glad to hear that because the Premier has an important role he could play here. Mm -hmm. Jess, a worker at the auto port, wrote, Imagine reaching out to your company and asking for a fair and equal contract for all employees, a fair and equal chance at getting back to living without the fear of losing it all if there's just one expected bill or unexpected bill or emergency. Imagine being told you don't deserve it. Imagine watching scab workers come in within hours of going on strike and trying to replace you and the job you've been doing for years. And I'll table that. Will the Premier use the legislative tools available to ensure that workers like Jess actually have a shot at negotiating a fair deal? I'll table it after. I recognize the Honourable Premier. Thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker. And obviously those are, are difficult things to hear uh, from um, so, somebody like Jess, who just wants to get up and go to work and provide for their for their family and with a, with an honest day's work. So those are difficult things to hear, for sure. I think everyone in this chamber would would, would feel those emotions and have empathy uh, for for the situation. And we're we're hopeful 
that the, the, this can be resolved at the table and people can get back to work and, and, and get going again. That's, that's where this thing, uh, these situations can be resolved at the bargaining table. We believe in the collective bargaining process. I think we've shown that where we've been involved as the employer in a number of situations, tough, difficult uh, negotiations, but I believe in the collective bargaining process and I support that process. <clears throat> The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party on her final supplementary. Uh, it's widely recognized, including by all parties at the federal level, that the collective bargaining process is strengthened by banning scab labour. That is the role that the Premier could play here. Two weeks ago, Unifor, representing the 240 striking workers, wrote to the Premier, urging him to address the issue of scab labour, calling on the provincial government to recognize that workers in Nova Scotia deserve the ability to collectively bargain fair contracts that help support themselves and their families free from the threat posed by the employer's use of scabs that only drag out strikes and worsen an already difficult situation. Unifor requested a meeting with the Premier to discuss this, but such a meeting still has not <coughs> taken place. As the Premier said yesterday in estimates, there are times when the Premier's presence matters. Will the Premier commit to meeting with the union representing the auto port workers? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker, and um, I, I, you know I know the minister is, is keeping certainly a close eye on this file, um, and we'll 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 we'll, we'll be um, committing to to supporting the collective bargaining process and and hopeful that there can be a resolution at the table. That's where these things that's where these things are, are resolved, and we hope that that's the case in this situation as well. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I'm concerned about the Speaker's pause on this uh, program to subsidize the importation of, former, of foreign grape juice to compete with our own wine sector. Uh, he is doing this pause after potentially millions of dollars have already been given out by the Treasury to commercial Minister. bottlers. Uh, my question to the Premier is, Will he not only pause this program, will he end it so that taxpayers' money is not used to import cheap foreign-produced juice to compete with our own locally grown grape and farm wine sector? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, as everybody is well aware, we had a good meeting yesterday evening uh, with the entire wine sector. And uh, the member is correct. There's been a move to pause uh, the support for commercial wines. Um, but I would point out to the member that it was in 2015 that his own government started a support program for companies uh, that are commercial bottling wine in this province. Uh, so I would point that back out to the member that it obviously was not such a bad idea under his own government. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. And, and, and does the Minister remember hearing the outcry from the industry that that decision could have been catastrophic to them? Does the, does the Minister remember that? No, it doesn't because we've actually grown the farm, farm wine sector. We've grown the farm wine sector up to $250 million from one end of the province to the other. Uh, Madam Speaker, the government is saying they're going to pause this program. They're not saying they're going to end it. That's my concern. I'm worried that this is just another ploy to get this out of the headlines so they can get back to work and have the meetings that they had with the commercial bottlers as they began two years ago. My question, my question to the Premier, Madam Speaker, will the Premier commit to ensuring that taxpayers' dollars are not used to subsidize the importation of cheap juice to compete with our locally grown and produced products that are award-winning across the globe? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, speaker, the member can question uh, our sincerity if he wishes. That's his right to do. Um, but I would also remind him once again, uh, the charge he has just made against us was a policy his own government put in, Madam Speaker, and to use his words to subsidize foreign grape juices coming into the province, Madam Speaker. So um, one of the questions I had asked uh, at one point is, why is, why is the differential the way it is between commercial bottlers and farm wineries in this province, Madam Speaker? And there wasn't a, a clear answer. So maybe the member opposite can tell us why uh, they put the amount they did in for commercial bottlers in this province back in 2015. The leader of the official opposition on a new question. And, and I love how the story keeps changing with this government. First, they're doing it because it's a trade issue. 
Then it's economic development and to pursue all the opportunities you have for economic development. Now the minister says it's because of the Liberal Party <laughs> that they decided to do this. My question to the minister, can he actually get his story straight for once on this issue, please? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. M Madam Speaker, I, uh, this is question period. I'd like the member to answer one of my questions. <laughs> It was his own government that started this policy for commercial bottlers in 2015. Um, yes, it is a trade issue. Yes, it is an issue of economic development, Madam Speaker. Uh, but there is no question that this really did start as a trade issue. Australia made a complaint. Uh, we have to change uh, what's in place because it's not compliant. Uh, we didn't come up with that, Madam Speaker. That was a trade deal that was uh, arranged far away from this legislature by the Government of Canada with other countries uh, when there was a free trade agreement signed. The Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And in not one case in every other jurisdiction that was implicated in this did those provinces say we're going to subsidize the importation of Jews to compete against our own? Not in one case. And they didn't do it because that's not the trade issue. They didn't do it because there's not economic development opportunities in doing that. The real economic development opportunities are in the agriculture side of the sector, where money is put in the ground, where capital is built, and where here in Nova Scotia we have a sector worth $250 million and employ 1,100 people from one end of the province to the other. Does the minister understand the significance of that sector, and will he commit to not using more taxpayers' dollars to subsidize the importation of cheap foreign juice to compete against our own, which the sector has said his program would have been catastrophic to them. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. Well, Madam Speaker, I don't know why he's running down a sector of the Nova Scotia wine economy that his own government supported in 2015, being the commercial wine sector. But I will tell the member uh, that not only myself, but a number of my colleagues who have these wineries and their constituencies greatly value the contribution that they make in the local economy and in the prov provincial economy as a whole. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, so I remain an optimist. Uh, I look forward, we had a meeting a few minutes ago uh, with some representatives from the firm and grape growers. Uh, and Madam Speaker, uh, my hope is that when we get to, to the end of June, we have something that satisfies compliance for Australia and is something that everyone feels good about. I recognize the Honourable Member for Bedford Basin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The, in, the infusion of taxpayers' money into the commercial wine support program would have had catastrophic effects on our Nova Scotia farm wineries. At a bare minimum, this government should have consulted with the two associations, the grape growers and the wine growers, that actually represent this industry. But instead of working with the sector, this government just notified them 72 hours about this augmentation to the program. Why didn't the Minister of Finance at least do the bare minimum and consult with the two associations? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, Madam Speaker, this has been a long process. It, it actually started almost four years ago. Uh, we're getting to the end of that four-year period, which is why we have the deadline at the end of June, uh, where we must have a system in place uh, that is trade compliant. Uh, so, Madam Speaker, this has been going on for a long time. There's been a lot of consultation. And we still have until the end of June. And once again, I would say that I remain an optimist. I am hopeful. Uh, that the industry as a whole will feel good about what's in place by the end of June. I recognize the Honourable Member for Bedford Basin. Madam Speaker, it's very clear this government consulted with the two commercial bottlers well in advance. I'll ask the Minister of Finance again, why didn't he ex extend the same courtesy to the representatives of the grape and wine growers? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, I know there's been all kinds of meetings, phone calls uh, with department staff, not only from F Department of Finance, but f from the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, and I know we've been working with the wine industry in the province. Uh, the Polar Vortex funding, significant investment 
uh, to help them deal with uh, the, the weather impacts they've had to deal with. Uh, we know that uh, grapes in the ground, vines in the ground, uh, that grow the grapes that are needed to make Nova Scotia wine, uh, it takes time, it takes a lot of investment. And so there's been all kinds of consultation in the past. We have all kinds we can point to, and I want to point to the fact that there'll be lots more coming before the end of June. Yeah, good job. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Yesterday in estimates, the Premier acknowledged that the commercial wine bottling program had already begun and then spent the better part of two hours avoiding having to disclose when the checks were cut for bottling companies and how much has been paid out. Now the program has been paused, but Nova Scotia's farm wineries and grape growers and the taxpayers footing the bill still deserve to know how much have we paid to the two commercial bottlers who are eligible for the program. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, Madam Speaker, there are certainly fair questions. Um, and I would, I would advise the members to uh, remember that this whole issue started with a trade complaint. Um, and uh, because there were margins at the NSLC, uh, Madam Speaker, that gave a preference to Nova Scotia wines. And um, so the sales uh, of, of those wines um, have an impact on trade. Um, so I would ask... Uh, I would ask the members to be uh, understanding of that point uh, because it's one that uh, certainly is the basis for which supports can be offered to the wine sector. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Nothing in the trade decision talked about money to commercial bottlers, which is what I am asking about. That is not an answer. Uh, with a mixture of agricultural and business skills, local farm wineries have grown the wine sector in this province exponentially. Instead of recognizing this, the Premier diminished the incredible growth of the local wine sector in recent years by telling them to just ramp it up. This is after, of course, the government quietly supported their friends at Devonian Coast. We have that price tag with $250,000 of our money to implement a commercial bottling program and an undisclosed sum on a commercial bottling program. Investments in our farm wine sector doesn't need to be a matter of trade compliance. Agricultural subsidies are not the matter of trade disputes. Can the Premier tell us if he intends to introduce what the farm wineries have been asking for, support for growing grapes through the Department of Agriculture? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Finance. Madam Speaker, there are definitely fine points uh, to the uh, trade laws that we are working within, uh, and there's no question um, that it has been established that certain trade, sport, trade supports are compliant. Um, I will say that uh, as long as the support is compliant, it does not matter uh, from which government department that the support comes from. I recognize the Honourable Member for King South. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Now, we've heard from this government on this wine uh, commercial bottlers uh, program a lot about trade and a lot about economic development. And they move back and forth. We don't know where, where they're at from one day to the other. So let's move trade over here. Let's just talk about economic development. The, the Minister talks about the, the commercial bottlers getting support. Yeah, they got support of 120% markup instead of 140% markup, where our fine wi farm wineries were 43%. So a small benefit to the commercial bottlers. The question is, do they even need it? My question to the minister, do the com why do the commercial bottlers need a subsidy? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, once again, that would be a great question for his own former government, because it was they who put it in place. Uh, so, Madam Speaker, I would, I would recommend he contact some of his former colleagues and find out why that happened. Uh, but, you know, these are questions that will be answered as part of uh, what happens between now and the end of June, uh, because, as was stated earlier today, um, that out of the meeting last night, the support for commercial wineries has been paused and uh, we're going to have more conversations with the entire industry to come to something what we hope will be at the by the end of June is something that's trade compliant and something that is of uh, people feel comfortable with. The Honourable Member
member for King South. Well, clearly the minister decided to bring in a program and gave equal benefits to those two aspects of the sector. So let's talk about what a competent government would do when they're investing taxpayers' money in economic development. Millions of dollars of taxpayers' money will be used to subsidize uh, an industry. Where's the economic analysis? A competent government would do an economic analysis. How many jobs are going to be created? What is the spin-offs? What's the growth in GDP? What are the rural jobs created? Farm, wi farm wineries have that economic study. They've presented it. 20, uh, $250,000 $250, of economic development and 1,100 jobs. Could the minister please table the economic analysis that will guide the government's decision with respect to commercial bottlers? And if he does not have that, will he present that before any decisions are made? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Finance. Madam Speaker, when I asked the question to the department, there was no economic analysis for why the member's own former government put in place the level of support they did for commercial wineries in this province back in 2015. But I can tell the member uh, that there's been a significant, there's a significant amount of product on, on shelves at the NSLC that is not bottled in this province. Uh, and they're uh, behind this uh, thinking of supporting the commercial bottlers was an effort to try to uh, bring some of that business into Nova Scotia. I recognize the honorable member for Annapolis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As agriculture critic and valley-based MLA, I'm certainly proud uh, to welcome Avondale Sky and, and Carl Coutinho to the uh, gallery today. Avondale Sky is known for harvesting all their grapes by hand. Their products and wines are 100% local. Businesses like Avondale Sky are important to the tourism, economic development, and of course the agriculture industry in the Annapolis Valley region. BC and Ontario provide agriculture subsidies through the Department of Agriculture to support local wineries. Why has the Minister of Agriculture refused to provide an agriculture subsidy to Nova Scotia's farm wineries? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Uh, we've, uh, we've invested millions of dollars through the last number of years in our farm winery sector. Uh, you look at uh, the polar vortex funding, $15 million that uh, came out very quickly. Not all of it for, for farm wineries, but the majority of that money will go towards them, Madam Speaker. Um, we have a regular agricultural uh, program uh, agreement with the federal government, SCAP. Uh, wineries are uh, can apply for uh, funding under that program. Uh, we have uh, we had response following Fiona. Uh, there was an extension support through Perennia. Uh, we're talking about the Nova Scotia wine quality standards, uh, polar vortex funding, which I mentioned, and as well, uh, part of our, our transition out to EWERP, Madam Speaker, is a green box funding a wine and grape industry development program that we're developing with industry that will support industry going forward. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Annapolis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The grape growing and wine sectors are thriving and successful because of the blood, sweat and tears of all these people in the gallery here today. Surely the Minister understands the importance of supporting these industries. When is the last time the Minister of Agriculture toured a Nova Scotia farm winery to understand the decades of hard work that go into these businesses and producing wines of this calibre? Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I can't recall the last time I actually toured a winery, but uh, you don't have to be on a winery to understand the importance of what farm wineries bring to our province and our economy, Madam Speaker. Um, we have those conversations regularly. Uh, as recently as uh, a half hour ago, we had that. And we understand, Madam Speaker, about the importance that, uh, that these businesses provide to our rural economies. That's why we're listening. That's why we pause the program. And that's why we'll continue to work with them going forward. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Pros Timber Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And one of the success, success stories of economic development uh, in the previous government was this thriving wine sector. We had many wineries growing and even new ones. Uh, Lightfoot and Wolfville was one that opened in 2017 uh, with visitors coming and from Nova Scotia's even offering wedding services. 
to be able to meet the growing demand of its patrons, Lightfoot and Wolfville has expanded to over 100 employees, and that's just one Nova Scotia farm winery. We know there are at least 1,100 jobs provided by this sector, paying $2.5 million in wages. My question to the Minister of Economic Development, did her department evaluate just how many jobs could have been lost as a result of the Commercial Wine Support Program? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Economic Development. Thank you, Madam uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. And relative to a question that was just asked of my honourable colleague, uh, Minister of Agriculture, I was sitting here saying, ha-ha, and I know when I was last uh, in wine country, because last summer I took the opportunity, uh, along with my husband, had an extraordinary day and learned so much about this industry and the award-winning uh, wines that we have produced. We absolutely understand the value and that's why as my department we continue to work with individual businesses in programs like IRP and export development. Again, millions more dollars that we invest in this very, very important industry. I recognize the honourable member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank the answer. But the question is, does the, was there any specific involvement with the department that is tasked with growing the economy in Nova Scotia with this type of support program for commercial bottlers? Lightfoot and Wolfville has invested $15 million in Nova Scotia farm wine industry. The economic spin-off that is generated from these businesses can't be understated. My question to the Minister of Economic Development, given that there is just a decision to pause this program, will she ensure her department fully participates in any future wine support program? program, this one, or any modification of a new commercial development program. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Economic Development. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, it is true that this is an important sector of our economy, but to, to answer, uh, largely the discussions in around this particular issue have been led by my colleagues, the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Agriculture. I have been briefed at all points. Uh, but in terms of the work of the Department of Economic Development and our agency, Invest Nova Scotia, we work one-on-one -on -one with businesses on their unique opportunities for growth and, of course, the conditions for business success in Nova Scotia. Again, particular, particular programs that have been well used, Export Development Program and IRP. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier. Madam Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour. The House of Commons recently passed a bill through second reading with all party support to prevent the use of scab labour during strike action and labour disputes in federally regulated industries. Workers in British Columbia and Quebec are already afforded this protection. My question to the Minister, don't Nova Scotian workers deserve the same protections too? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Labour, Skills and Immigration. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for raising this important question and recognizing that there isn't at this point in time legislation for Nova Scotians in this particular space. And I really appreciate the member bringing it forward and knowing that there is a bill that the member made sure that was on my desk to take into consideration. I know that as minister, when something is brought forward, I want to be able to take it forward to my team to make sure that we're looking at how this is going to impact workers and employers across this province in a variety of different sectors, because we want to make sure that if anything is interrupting the conciliation services, that we take it into consideration and advisement, Madam Speaker. Good job. <laughs> I recognize the honourable member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I, I look forward to uh, he seeing a seeing a bill from the government side come forward. It makes sense why it makes sense, Madam Speaker, why other jurisdictions are passing such legislation. Anti-scab policy leads to shorter strikes and better deals being reached at the bargaining table. In contrast, strikes involving scabs have lasted six times longer. The best route forward seems obvious. So would the minister agree that restricting scab labour is simply common sense? 
I recognize the Honourable Minister for Labour, Skills and Immigration. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite for raising this important question. And I know that we're going to have a, another conversation and more to come as we look at this piece of legislation that's been brought forward. And again, Madam Speaker, as Minister of Labour, I want to make sure that conciliation and mediation services are available to anyone in their time of need. And of course, going to the negotiation table is where those resolutions need to be resolved. And so making sure, again, that we take this into consideration, we do a jurisdictional scan to see what other provinces have in place, look at that legislation that the federal government has put forward. And that's all part of the work to come there, Madam Speaker, and we are committed to looking at it. Yes. Good job. I recognize the Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Dartmouth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Earlier today, I was proud to announce Lost Bell Winery as one of Nova Scotia's newest wineries built on the land and legacy of Saint Famille Winery, the third oldest vineyard in Nova Scotia. Lost Bell Winery is an up-and-coming business planning to open up a tasting room, as I said earlier, and a wine, a new winery experience. But they would add more jobs with this, more tourism opportunities, and put more money back in the local economy. However, this government's handling of the wine sector has put the potential opportunities of new businesses at risk. So my question to the Minister of Economic Development, how can anyone have confidence in this government to starting and growing a wine business in Nova Scotia? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Economic... Oh, sorry. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Egg Culture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would uh, respond to that by saying that uh, as a government, uh, we've been there to support the industry um, through through the phase out of EWERP, uh, through the polar vortex, uh, through our new uh, agricultural uh, programming that we have coming, um, and through this program as well, Madam Speaker. Um, we've we've listened to industry. We've worked with them. We've kept uh, kept the lines of communication open. Uh, you know, I uh, like to think I have a good relationship with Carl Patino, who's uh, who's here today uh, with the wine growers, and Steve Ells with the grape growers and uh, as well madam speaker um, you know we uh, their importance is impressed upon me not just by by folks like Carl and Steve but by our colleagues on the government side I think of the member for Kings North uh, the member for Hans West uh, Kings West uh, you know lots of lots of support for this industry within our government and we'll continue to support industry going forward thank you I recognize the honorable member for Coal Harbor Darkmouth we heard earlier that this government might not always get it right, but it's obvious that the Nova Scotia wine industry has gotten it right. This government promised the Nova Scotia Loyal Program, but it's not working with and for the local wineries across Nova Scotia. We want to encourage more Nova Scotians to build businesses in Nova Scotia, including new wineries. But Lost Bell Winery is going to deal with more hurdles and challenges due to the government's mishandling of the wine sector. So my question to the Minister of Economic Development, how will this government ensure that their decision-making decision carried out without proper due diligence will not negatively impact new business from emerging in Nova Scotia? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Economic Development. Madam Speaker, uh, thank you. Thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, my department and our colleagues across government work every day with businesses from all sorts of sectors. We created Invest Nova Scotia with the specific purpose of creating a one stop for that first call, whether you're starting a business, whether you're growing a business, whether you're looking at new opportunities. So again, I'll point to the opportunities within our specific agency of Invest Nova Scotia, like the Export Development Program, which several uh, wineries have taken uh, uh, opportunity to use the innovation rebate program. We're supporting McConnell Gordon Estates Limited, whom we we know as Benjamin Bridge, to make a major Thank capital you. investment I to increase storage. I recognize the honourable member for Clayton Park West. Madam Speaker, Benjamin Bridge's Nova 7 is the perfect example of how our Nova Scotia farm wine can put our province on the map. This. This, this t trailblazing blend has captivated the palates of people all over the world. Nova Scotia has a unique territoire that has an immense potential. Madam Speaker, in order for Nova Scotia wine to reach its full potential, the government needs to step up uh, to support the sector, not punish our farm wineries 
for their successes. My question to the Minister of Agriculture, does the Minister not see the value in elevating our local wine sector? The Honourable Minister for Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And yes, we absolutely do see the value in uh, in improving our sector. We've uh, we've invested through the last number of years, so the last five years, uh, 4.9 million dollars just to the grape industry, Madam Speaker. Uh, Eight million dollars, including farm loans. Uh, when you want us to talk specifically about winery, when we talk about the 15 million dollars for the polar vortex, Madam Speaker, 22 million dollars in investment in the wine sector through the last five years, Madam Speaker, and that, uh, as well, five million dollars for the farm loan board uh, for a total of 20. $27 million of investment through the last five years. Not all our government, but a lot of that money in the last three years. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Madam Speaker, our, winer, uh, our farm wineries need to feel valued for the hard work they put in day after day, year after year, and generation after generation. The minister would know how they feel if they just listened to them and answered the many questions and many emails they've put to the department. My question to the Minister of Agriculture, um, uh, moving forward, do you pledge actually consult th that you will consult with the sector before you make these decisions? Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Agriculture. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And as I mentioned earlier, um, lots of conversation with the sector, uh, Carl and the wine growers, Steve Ells and, and the grape growers. Um, and, and again, our colleagues in caucus here uh, are great representatives of, of agriculture and farm wineries. I mentioned a few of them earlier. But uh, will, we, will we consult? Yeah, we're going to consult. We, we, we said that 45 minutes ago. We're going to keep working with the farm winery sector going forward. As we, and we listened, we paused this program, and we, as the Minister of Finance said, we have until June to, uh, to put a final bow on it, and that's what we'll do. We'll keep working with them going until then. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honorable member for Sydney, member two. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, in 2010, John McLarty and Lisa Law left Ontario and planted roots in Nova Scotia, where they bought an historic farmhouse in Port Williams and founded Planters Ridge Winery. Our unique landscape has clearly been successful in attracting vintners from across the country and world, and it will continue to ramp up our potential even more, repurposing old farmhouses and farmland to become farm winery. My question to the Minister of Agriculture, did he not see how this government decision could scare off future farm wineries from starting up in Nova Scotia. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, I had a chance to speak with John and meet John. I know uh, the Minister, uh, the member for Kings North is a, is a good friend and knows him very well and uh, certainly pressed upon me um, you know, what they've put into their business. And uh, we certainly appreciate that. And we don't want uh, anyone to feel like we're trying to work against them. And that's why we sat down with industry. We committed to taking a pause and we'll work with them for the next few months to get this right and go forward. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sydney, Member 2. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I know there's a lot of back and forth going on today, but when I hear you met with them 45 minutes ago, why today? Why couldn't you meet with them before when you were in the media saying that this was the right program for everyone and everybody can ramp up? So meeting with them today, you should have met with them long ago. Madam Speaker, the government has no plan to grow the economy, no plan to help people who own businesses here already, no farm succession planning, no plan to encourage more people to start up businesses that will help grow the economy right across the province. Instead, they almost and continue to hurt one of the most important sectors by choosing not to support farm win wineries in Nova Scotia. My question to the Minister of Agriculture, how can business owners from out of province be confident that they can successfully start an agriculture business in Nova Scotia. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, a lot to unpack there. Um, how can how can someone be confident? Uh, I just made a list of investments that we've made as a government in the sector in the last number of years. We've listened. It's not just about investing, it's also about listening, Madam Speaker, and we've done that. Uh, 
It didn't just happen today. Uh, we've been talking to industry for the last number of months, last number of years, but on this specific uh, subject, the last number of months, uh, the Minister of Finance and I have met with them. There's been an open dialogue. The, uh, the uh, Car Carl from the wine growers and Steve from the grape growers know they can call, they can text anytime. I'll have a conversation with them. This all started with a deal that the previous government gave this industry, Madam Speaker, and we're cleaning up that mess. We're doing it in healthcare, we're doing it in housing, we're doing it in education, we're doing it in public works, and we'll do it in Order, 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 I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Despite the fact that it's illegal for landlords to deny someone's rental application because they have children, in reality, this happens all of the time. One of these parents is Alec Alexis Dingwell, who has applied for hundreds of rental units in her budget but has been denied because she has a young child. She's been on the public housing waitlist for years and was recently denied a rent supplement because she doesn't have a new lease. In the meantime, she and her son are living in a room in a house with 10 people. What does the minister, the Minister of Municip Municipal Affairs and Housing, have to say to families across the province who are facing increased barriers to housing under this government's watch? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Municipal Affairs and Housing. So, Madam Speaker, uh, the, the reality is we're very aware of the housing uh, situation across the province. We did a massive study on housing. We know that there's an issue in every part of the province. Every community is growing uh, under, uh, in, our, in our time, and we know that the housing crisis is there. That's why we're making a historic investment in public housing to build 247 new units in public housing. We have a, an action for a housing plan, which uh, will include uh, $1.7 billion spending over the next five years. So we recognize the depth, the depth of the crisis. We recognize that we need to do many different things on many different fronts to make housing more affordable for Nova Scotians, and we're working hard on that. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And working hard doesn't get her son out of a home living with 10 people. Um, private market housing is not the solution. This government continues to subsidize private developments, but our vacancy rate remains at 1% and rents continue to rise. I don't know about you, but the numbers don't work out for me. Human rights legislation is meant to protect families in these situations, but it's failing without an adequate supply of truly affordable housing. We need more public and nonprofit housing, and we need it fast faster to ensure that families like these don't have to experience the extreme stress of not having adequate housing. So to Alexis and other families like hers across the province, private rentals are not the solution. When will this government substantially invest in truly affordable housing? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Municipal Affairs and Housing. So, Madam Speaker, what I can tell you is that we are investing in uh, affordable housing across the spectrum. In fact, it, we've invested a significant amount of money in the North, North End Community Health Association uh, in, uh, over the last couple of years in a number of different projects, some right in your own constituency uh, to the member, I would say. So we're, we're lifting the boat of community housing across the province and uh, not-for-profit housing, co-op housing. And we've done that uh, really uh, because it was a, rec a recommendation of the Affordable Housing Commission report, which came out in May of 2021. Uh, we recognize that and we've made a substantial investment in community housing and we will continue to invest. I recognize the honorable member for Coal Harbor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This government's ill-thought-out commercial wine support program wouldn't have just hurt the wine industry. It would have jeopardized our tourism businesses like Grape Escapes. Each year, thousands of visitors flock to the Annapolis Valley to visit our beautiful vineyards and drink our delicious wines. Um, safely transported by tourism companies like Great Escapes. Without the hundreds of thousands of visitors our wine region, to our wine region each year, this company would simply not exist. My question is to the Minister of Tourism. Is your department aware of the number of businesses that exist solely because of the success of the farm wine industry? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Tourism. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and um, personally, I sure do. Uh, I've been to some of those wineries in the Valley in the past. 
I was actually going to take my family down there last summer and we couldn't find a way to make it happen. Uh, but I've been to them before and uh, I actually hope to visit them come the end of June uh, and my hope is that they're going to be happy with what's in place uh, for the, uh, the entire wine industry in this province. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 150,000 tourists come to Nova Scotia annually to experience the rich and unique wine experiences our province has to offer. In more than 40 years since the farm wineries have built a successful wine industry in Nova Scotia, producers have worked hard to overcome the negative stigma of poor quality grape juice that, that, uh, comes, that they've been fighting against. Subsidizing grape juice, subsidizing this could reverse the moment, momentum that this industry has worked so hard to build. My question to the minister, concern, are you concerned their support, that your support for the commercial bottling industry could negatively impact Nova Scotia's reputation of very good wine? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Communities, Culture, Tourism and Heritage. Madam Speaker, we would never want that to happen. Um, and there's no question, people coming to the province want authentic experiences, uh, the kind of experiences that no, only Nova Scotian wineries can offer uh, to somebody who's coming and visiting and wanting to have quite literally a taste of Nova Scotia. So um, we are fully supportive of them. Um, and I also want to say this, I'm also minister responsible for the NSLC. And uh, as I recall, I mean, the consumption of alcohol as a rule is going down. But Nova Scotia wine sales are strong, uh, and I do believe it's because it's rooted in that authentic experience. So we want that to continue for sure. I recognize the honourable member for Fairview Clayton Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Blomin and Estates is home to some of Nova Scotia's oldest vines, with planting dating back to 1986. Blominant is one of several wineries in Nova Scotia that produces 100% Nova Scotian grown grapes and wines, including the 100% Nova Scotian Tidal Bay. Officially launched in June 2012, Tidal Bay is the first wine appellation for Nova Scotia and a one-of-a-kind for North America, and there are now 14 different types of Tidal Bay. Madam Speaker, the industry is just getting started. The Minister has referenced supports in reaction to issues faced by the industry. But my question for the Minister of Agriculture is, why doesn't he see the value of investing in this sector and putting Nova Scotia on the map? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We absolutely do see the value of this sector. Uh, we've talked about investments. Uh, I'd like to talk about the Nova Scotia Wine Authority, Madam Speaker. That's uh, legislation that we brought in. was my first piece of legislation, Madam Speaker. $1.5 million to establish that. And the questions around percentage of grapes, and we, we believe in Nova Scotia grapes. We want to see as much Nova Scotia grapes in our wine as possible. The Nova Scotia Wine Authority will do that. It will allow customers, allow consumers to know exactly how much is in their bottles. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Order. The time allotted um, for questions put by members to ministers has expired. I recognize the Honourable uh, Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that you now leave the chair and the House resolve itself into committee the whole House on Supply. Motion is carried. We'll take a few. I recognize the honorable member for Clayton Park West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to speak to the budget and to the budget estimates. Uh, no. And I first would like to thank all the courageous women, uh, brave women who shared their stories with me about the Find It Early Act and the, what, I, what I have been speaking about and what I have learned so much about in the last year. So many of the, uh, many of the, the women came to the legislature on March 6. Uh, there were so many of them that a large group had to watch from the lobby. I want to thank Dr. Paula Marcato, PhD professor of the Canadian Breast Cancer Foundation Atlantic Region and endowed chair in breast cancer research. 
also Cheryl Coffin, who, who, was, who was so brave to agree to share her story of interval cancer that was missed on a regular mammogram. Both of them joined me at the press conference and I was so delighted to have them. I'm humbled really to stand here on their behalf as well as nearly half of the Nova Scotia women who have dense breast. Almost 50% of women in Nova Scotia have dense breast. And I wish I knew this, or how important this information is. And I'm trying my hardest to educate all the men and women, because all the men in this house have daughters, sisters, and mothers that they should care about and listen to this information that I had to I had to learn the hard way, unfortunately. Um, the stories <clears throat> is what gives me uh, the strength to fight uh, for additional screening. Cancer in women with dense breasts is often discovered when a woman feels a lump after a normal mammogram. And that's exactly what happened to me. I've had my mammograms for 10 years because my mother was diagnosed with early breast cancer in her 70s. So both my sister and I were eligible to have mammograms in, uh, as I think I started in early 50s. But, you know, my mammograms were always clear. I did get in 2019 and 2020 the uh, information about dense breasts, but honestly, I didn't understand what it really meant, what is this, the, the risk that I was under until um, so th in 2022, I had a lump in the same breast and I went to the doctor. It took me about a month before I really took it seriously. <clears throat> and she sent me for my mammogram and ultrasound and all came out clear. That was February 22. So, you know, I was all very happy and as usual, clear mammogram. <clears throat> but not even six months later, I had another lump on the same breast. So I said, oh, I'm sure it's negative. If, if the first one was negative, this would be negative. So I, it took me, I think, three or four months before I really uh, spoke to the doctor. And then she sent me for a, a mammogram and ultrasound. And I remember clearly it was March 6. And it was funny that it was March 6 again that I did the press conference and delivered. And it wasn't on purpose. But March 6, I was going to speak at a women's International Women's Day event, putting my boots on, and my family doctor called me and said, Rafa, unfortunately, the results of your mammogram have come back, and you have 95% chance of malignancy in that lump. I just was shaken, but I ignored it and went to speak at the event until I got home to realize, what, what does that mean? And he said, you need to go have a biopsy as soon as possible. As soon as possible took about two weeks and I had my biopsy, but the result of the biopsy took about uh, three weeks to four weeks. And that was an excruciating time. It took so long for me to have the result of what I actually have. I knew I had a high risk of 95%, but what type of cancer, what do I have? I had no idea. <clears throat> anyway, so that, that phone call changed my life beyond what I can honestly describe to anybody, what all the appointments, all the decisions I had to make, uh, what is right, what surgery should I have, how long. But I do remember clearly, May 2nd, I, it was my birthday, my 60, um, 61st birthday, I was on my bed crying, begging for the operation, for the surgery. Because now, after the biopsy, that lump that was the size of a nail has become the size in, in less than two months. I was very concerned, very worried, because now the lump is four or five times the size, and I could feel it. So I needed it out. And it took until May 12th, and actually my uh, surgery was supposed to be June, but somebody canceled and I was rushed in. But it took three months almost to have an operation after my biopsy. And I'm told in Ontario, maximum I would have had to wait is two to three weeks. So it was three months. Here, that was, these are all the little things that went wrong 
as I learned with this diagnosis, is the delays, is the, is the lack of communication sometimes that we don't understand what is going on. But I love the staff. They are so overrun. They are so, uh, they don't have time to call you back, to, to educate you, to do things. And I met some of the most beautiful uh, uh, nurses and, and doctors, but you know, they couldn't get me in any earlier. They couldn't get my biopsy any earlier. That what used to take two weeks in pathology, now is taking three months, guys. Remember that. Just remember that. This is what I'm told. Um, so finding a lump after a clear mammogram is called interval cancer. That word I didn't understand, but that's what interval cancer, and that is what I'm trying to um, uh, really impress or make you understand that 50% of women have dense breasts. Did you know that? Half of us here have dense breasts. Am I, Ms., uh, Mr. Speaker, sorry. So half of us, half of the women in Nova Scotia have dense breasts, C or D. And what that does, dense breasts increases the risk of interval cancer. And interval cancer, as I said, is when the mammogram says you're clear, but it's not really true because it can't see it. The, the tissue of dense breast and the tumor, they show up as white, very similar, so they get missed. And that's exactly what happened to me. If my cancer was found in February 22, I would not have had mastectomy. I would not have to have chemotherapy. And what I'm astonished at is how many women who I have met in the last year who have my story, but a lot, a lot worse. Some of them have had 10, 15 chemotherapy sessions. Stage four, I was the lucky one, really, that I ended up with four sessions of chemo instead of 10. And the hell that I went through, I cannot imagine that we are allowing that when we know we can help to find it early and not have to. And on top of it, it makes economic sense. It, it is cheaper and less expensive for the government to find it early and not put us through the hell. This should be in the budget and we need to speak up. I'm speaking to every woman because they're just as ignorant as I was about dense breast. I didn't understand what dense breast meant. And the high risk, 40% of the mammogram, if you have a dense breast, will miss, can miss the, the, the tumor. That's scary. Really scary, the numbers that are there, and how many women. 70 women showed up that day that I don't know who they are. I've spoken maybe to 10 or 15 of them, but 70 showed up because they understand. They've gone through what I've gone through. Yeah. So I, I have many costs for MRIs and, and this, and I will end with that. But I also wanted to, to share with you that Nova Scotia has been a leader, a leader in many screening practices, but not this one. Uh, we have self-referral for mammograms at age 40. Uh, only four other provinces have that, and self-referral continues after the age of 74. Not all provinces have that. We have annual screening for women at age 40 to 49. We have many things that have helped find cancer early, but this one, but one essential practice for the 50% of women is missing. And please, go home and ask your wives, your sisters, your your, your daughters, if they know what their density is, and inform them. Inform them that they should ask questions. I wish I knew that in 22, I would have asked a question. And, and, and the lady who came to the um, uh, press conference said that. She said, her, you know, she went to her doctor, who she had a wonderful relationship with, and asked her, you know, dense breast is telling me that I have high risk, so what are you gonna do for me? And she said, unfortunately, in Nova Scotia, I have not, you, you are, we are denied for anything that we ask. We're denied for ultrasound, we're denied for MRI, we're denied for everything. And I, listen to this, guys, uh, have now cancer, you know, I'm a cancer survivor, and I have the other breast that I can't have. 
an ultrasound or uh, MRI. But my sister, who hasn't gone through cancer, in Ontario, gets abbreviated MRI. So just imagine that. Imagine the woman in Nova Scotia, the disadvantage of 50% of the women in Nova Scotia compared to the women in Ontario or in BC. We need to wake up and have all the women understand what I had to go through to understand that I, I would have probably flown to Toronto. My family are there. I would have done an extra MRI. I would have paid for it if that's what it meant. But I didn't understand the risk that I was under. And I would have saved the government. I, I estimated, I was stage two, so I estimated my mastectomy is 50 to 60 grand. My, uh, Four sessions of chemo, which is very little, is at least 100 grand. What BC is doing right now, they have added a technology to the same mammogram called contrast enhanced mammography. That machine is 100 grand, $100,000. Just my chemo would have covered that. And it would have given so many women an opportunity not, or, or to not to have to go through the hell that I went through. I want to save my daughters, your daughters, and your sisters. And I want you to educate them. Please follow me on, on Facebook, follow me. I'm putting all the information that I've been blessed, have been working with Dense Breast Canada who educated me about this risk and why Nova Scotia need to do this for the women here. We are making a mistake in not offering and catching it early and, and saving money, but saving quality of life. I've met with at least three women who are not working. They're government workers. And they've gone through the hell I went through and worse, but three years without work. Cheryl, who was at the um, <laughs> press conference, works part time because she can. I literally, if I do six hours, I go home and crash. I, ran, I cycled 30 to 60 kilometers, and now as I go up the stairs in the legislature, I have to stop and take a, a break before I can make it all the way up. That is not a quality of life that I, that I ever imagined, and if I could have stopped that, I would have done whatever I could. But I didn't understand, and I want you to understand and help me, please. Uh, so. Let me just tell you a few things as well. Women with dense breasts are considered high risk, um, are not considered high risk in Nova Scotia, and they do not qualify. Nova Scotia considers category D an elevated risk, and, but they do not include category C, and the majority of women who have dense breasts have category C, the majority of them. May only 10% have category D, which is the highest density, but the majority and the 10 or 12 women that I ha have met with, they're all category C. Dense breast increases the risk of interval cancers. Uh, in fact, we are the only province that denies women ultrasound, MRI, even with a family doctor requisition. Uh, oh my God, am I? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I could speak for a day. If, uh, and I'm, I'm always terrified to get up and speak. And I, I will. <laughs> I will. I am not finished. So I'm just going to give you some figures to make this make sense to you. Uh, just, just, can I? Can I do it? I have lots. I have lots. Thank you. To be continued, and I'd be pleasure to educate you all. Order. I, I recognize the Honourable Member of Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pierre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And to my colleague, I, I thank her for that information and has me very much concerned about my own density. So I will be getting that checked and I want to thank her for bringing this issue to the floor. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to discuss various funding issues face municipalities. Ta-da, it is my annual municipal funding speech. And I've spoken many times on this topic because it is an important issue and it deserves attention. As a former councillor, 
And now the NDP spokesperson for the Department of Municipal Affairs. I often witnessed municipal units fighting for scraps of money due to lack of funding. Municipal units frequently compete over these small pots because the large pot of cash under the Municipal Capacity Grant, better known as equalization, has stayed the same since 1995. Mr. Speaker, in the first year of this government, I was excited and I believed we were moving in the right direction to provide more funding for municipal units. I was ecstatic. I mean, the municipal capacity grant got a raise. Unfortunately, that excitement was short-lived. Last year, and then in 2023 with the new MOU. With this new, new MOU, the ability to see that municipal capacity grant increase this year has been thwarted. On November 9th, 2023, during third reading of the municipal MOU, the minister disrespected the residents of the CBRM by calling them a distraction. The level of disrespect the Conservative government has shown the residents of my community has been shameless. What frustrates me is that many of the recommendations provided after months of work, negotiations, surveys, and eventually the recommendations from the Service Exchange Renegotiation and Municipal Government Act Review through the service exchange agreements had no follow through. Well, no real follow through. The minister and the premier ignored most of the proposals in the Sermgar report. One noticeable thing about the MOU was that it did not include increasing the municipal financial capacity funding. This amount has been stagnant for years and the PC government and some CBRM, MLA, some CBRM MLAs on the government side campaigned to increase the municipal funding capacity grant. They campaigned on temporarily to doubling of the grant. In fact, it was one of the first things this minister announced in his role. He stated, municipal services are incredibly important to the everyday lives of everyone in our province and over time, these services have become more expensive to deliver. I quite rightly agree, Mr. Speaker. They have. So it is unfathomable that not only did the doubling not continue, but no new funds have been even, are even added to the Municipal Capacity Grant. Instead, the existing pot of money was reworked and redistributed to let the minister pick the winners and the losers. The losers would include the Cape Breton Regional Municipality and the residents of the CBRM, who under the new proposed formula will receive less money than they have in the past. Now, the province has agreed to top them up, but only to their previous total and only for five years. Now, during my November 9th speech, I believe I called that PC math. You know, kind of off, Mr. Speaker. The CBRM is not alone in this. There will be seven, there are 17 municipalities that are expected to receive less funding under this new formula. In a time when everything is rising, this government decided to keep the 1995 money and redistribute it. Easy math. They're not great at calculations, Mr. Speaker. 
the federal equalization transfer to the province significantly increased, though. Thank you to the feds. Nova Scotia will receive about $3.3 billion in federal equalization payments. That's 17% more than the previous year. So you see, Mr. Speaker, <coughs> the feds have recognized that we have an issue here in our taxes. They realize that we need a comparable tax rate with comparable services. They recognize that, so they increased it by 17%. Yet the provincial transfers to the municipalities, like the CBRM, will continue to remain frozen in 1995 dollars. Not great calculations there. Not really recognizing that things are getting more expensive. Mr. Speaker, this has created situations where municipal staff spend much more of their time chasing various streams of money, writing grants and other proposals when other important work must be done. Mr. Speaker, municipalities are required to balance this budget. You know this, I know this, which due to a lack of revenue often needs, you know, they often need more revenue to avoid a budget shortfalls. And this lack of funding limits the municipal units' choice to improve their communities. Municipal units want to avoid raising property taxes. They want to avoid raising their rates because the rates are too high and, comparable, and not comparable to the services provided. Yet the Minister for Municipal Affairs suggested that the municipal units should and could re increase their tax rates. I think it was 18% is what the minister said. They could increase their tax rates by 18%. He also suggested that with the province taking um, corrections and housing off the books for the municipal units, that the municipal units could just keep the tax rate as is and not lower their tax rate to reflect the fact that they no longer collect housing and uh, housing and corrections. That's an ethical issue as far as I'm concerned. But the lack of funding, Mr. Speaker, means municipalities cannot properly improve infrastructure, roads, water, sewer. And it, <laughs> excuse me, and it has created an inability for municipal governments to build more sidewalks, especially in our rural areas. It has created an ability for municipal units to afford to expand municipal water and rural uh, into rural areas. The lack of revenue means municipal units cannot provide more accessible recreation, indoor and outdoor facilities. The lack of revenue makes it difficult for smaller, economically challenged areas to retain their younger population and recruit, recruit and retain newcomers to these areas. We've seen them leave. They've come and they leave. Why? Because the services they want are not there. Mr. Speaker, residents are entitled to comparable services at comparable tax rates. Some residents and municipal units would agree that the services, services residents, residents receive differ from the tax rates they pay. Over the years, there have been disagreements on the appropriate level of funding. Still, what people can agree on is that municipal units need to receive more equalization funding that would enable municipal units to provide comparable services at comparable tax rates. Municipal units need financial help. Instead, this government's answer has been to make more, unit, more municipal units share the same $19.95. The Conservative government should have increased the amount of money allocated to equal, the Equalization Fund, not made it harder.
on municipal units. Despite the conti government continue, continue to change the name of the Equalization Fund, Mr. Speaker, the government can change it all it wants. The fact of the matter is, it's another budget year that has come before this legislature, and the municipal funding has remained frozen. In contrast, the mandatory education transfers from municipal units to the provinces will continue to rise. It will continue to rise, and I was, and I was happy. I was. I was happy in the last session to see the issue of compulsory payments being, in, being addressed with the provincial government. Taking responsibility for housing and corrections, a good start. What would have been a better start was to take responsibility for corrections, housing, and the biggest ticket item, education. Because we know education is going to continue to rise. Mr. Speaker, the Nova Scotians for Equalization and Fairness Group has requested accountability and transparency of the government's federal equalization funding. Of the 23.1% or so generated out of the municipal units to provide comparable taxes at com comparable services at comparable tax rates, this group is looking for the minister from the minister to know and see where the federal government's equalization money is being allocated. And before 2013, this was readily available to, to residents. After 2013, it was no longer. Mr. Speaker, municipal, I'm, I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to skip that. So, Mr. Speaker, in, as I've said many times, with the CBRM's special and unique circumstances, is that we were forced to amalgamate. And when we were forced to amalgamate, the debt that we incurred from that amalgamation was never forgiven. We are still holding on to that debt from the forced amalgamation. There was no um, forgiveness of that debt. So we walk around with it. And now, under the MOU, there is still nothing in there to account for the CBRM's uniqueness in the debt that they hold because of forced amalgamation. Instead, now what they're going to have to contend with, what myself as a resident, my neighbors, my community members, what we're all collectively going to have to contend with is the fact that the CBRM is going to receive less money under the MOU, and where is that going to leave our taxes? Is the CBRM going to have to make the choice at some point? They haven't this year. They haven't this year, but at some point, are they going to have to make this, the, the, the unfortunate decision to have to raise taxes in order to deal with the shortfall that this government has provided them? Or are they going to are they going to keep their tax are they going to try to keep their taxes low or lower and have to lose out on services? This funding agreement was a slap in the face to my community. The way the minister discussed it was a slap in the face to my community. The disrespect that was shown. In closing, Mr. Speaker, we need a substantive budget line on the equalization funding for municipalities. And we need the Sermgar report Order. to be used. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. The need to correct the uh, facts a little bit for the member from Cape Breton, uh, Senator Whitney Peer, on the MOU, which was the subject of debate here last session. I will, I will tell her that a March 6 article, which I will table as soon as the legislative uh, library prints it and sends it to me, uh, a CBC article indicated that CBRM was reducing its taxes 
to its citizens because of the changes in the MOU related to corrections and net operating losses for housing. So the very thing that we said they could choose to do, they chose to do. Uh, and, and actually uh, very appreciative of the, of the mayor, Amanda McDougall, and her, her colleagues for giving us credit. This was something that enabled them to reduce taxes. So in reality, the, uh, the renegotiation of the 1995 MOU was, is a historic moment for us. It represents a very different uh, point of view. In 1995, that, that uh, agreement that was struck had a very balanced folks, focus to it. So you put in this money, this money, we put in this much money, bottom line is zero. We didn't take that point of view. We, we renegotiated the MOU, with, which included us not only keeping the municipal finan uh, financial capacity grant the same, uh, but also uh, putting in approximately another $50 million into our municipalities across the province, for which we received at last in the last session approximately 35 absolute unconditional letters of support for, for which we continue to get appreciation for as a government. Uh, the reality is, is nobody knows exactly what five years from now or now four years from now the relative strengths and weaknesses of our municipalities will be. Uh, CBRM is growing, so our other municipalities are growing. The municipal financial capacity grant is based on a, a very complicated formula which belongs to the NSFM. It's been there for more than 10 years. We didn't change the formula. At the request of the renegotiation committee, the formula was unfrozen which changed the numbers for CBRM a little bit and for several of our other municipalities. We said we would hold those, we would uh, put an extra three million in, which the member did reference, to hold those numbers the same. So for five years, five years from now, uh, we don't know. The, obviously, the municipal, all of our municipalities are growing, uh, are getting stronger tax bases. And so it was a historic renegotiation. It has uh, enabled all of our municipalities to do e things like reduce taxes or spend more on services uh, or, or be a little bit financially healthier. And certainly we're very pleased to see CBRM reduce their taxes. That was their choice. We always said that. So the member, uh, I must agree, uh, dis disagree with the member's statements. As a government, we've been uh, very good with CBRM. As the member knows, we put in a medical school in CBRM. Mm -hmm. Unprecedented to have a medical school in another part of the province. And that will reap benefits for hundreds of years to come, I believe, uh, when we start to see doctors and, and nurses come from CBRM. And, and CBRM has gone, in my opinion, uh, CBU, pardon me, is, is actually helping Acadia University in my community in my area in their, with their School of Nursing, so in, in helping them go through that process of accreditation. So we deeply appreciate uh, Cape Breton University's role there, but our government is enabling this. We're, we're putting this forward. We're changing the landscape of Nova Scotia. We're changing the landscape of, of CBRM. We're investing in other areas. We're investing in Tartan Downs, as the member knows. We're, in, we're investing in uh, hospital infrastructure in CBRM, which we continue to in, invest in. So I don't think we have to be ashamed of our role in CBRM. We're, we're proud of it. It, it is turning out, as we said, we said the renegotiation of the MOU would enable, if CBRM so chose to, uh, to, uh, to reduce taxes, which they did. It, it creates a stronger municipality in CBRM. There's no doubt about that. And every one of the other 48 municipalities is stronger, too, because of that renegotiated, uh, renegotiated MOU, which, uh, which took 27 years to do. Uh, going back to 1995 to 2023, maybe that's 20, I have to do my math uh, pretty quickly here, but uh, I, that sounds like 28 years to me. But uh, and in maybe 28 years from now, that'll get renegotiated again. I don't know, but that's, uh, that's uh, quite a legacy for, for uh, my department and uh, for all of the people who worked on it, from uh, uh, the mayor for uh, uh, Cumberland, uh, um, Murray uh, Scott and for Carolyn Bolivar Getson and the entire, uh, all of the people from the NSFM and from AMANS and from uh, and, and my department. So all of those people who put in the real hard work of attending all those meetings, a whole year's worth of meetings, and put in the uh, or more 
put in the effort in that. So we, we're not taking a second seat to anybody here in municipal affairs and housing, how we're treating our municipalities. We've been very, very generous to them. We've been, as a government, we've been very good to them. We will continue to do so. As the member knows, we're bringing in, uh, working hard to bring in and enable the code of conduct for our municipalities as well, another incredibly important thing. So we're working hard for our municipalities. We want to succeed, not see them succeed and grow. And we'll, uh, I just want to set the record straight that we've been, uh, uh, we've been very good to CBRM, very good to every one of our municipalities, and that's reflected in that tax uh, break to the citizens of CBRM on. Uh, uh, which was announced on March 6th. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll uh, take my seat. I recognize the Honourable Member Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I wanted to stand today and speak for a few moments uh, regarding the budget, but on a different topic um, where I believe uh, Mar the Nova Scotia, the province of Nova Scotia and the Maritime Region can be more if we focus on removing interprovincial trade barriers. Mr. Speaker, Cumberland North, Cumberland County and um, all of the northern region borders New Brunswick and is only 40 minutes from Prince Edward Island. It provides a unique perspective of Nova Scotia, the Maritimes and our position in the country. The people of Cumberland are strong. We have a rich history that has long experienced conflict. The French and the British fought over the border area for years, and we all know too well about the expulsion of the Acadians from Beaubassin. Cumberland has experienced wars. Cumberland has led confederation and also fought fervently against it. We all know the history between Sir Charles Tupper and Joseph Howe over the pros and cons of confederation. Tupper wanted a national railroad across what is now Canada, and Howe wanted to tr the trade to increase with our natural and historical trade partners, the New England states. We know what happened. Howe lost his fight, and Tupper won, leading to Confederation in 1867. A short 157 years ago, in 1867, when the East joined the West, we created the country of Canada. And many believe the maritime region has seen a steady decline in political influence and relative economic status since that time. In 1892, the Maritimes lost four seats in the House of Commons, followed by another four seats a decade later. In 1873, the Maritimes had 43 federal seats. And by 1966, we were down to 25, meaning as a total number of national seats as the total number of national seats increased, maritime representation decreased. In 1873, the Maritimes had 43 of 206 federal seats. By 1966, the Maritimes had 25 of 264 seats. And today, the Maritimes have only 25 of the 338 seats, an overall decrease from the original 21% of the total seats federally to now 7.4. The Maritimes are rich in history, diverse in culture, and have all the components needed for a wealthy, robust region. Last year, I attended the Atlantic Economic Forum at St. of X University, hosted at the Brian Mulroney Center. Over and over and over again, I heard business leaders and former political leaders like a former Premier Frank McKenna talk about the single biggest factor inhibiting Atlantic economic growth are interprovincial barriers. And now is the time for the maritime provinces to look at these interprovincial barriers, capitalize on the economic potential of our region, and take back our political strength. Our maritime provinces form a natural region with a close affinity to the ocean, which all but surrounds us. Since Confederation, we have seen a decline in our economic prosperity, having the weakest economies in the country and some of the largest interprovincial barriers interesting to comment on this as we celebrate the life of former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, who led the free trade, free trade movement. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to quote from a document that I will table, and it says, since Canada's free trade agreement with the United States in 1989, Canadian authorities have implemented free trade agreements with 44 countries. Meanwhile, progress in liber liberalizing internal trade has been slow. And in many cases, internal free trade agreements allowed foreign companies better access to Canada than Canadian companies. 
Nova Scotia has nearly 40 non-geographic trade barriers, one of the highest provinces. Nova Scotia increased their non-geographic trade barriers from 1997 to 2015 by 2.1%. 2 we should be decreasing them, not increasing them. Mr. Speaker, in Cumberland County, we have a first-hand view of these barriers. I see it clearly as the MLA for the area, and I work closely with MLA Megan Mitten next door in Westmoreland County, New Brunswick. We work together, Mr. Speaker, on many issues that affect all of our constituents, despite being in different provinces. The pandemic was the most recent example. But, Mr. Speaker, I'll also highlight a few other things that I'm living with uh, some of my consistent constituents working with every day. Tim Rose moved from Newfoundland to Nova Scotia, brought his trucking company with him, and married a local girl. Wonderful girl. But he's very frustrated because a tow truck that is licensed and can work in New Brunswick is not allowed to be licensed here in Nova Scotia. Different rules, an interprovincial inter barrier, inhibiting economic growth, inhibiting his business, and that's just one of numerous. In healthcare, our pharmacy clinic does not follow Canada Health Act, licensing um, only, uh, sorry, Mr. Speaker, only allowing Nova Scotia patients access to the clinic. Anyone living outside of Nova Scotia has to pay. Also, there has been some movement on an Atlantic license for physicians, but if you speak to physicians that have tried to do that, they tell you that the bureaucracy is still there. There's just a reduction in the fee. They still have to go through all the paperwork in each of the four Atlantic provinces to get licensed. There should be one Atlantic licensure body. There's also inspection laws through the Department of Environment that prohibit meat from crossing borders. There's economic barriers for wine sales and other, other uh, barriers, just to name a few. Mr. Speaker, there's overwhelming public support to, to make internal free trade here in, Nova, in Canada. Surveys from the Canadian Federation of Independent Business show that most Canadian firms, 87%, believe that provincial and territorial premiers should commit to reducing internal trade barriers. Nine in ten small businesses, including several industry associations, think that all firms should have open access to markets throughout Canada. There's precedent, Mr. Speaker, where in Australia in 1993, there was a move to remove regulatory barriers to the free flow of goods and labour between Australian states and territories. This brought about a more efficient economy, strengthening competition in many industries and benefiting consumers with lower prices and more choices for goods. Australian courts have often applied Section 92 of the Australian Constitution, which is similar to Canada's Section 121 in our Constitution Act. The Constitution's internal free trade provision prohibits both interprovincial tariffs as well as non-tariff trade barriers. Mr. Speaker, today I wanted to highlight the challenges um, and the interprovincial barriers that affect our economy. It affects us directly in Cumberland North and Cumberland County. And Mr. Speaker, I see it as a real barrier to prosperity for the entire maritime region. Mr. Speaker, in the past, there's been a movement for maritime unity or maritime coalition, where the maritime provinces work together to not only to remove barriers, but to work together as local governments so that maybe once again, we can return to an, a, a strong economic and prosperity uh, region for all of Canada. It's time for the Maritimes to move forward, remove all barriers and strengthen as a region. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The motion carries. We'll take a short recess to get set up. We're now in recess.
Order, order. The Committee of the Whole House on Supply will come to order. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would you please call the estimates for the, for the Premier? Um, resolutions number E19, E23 and E35. I recognize the Honourable Premier. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to read, read my resolutions. If I understand the opposition, I have no further questions. I'm happy to continue taking questions. No further questions I'm seeing from the, from the opposition. I've enjoyed my time in estimates and look forward to doing it next time again as well. Uh, so I'd like to read my re resolutions now. E19, uh, resolved that a sum not, exe not exceeding 11 million 371,000 be granted to the Lieutenant Governor to defray expenses in respect of the Executive Council pursuant to the estimate. Resolution E23 resolved that a sum not exceeding 5,744,000 be granted to the Lieutenant Governor to defray expenses in respect of intergovernmental affairs pursuant to the estimate. And Resolution E35 resolved that a sum not exceeding 2,637,000 be granted to the Lieutenant Governor to defray expenses in respect of regulatory affairs and service effectiveness pursuant to the estimate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Shall the resolution stand? Yes. The resolutions are stood. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would you please call the estimates for the Minister of Health and Wellness, resolutions number E12 and E29. Uh, resolution E12 and E29 uh, will continue debate with um, our Liberal colleagues. I recognize the Honourable Member for Bedford Basin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think when last we met, <laughs> trying to remember back, um, we were discussing surgeries, uh, additional numbers of surgeries, etc. And I was wondering if the Minister could just outline for us, um, you know, what the what the dollar amount um, is what the increase in money is being spent this year to, re to uh, in increase the number of surgeries over last year. I recognize the Honourable Health Minister. Uh, thank you, and I thank the member for the question. So if we look um, specifically at um, actual surgical services, there would be an increase this year of 11.3 million. But I would just say that some of the work that's happening around increasing surgery also, like there's the surgical specific work, but also the work that's happening around access and flow. So around the, the mobility teams, um, the Safer F bundle, because what that does is it allows us to discharge people more quickly and keep that surgical flow going so that we have um, beds that are available for people who need to be admitted post-operatively. So there are surgical specific um, um, uh, values, which is 11.3. And then I would also say that there are a number of places through the, the budget where the um, other initiatives will also contribute to uh, surgical waitlist improvement. I recognize the Honourable Member, Bedford Basin. I thank the Minister for her concise answer. It's so nice to hear that kind of thing. <laughs> um, so, um, so when we were last talking, we were, you know, looking at the number of surgeries being done, right? And so since, since we last spoke, I went in and uh, took a look. And on the government's own um, dashboard, it compares the number of surgeries being done in a period versus 2019. So I went and looked at the first 10 weeks 
that we've just been through it because that's all that was up there. And um, in the first 10 weeks of 2024, there were 17,489 surgeries done in Nova Scotia. Now, my issue with that is that in the same period in 2019, there were 17,450 surgeries done. So this is only 39 more surgeries done in that 10 week period compared to 2019. And we're spending an awful lot of money uh, to not get a huge increase. Like 39 surgeries over 10 weeks is 3.9 surgeries a week, not a lot when you look at the acro across the system and, and just the need, the increase in the population, for example. So I am just wondering if the minister can explain why we aren't seeing a much greater number of surgeries, because it, it doesn't, uh, this is concerning to me when I look at it. I recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. Thank you. Uh, so um, back to the question that, that the original um, question that we answered. So um, when, when we look back at the numbers through the department, um, it should be noted that for the first two months, uh, eight weeks, there were 155 more surgeries compared to the same period in 2019 and 432 more than the same time period in 2020. So we are doing more surgeries month over month. Um, what's important to also to celebrate really the work of the healthcare workers is the fact that we're over capacity in the hospitals to a degree because we're underbedded to a degree in which we haven't seen. There's no peak and valley anymore, it's just peak. So all consistently um, over capacity. And also uh, there was some disruption uh, because of the major weather event that we had. Um, so uh, the major winter event that resulted in loss of services because many facilities were closed and of course staff had difficulty coming to work. So despite these pressures, uh, we actually continue to do a number of surgeries well over the baseline. I recognize the honorable member, Bedford Basin. So of that 11.3 million that the, the minister men mentioned, as well as the money that's dispersed throughout the system in a variety of other different ways, are, are, are there any new um, programs to increase surgeries and reduce the, the backlog? Recognize the honorable member of Bedford Basin. Everyone to know my great restraint at at not referring to the PR event as the as the PR event. I just want to note that.
I recognize the Honourable Minister. Thank you very much. So there are a number of things uh, that are, are uh, underway. Um, so as an example, um, we're um, looking at cataracts. So there is an extension um, of the existing contract between Halifax Vision uh, to um, uh, do an additional uh, 1,500 cataract surgeries uh, for next uh, fiscal. And I think what's really um, important to know is that there's really been some, some strong changes in terms of our... Um, our ability to have um, cataract surgeries done uh, over the past year. Um, also, um, there is a urological robot um, that we are investing money in. I really can't tell you what that robot does, but um, I'm looking forward to going and seeing it and understanding how it works. Um, also, I would like to say about the diagnostic imaging and access um, to making sure that the, the electronic requisition um, work that's happened with surgically referral is actually being expanded to our uh, diagnostic imaging access. So helping people, um, you know, access through that, trying to get rid of the, the facts, not only ax the tax, we want to ax the facts as well. So we want to look at both of those things. Scotia surgery, there'll be an investment as well to support IWK in shortening their list. Um, improving access to surgical sp spine consultation as well. And I think uh, the members know, I've talked about it before, we really do have Canadian leading of the robotics program um, in the country. I think there's four MAKO robots, three of them are here and we actually now are a site for people to come and learn and train on those, uh, on those robots, which is incredible to have all of the access to those surgeons across the country and see the dynamic work environment that we've created here. And then reduction to uh, utilization, um, uh, surgical access and quality improvement strategy. So really, you know, helping move the ORs along. But I would also like to just talk a little bit. Um, so as an example, in the uh, recent physician contract, there is, um, there is an incentive for physicians to do surgeries after hours and on weekends. And certainly, we've also negotiated a competitive uh, nursing uh, collective agreement as well, because as we know, there are other people that work uh, in the OR with physicians. So there's been a number of things that have happened. And again, I, I go back to um, making sure that individuals um, have access to beds. So one of the reasons that we saw in the past was that we didn't have people moving through and lower acuity patients were in high acuity beds and so the frailty um, and the safer F bundle as well will uh, support the uh, surgical wait list. I recognize the Honourable Member Bedford Basin. So um, in the central zone, we saw a, a sharp fall in the, in the number of uh, surgeries as well. Uh, in the first eight weeks, I haven't done the math now for the first 10 weeks, but the first eight weeks, um, it was 5,439 surgeries in the first eight weeks of 2019 to 5,022 in the first eight weeks of the, this year. That's a decrease of about 7.6%. And I, I guess I can see why, you know, um, we would have had that big drop in Cape Breton or in rural areas that were heavily impacted by the snowfall, but it does seem to me that um, the central region sort of uh, rebounded quite quickly from that snowfall. So that's that's quite a, a decrease, and I'm wondering if the minister could speak to uh, what's going on there.
I recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. Uh, so again, I think our, our numbers are, are a, a bit different, but what I do want to just speak about, and we can clarify the numbers, we go back and look at the, the video, but I, I do want to take note that there has been a 27% reduction in the surgical wait list um, since, since 2021. And um, there has been also um, great strides made in towards meeting benchmarks. So um, if we look at uh, October to December in 2023, 57% of endoscopic, endoscopic surgical um, um, services were completed. Um, uh, or wait times were within benchmark. I mean, the target is 90, but that has been a significant improve. The performance is continuing to trend toward positive. There's been 55% of non-endoscopic non surgical services completed. Um, we also are seeing that there has been a 40% reduction from 2020 um, to February 1st, 2024 for ophthal ophthalmology services, 28 reduction in orthopedic surgeries, um, general surgery as well. There's been a 14% reduction in oral maxillofacial surgeries of 27%. So we are getting there. It is incremental change. It depends on hours. It depends on staffing, all of those things. But we certainly are, are pleased with the work that's happened um, in the uh, health authority in terms of improving wait times. Recognize the honourable member, Bedford Basin. Um, uh, thank you to the Minister for the answer. Um, in the month of February, according to the NSHA website, there were well over 800 vacancies in just the NSHA. Uh, can, can the Minister comment on why there are so many uh, vacancies? Recognize the Honourable Health Minister. Uh, yep, so um, whatever, you know, there's a number of um, obviously vacancies throughout Nova Scotia Health. Um, I, can, I can confirm the number of 800, but um, that would be across the province in various uh, areas and across uh, disciplines I'm suggesting, or were you, was there a particular discipline that the member had noticed, or 800 in total? Yep, so we do know that there is a shortage of health human resources across um, our, our um Health, um, our health professionals. We've done a lot of work actually around um, supporting um, not only recruitment but retention, of course, and also the training. We've certainly increased the number of seats in a variety of different health professional fields in order for us to meet the, the growing demand for healthcare services. So, um, the other thing that's happened too is as we expand these programs, the, the, as we create new pathways for patients, new opportunities, as an example, the mobility teams, we actually need more staff. So in terms of the vacancies, we actually are expanding programs besides. So there is a couple of, um, of reasons why that those numbers, but we are pleased with them. We are we, um, working very, very hard to support uh, the staff in staying, but also seeing positive effect from recruitment efforts, and uh, we will continue. The Honourable Member, Bedford Basin. Could the Minister speak to which budget lines are attached to doctor recruitment incentives? Are there any new incentives in the budget? Uh, I think since the budget came out, we've heard of one new incentive, so maybe they could, the, um, the minister could speak about that, but I just wanted a little more information around that.
Recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. So in terms of incentive allocation, uh, there is about $9.7 million allocated for incentives, but I would like to note that uh, for the new physician contract and academic funding plan, there's actually an investment in this year's budget of over $125 million for the uh, salaries and the benefits related to physicians. So a uh, pretty significant investment in our physician community. Recognize the Honourable Member Bedford Basin. I was going to sit down and ask my question there. Um, so in terms of the new physician uh, recruitment um, incentive for, for the central zone, um, we've had some conversations about this already, but I'm just wondering um, how is that going to work? Uh, if, a new do if a doctor wants to, to locate here, you know, what is the incentive? Um, how do they find out about it? How do we make sure they get it? and uh, locate in areas that actually have a, you know, a great deal of need. Uh, with this most recent report in my particular area, uh, when we look at the numbers, the doctor wait list has climbed 400% since, uh, since the fall of 2021. So it's a huge increase in a, a lot of the uh, central zone um, central zone networks uh, we've just seen a huge number of people come on the wait list and some of that certainly is due to uh, new people coming into the prov province about 35 percent um, roughly but but 55 percent of the people are on those lists because their doctor has either retired is retiring or has closed their practice and so uh, just want some information on how these work because I want to understand it. So when if I hear about doctors that want to come to my area or a nearby area, I want to make sure I know about it and I want, want to make sure my colleagues know about it too. Recognize the Honourable Health Minister. Uh, so thank you. So um, when a physician is interested in um, primary care practice, obviously they would work with uh, local recruiters through Nova Scotia Health or IWK sp 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 specifically, but they also work with physician services. And so um, the incentives start with a one-time like a sign-on, uh, and then at the end of every year following, there would be an additional um, uh, funding allocated, providing they meet their targets and all of those things. So when they sign their contract, information would be given to them about those uh, incentives. So um, it it um, it will happen as they are onboarded through um, Nova Scotia Health, and once they sign their longitudinal family medicine contract with the um, with the department, and. Um, they will uh, at the end of every year. So it uh, twenty five thousand dollars when they sign the agreement, and ten thousand per year for the next five years for a full time physician. But they the payments will be the initial sign on, of course, happens up front, and then the other will happen at the end of their year. Um, and so that is how they they can access it. And in regards to um, you know the loss of physicians, so. Um, since April 2022, there have been 43 new family physicians in Central Zone, and there were 42 physicians who left um, to the point of the fact that we really are seeing retirements. And uh, unfortunately, that hasn't been planned for adequately throughout a variety of different governments for a variety of different <coughs> reasons. So there has been some good work. The Atlantic Physician License is helpful. Um, I can't, I have the number somewhere in terms of how many people have signed up for that. Looking at PACA, so if you have a license anywhere, uh, the Patient Access to Care Act, if you have a license anywhere in Canada, you can come and work here uh, and you know we'll have you registered really right quickly and you, we actually will waive your first year registration fees because they can be prohibitive. 
um, a variety of different things. Looking at red tape reduction, we are really leading the country in terms of red tape reduction, and over 200,000 hours have been reduced um, from time with a commitment to reach 450,000 hours in red tape reduction uh, by the end of this this year. So, um, you know, there are a number of things happening. One person, one record certainly was very welcome news for uh, the physicians that are, are coming and settling. And, uh, you know, there's been a whole, the contract as well. Like it is a very good, uh, very good contract. We say it's good for, good for doctors and great for patients because it does incent not only attachment, but also access. Recognize the honorable member for Bedford Basin. So in terms of one patient, patient, one record, we don't really have that in Metro yet, do we? Is it still just in it? I was at the, the announcement there, but I think I might have missed one. So I just want to make sure that I'm clear on that. We don't have that in Metro yet. It was still a pilot with the um, app, or am I, am I conflating two uh, separate programs? Because I, I think we've, I think we've heard about it. I don't, I haven't, I'm not clear that it's actually been implemented and that there's actually one patient, one record across HRM now. I recognize the Honourable Minister. So we did announce in February 23 that, the, uh, that we have a 10-year agreement with Oracle around one patient, one record. Uh, and so um, it is a single electronic health record that will allow all 26,000 healthcare professionals at Nova Scotia Health and IWK uh, to speak to one another. And it will start, the first sites to start using OPOR, Dartmouth General, Cobequid Community Health Centre and Bayers Lake Community Outpatient Centre, and that will happen in early 2025. So there's a lot of work that's happening now. One of the things uh, one patient, one record will do is standardize our approach to many things. So, you know, different facilities do different things, even though we're under one Nova Scotia Health, but this will help standardize it. So it's a really, I'm very grateful for the people who like tedious things because this is tedious, I'm sure. And so working with clinicians, it's very much clinician informed, getting this background, getting this foundation so that when we roll it out, all of these sites will come up and then we will look at expanding it across the province. Recognize the honourable honourable member for Bedford Basin. Uh, thank you very much, and I want to. Um, we did he we did hear a lot this morning at at health committee about about the conditions that nurses are currently facing in terms of violence, in terms of forced overtime, uh, and so I'm. Now I have, I've run Order. out of time. That would conclude our, um, our round of questionings for Liberal colleagues. We'll now pass it over for an hour with our NDP colleagues. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and nice to be back. Um, wondering if we can talk a little bit about the app. <laughs> um, I um, now find myself the parent of an 11-year-old child, which means I have to listen to commercial radio. and. Um, there's a lot of ads for the app, I've got to tell you. So um, I'm wondering if uh, the minister can walk me through how the app was developed and procured. So when did the work on the app begin? What third parties were involved and what roles did they play? Recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, so there is, uh, in regards to the app, uh, your Health NS, is, I think what we're confirming, that's what we're talking about. Uh, the five-year contract with Think Research um, is to support your Health NS and the virtual urgent care. Um, so your Health NS um, will help Nova, Sc Nova Scotians better navigate the health care system. It is a one-stop shop to book services, navigate care options, and find information um, more 
quickly. Um, and it's right from the mobile device that you have, whether that be, or your computer, whether that's a, 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 an iPad or a tablet or your phone. So it is a first of its kind in Nova Scotia. Uh, the 1.0 um, really allowed a chat bot to kind of help us with AI to work through what some of the options may be required based on the person's um, self-reporting symptoms. Um, and it also um, allows people to, like a health finder, services, health services finder. So we were able to do location services and help people understand, able to book blood work, tests, x-rays, you know, um, immunizations, etc. And so the, this next part of the app, we are now looking at um, a test and try environment where people actually have access to some of their records, their visits, you know, when and where they saw somebody, uh, some of their diagnostic reporting, those types of things. So you can expect that over time, these iterations of these apps will change. Uh, we did see an app in Denmark at age 16 years of age. Everybody has an app. The f their record is on the app. It talks about their health status. It's been in. Uh, it's been in place. Well, they said they've been collecting and utilizing health data f since 1968. And this app is incredible, and it allows us essentially to take the health card number and attach it to the patient's record, which really what they call democratizing their health. Um, so it's been a very. It was a very interesting um, project for us to see. Certainly well established, 1968. And uh, we will uh, continue to iterate this app as we move forward. And we also are getting regular feedback from Nova Scotians after they use the app. And the satisfaction is actually quite high in terms of their experience. The Honourable Member, Dartmouth North. Well, thank you for that. Um, so I'm sure that the app didn't start getting developed in 1968. Uh, but um, the data was being collected in 1968 because as far as I can tell, uh, I remember when we didn't have computers, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Mr. Chair, um, uh, or not publicly available. Um, but what were, so the third parties that we know that are involved in the development of the app are EY and Think Research. So were there any other third parties involved in the development of the app? The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Member, Dartmouth North. Great. So we know that there was $8 million directed to EY as the principal contractor for the development of the app. Is EY's work ongoing? That's my first question. And what other contracts are there and how long are the contracts for? I recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. So in regards to uh, EY, they do have a contract with Nova Scotia Health. That's who is the administrator and holds that contract. And they will they continue to support um, the app. The Honourable Member, Dartmouth North. Okay, great. Um, so uh, is there a, you know, with that, I mean, they mu there must be a contract for EY, so they continue to support the app, but is there like an end time of the contract where then you might go back out and look for a different provider, or is it just in, per in perpetuity?
I recognize the Honourable Health Minister. Uh, so there is, um, as far as we understand, that there is a contract that goes until March 31st of this calendar year, fiscal year, uh, and there would be an option in that contract to extend if it's required. I recognize the Honourable Member, Dartmouth North. Okay, thanks. Uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority also reported to the media that they contracted a firm named Think Research for work on the app. What is the work that Think Research is providing and how much is that contract worth, i.e., how much are they being paid for that work? Recognize the Honourable Minister. Uh, so essentially, in a nutshell, the work that's happening through Think is patient is the patient uh, navigation feature and also the chat tool. So it really is around um, the development and management of clinical services workflow. Um, so if you go on the app um, and you get to the chat bot, that modality, I guess, for lack of another word, is is what Think uh, what Think is is supporting, um, and also the patient navigation um, portion of the app. The Honourable Member, Dartmouth North. Great. And can the Minister tell me how much Think is getting paid for that work? Recognize the Honourable Health Minister. So there's $4.5 million allocated in the 24-25 budget. Recognize the Honourable Member. Um, yeah, thanks. No need, eh? Like, yeah. Um, uh, okay, great. So according to the government's own procurement database, Think it was awarded a $49.6 million, uh, un, well, th sorry, $49.6 million through an, an uh, oh my gosh, an untendered contract in February 2023. So obviously 4.5, that is going to that, that aspect, the patient navigation feature and chatbot of the app. Uh, but what is the rest of the amount for, and why didn't it go to tender? Recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. So as we uh, mentioned, so about 50% um, is the Your Health NS modality that we have, which we just talked about. And then the second project is the virtual urgent care that's available to folks. So it's uh, the, cl the uh, clinicians, the nurse practitioners, or the nurses, nurse practitioners, et cetera, uh, and the, the uh, platform that it's used. So that's where the 49.5 comes. So the virtual urgent care and the um, um, digital front door and, and navigation services in the app. Recognize the Honourable Member, Dartmouth North. Okay, so just to be clear, uh, there's the app stuff, which is 4.5, and then there's the virtual urgent care, which makes up the rest of the 49.6 million. Recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. So the, the total of the contract is $49 million, um, but it is actually over subsequent years. It's not a one-year contract. So um, 
So in terms of the digital front door navigation, or digital front door, it would be $3 million a year for, for five years. Navigation services, $1.4 million per year. Uh, in terms of the virtual care, it is a subscription of $800,000 per year. And then non-physician services is $1.1 million a year. And then on-call acute eMERGE trained physicians is $1.2 million per year. So there is a little bit of, um, there's various incidentals that could add up over time with travel and things like that. So that is the whole duration of the, of the uh, contract over five years. Recognize the Honourable Member, Dartmouth North. Great, that's very helpful. Thank you for that breakdown. And I guess the other, the, then the quest, the other part that's unanswered is why was the contract untendered? Recognize the Honorable Health Minister. So uh, the services were um, contracted through um, an Alt P process, which is a health is under the uh, Trade Act is a health services exemption. It's a commonly used and accepted practice across Canada in terms of um, how health um, services are, are accessed. Um, so it was. Um, validly and legally negotiated um, through historically used processes in Nova Scotia. Um, so it is a valid procurement um, process available to Nova Scotia Health and other uh, healthcare organizations. And really when you look at it, you know, when we look at access to care, when we look back over the last two years, you know, we have to move fast. We can't talk about not having access to care or bringing everybody. I mean, virtual uh, care and urgent treatment centers are great, but if we have to bring people all the time to a place where they can be, it's congested, we need to empower patients to be able to access this care on their own. So virtual urgent care, virtual um, access is proven for many people to be a great way to access care. So we have to move quickly. This has contributed to the 60,000 appointments that we have every month as a result of that. And while it's not for people who have more acute illness, it actually creates a different pathway so people of lower acuity don't have to go to places like the emergency room. So it really is important. If, if we wait all the time, like more faster, I'll tell you, I hear that in my sleep. Like we have to move. And I will tell you, um, Healthcare workers and patients appreciate it. Like they need us to get moving so that they have access to, to healthcare in a variety of different ways. And I think the work that happened during COVID showed us that we can move quickly when we need to. And and certainly, you know, when we formed government, we knew we had to act very, very quick, quickly in order to make sure that patients had access to care. And so this is a very valid process used regularly uh, in healthcare fields, and it allows. Um, you know, it, it, it's within um, acceptable channels, acceptable procurement process, and it's an alternative procurement process that was used. I recognize the Honourable Member Dartmouth North. Thanks. I want to turn now to travel nurses. So I don't know if you uh, 
uh, watched or if anyone was watching the health committee this morning, but there was quite a discussion on um, travel nurses, although uh, Jan Hazelton from the uh, NSNU prefers the word agency nurses, and I kind of agree with her um, because she <laughs> says travel nursing sounds too glamorous. Uh, and um, and I, so, it, you know, I just, first of all, I want to make sure I've got my head around exactly what happens with travel nursing. So permit me this, and please, honestly, this is like a true, honestly, you know, I want to make sure I understand exactly what's happening. So um, we have a shortage of nurses in Nova Scotia, so we go elsewhere to like a temp agency for nurses uh, out of the province. We say we need five nurses for two weeks or whatever, and then that temp agency charges the province money and then pays for those five nurses to come in for the two weeks uh, and presumably pays them slightly less than we're paying for them because then there would be no profit margin. So, or is it that we just pay for the salaries of the nurses and then that company pays for the other things in some other way or gets their profit in some other way. I just want to make sure I understand the relationship between what we pay and what those nurses are paid. That's my first sort of question about that and then we'll go from there to make sure that I'm asking, like that we're starting from the right spot. <laughs> Recognize the Honourable Health Minister. Uh, so similarly, I would say there, um, I, I, don't, I don't know off the top of my head, and we can check, there would be travel, comp travel nurse companies where, you know, we, Nova Scotia Health would negotiate um, <coughs> with these travel companies around what the cost would be. So I don't know in the proprietary word, <coughs> world if they tell us what their margin is, right? It's a private company. So I don't really think I'll be able to tell you that. Um, but we do know that there are things that are negotiated through that contract. And so um, it is it does probably feel glamorous to be able to travel. And we know, and and certainly the um, the premiers across the pro the country recognize that it is an issue, that we we do recognize that it while it's a double-edged sword, while we need these travel nurses to help us keep um, organizations open. We also know in many ways we're cannibalizing our workforce and each other's workforce as, as a result. So I don't know if I have, I, I won't be able to tell you what the margins are for the company, but the, the obviously it it's, was a competitive market and the hope is that as we continue to reduce the reliance on travel nurses and we there was a ministerial directive in December of 2023 both by myself and the Minister of Seniors and Long-Term Care to call our providers to really reduce and change the way in which we uh, utilize travel nurses in the province and and we need that to happen across the country and so we know that there is interest in that we're seeing across uh, different provinces that they're you know wondering how what we're up to how it's going they also recognize that we need to really look at the workforce so um, we're grateful to those travel nurses because they assist us in keeping facilities open and providing care to Nova Scotians but we also know that it's really difficult for 
uh, Nova Scotia employed registered nurses who are working next to a colleague who perhaps doesn't know the facility or perhaps has a different background and is actually, you know, making more. So um, we're, we're, we're trying to work through that. It's a, it's a difficult nut to crack, but we're committed to cracking it. And, and certainly there will be more to say in terms of the effectiveness of, of our ministerial directive and how we support our own facilities and kind of getting off the reliance on, on uh, travel nurses. I recognize the Honourable Member Dartmouth North. So um, that's great. Uh, yeah, I don't need to need, know the margins. I just wanted to make sure I understood the relationship. So like, it's like a temp agency for nursing. So, um, but the, you know, the fact is, is that we are putting, we're, as you say, we're cannibalizing our workforce and the workforces of other places, but also we're paying public money into private healthcare companies that are getting, a pro making a profit. Um, in some way, so um, and you know that always concerns me. Um, so I, I do like I want to talk about this some more, but I do have a couple of specific questions about travel nurses or agency nurses in Nova Scotia before I get to the bigger, the bigger nut, as it were. Um, and so. Um, Maybe this is part of the ministerial directive that the, the minister was just talking about, but in December 15th, travel nurses, um, or the, the change was made that travel nurses could only be hired for a max of 180 days. Um, and then the news release stated that travel nurses may choose to take permanent assignment in Nova Scotia or continue to work as a travel nurse in another province after the 180 days. So. Um, First of all, is that part of the directive that the minister was just talking about? And then how many travel nurses worked in Nova Scotia last year? Recognize the Honourable Health Minister. Okay, so um, I'll just go through the uh, kind of the, the bullet points in the ministerial directive, if you'd like, just to kind of outline. So, once a travel nurse has been assigned by any agency to work uh, for one or both health authorities or a long-term care sector for a total of 180 days, no agency may assign the travel nurse to work for either health authority. So they have a 180-day window to work. The health authority must not be prevented from offering permanent employment to any travel nurse at any time. The agency must not assign uh, work to a health authority, a travel nurse who has employed by health authority or any person operating in the long-term care sector at any time within one year prior to entering into a contract with the agency until one year has elapsed. The agency must not assign to work for health authority a travel nurse who has graduated from a Nova Scotia nursing program within one year. Um, no expenses shall be paid shall be required to be paid by the health authority in respect of pets, including accommodation for pets, because there were some individuals who were receiving um, money for boarding pets. Um, and so this is, um, and then a, the health authority shall, subject to the terms and conditions of any, et cetera, et cetera, we can, all, like, as we can offer them work um, uh, if they want to come and, and we, we want them to come and work with us full time. So those were, were the, the top lines of the, of, the, um, of the ministerial order. So there were a little, a few more, roughly 350 travel nurses working in Nova Scotia at any given time um, as of January 1st is what I would say. Um, the IWK currently does not use travel nurses. Recognize the Honourable Member, Dartmouth North. Okay, and um, you know, we heard today at the committee that there was something like 70 million spent on travel nursing last year. Um, if the Minister can confirm that that's the right number, that would be great. And then how much does the province anticipate we'll spend on travel nurses this year? Recognize the Honourable Health Minister. So as of January 1st, um, uh, we've spent $76.1 million um, in the current <laughs> fiscal year on travel nurses. 
Yeah. So whatever the last quarter. The honourable member know. Dartmouth North. And then do we have a what's the budget line for the budget that we're currently debating for the coming fiscal? Recognize the honourable minister of health. So we budgeted 80 million this year. Recognize the honourable member Dartmouth North. And so. Uh, since the announcement in December, have we seen a shift in the number of travel nurses working in the province? Uh, and have we seen um, any, like, any evidence that some of those nurses are, you know, coming and staying and taking permanent jobs? Recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. So it's really only been two months since we put the ministerial directive in, and we had kind of have 180 days in order to be able to see. So I can't really tell you about the, the impact. But what I can tell you is just as an example, um, when we offered the bonus to have nurses come back into the system, we do know that there were a number of people who, we have Nova Scotia nurses who are also working for travel companies. So we were able to attract about 148 people back into the system, perhaps not all travel nurses because we don't know where everybody works, but what that allowed us to do specifically and out of that 148, about 35 of those were for really hard to employ areas. So we would look at critical care areas, places like that, ORs, ICUs, emerges, etc. So there's a number of things that are happening and we're really pleased with the contract uh, that was settled with nurses. We feel that that also will be um, a, a good benefit when we're recruiting folks back or recruiting people from travel companies. Recognize the Honourable Member, Dartmouth North. So I guess we get to the big nut then <laughs> on travel nursing. And so, you know, the minister has said um, that she and the department acknowledges that this is a real issue. Uh, other health ministers acknowledge it's an issue. The nurses' union acknowledges it's an issue. And several times the nurses' union has um, suggested, and we talked about it again today, this idea of a provincial locum system where, you know, provincially paid and, and contracted nurses are able to work in other parts of the province uh, for, with their expense, you know, their expenses paid and that kind of thing. So for people who enjoy the lifestyle of traveling and get, you know, doing some time here and some time there, um, the, the idea would be that, um, that, you know, nurses in, who live in Parsboro could go down to Yarmouth to work for a couple of weeks if there was need in Yarmouth or whatever. Um, we, know, we know this is happening in Labrador. It's expanding to all of Newfoundland and Labrador. We know that Manitoba is looking at this. Uh, what, is the, what, what is happening in Nova Scotia when it comes to this idea? Um, and yeah, I guess the best way to describe it would be a provincial nurse locum program. Recognize the Honourable Minister, Health, Wellness. Uh, so I would say that the discussions really in regards to travel nursing within the province, um, whatever it is, an agency, would be limited to date. We really have looked at the workforce overall. So we have the Office of Healthcare Professional Recruitment. There really has been no workforce planning done, really, for the whole entirety of my career. I mean, I graduated from nursing school in 92. We knew then there was going to be a nursing shortage, and everyone assured us that would never happen. So. There's a couple of things about that. I know that certainly in certain zones, as an example, um, sometimes we would have like a float pool position where nurses would be hired into a float position where they would work in, you know, there's a regional site and then there's just several, um, several um, more rural sites in the zone. And I, I wouldn't say that's been hugely successful to date. We really are looking at increasing the supply. So we have a number of, um, you know, increase the number of nursing seats significantly. We've added a nursing program with designated seats to improve representation in um, across the healthcare system in a lot of the seats, but certainly have um, earmarked in Acadia specifically that a good portion of the seats will be to underrepresented uh, communities. We, because we really do need to make a, a significant change uh, as well in terms of representation. Um, we looked at the LPN seats, broadening LPN seats. 
Uh, we've looked at the Patient Access to Care Act. So, you know, making sure that if you're registered in another part of the country, particularly if you've gone away to work, that it's really easy for you to transition home and come back and work in Nova Scotia. Um, and we've also, the college has done an incredible w amount of work looking at seven different countries. So making sure that the education is equivalent and then allowing people to come um, with their credentials and then be socialized and trained in our system. So we really are looking at increasing the, the, um, the number of individuals, also looking at, so that's recruitment and training, but also looking at retention. So really working very hard around nurses' quality of life. There was some... Uh, negotiations where we're looking at nurse wellness, we are looking as also at uh, nurses security issues, all of those types of things around work-life balance to make it a very um, attractive place to work. And also um, Nova Scotia Health in particular has uh, started probably about a year ago doing stay interviews. So rather than waiting for someone to leave and doing exit interviews to find out why they left, we want to talk to the staff, not just nurses, a number of people to understand what why do they stay and what makes them stay and what else can we do and that's obviously sometimes very site specific but there are things that are general for the entire system recognize the honorable member dartmouth north yeah well thanks i mean i appreciate all of that around you know the in, the increase in supply but there's you know there's so i guess there's a couple things i want to say in response to that one of them is um you know, while we are, like, we're doing a lot of things, I totally agree with you and acknowledge that we're doing a bunch of things, as you've just listed, to increase supply. While we're waiting, so for those new nursing grads to, you know, to, to get through school or to get the pe folks from coming from international places, um, uh, you know, we're still paying travel nurses. And so I wonder, is there has there been any kind of analysis on you know, the amount being paid out to agency nurses or travel nurses versus what it would take to um, make staying in Nova Scotia more attractive. So like the $10,000 bonus or whatever, or, you know, or just like a, a better hourly wage or whatever, or better or more vacation days. Like, I know that's all collective bargaining stuff, but I mean, like, it, it, is there sort of thought to that, like, you know, if we can save this much money from travel nursing, we could put it into the collective bargaining process and make life better for nurses all across Nova Scotia. Like, oops, has that, have, has that analysis been done? Um, or, you know, is that in the thinking of how do we retain our workforce once we get them? Recognize the Honourable Health Minister. So that's really always on, it's, it's always happening is what I would say. So in terms of analysis, I think there's a broader analysis and, and um, workforce development happens to the Office of Healthcare Professional Recruitment in um, collaboration, not only with the college and the colleges, but also with the employers. But what we really need, and, and I'm, you know, the travel nurses bring net new nurses. You know, while there are some Nova Scotia nurses that travel with those companies, it also brings net new nurses from other places to come and work in the province. And that's really what we need. We need net new on top of the nurses and, and other healthcare professionals that we already have. So while we want to phase them out and attract people, we also have to increase recruitment because if we don't, we're just moving people around in the same space. We're not actually um, fixing the problem, which is not enough people. So right now we do know that there, and we don't know the percentage, we know that there are some people who are Nova Scotia nurses, live here and work for travel companies, but we, we really do need to increase the supply of nurses. And that's why it's so important for us to look at immigration, in migration and training and really, you know, pushing our university partners to understand what is the most important aspects of getting a nursing degree, looking at the LPN program, looking at CCA programs where people have propensity for care and how do we also bridge people. So if they've come into the workforce as a CCA and they, that person wants to bridge to LPN, how do we support that in happening? But again, we need net new people all the time. As a CCA transitions to LPN, we need more CCAs to come in behind that individual. So it is a constant supply and flow. The nursing program changed in the 90s and it certainly had an impact not right away but you know if you graduate nursing at 20 and you work for 40 years you're 60 years old and you're able to retire with a full pension because of the work that you've given the, the care that you've provided for the course of your life 
and we knew that was coming. There was no work in the 90s, if you can believe it. I have two classmates that live in Nova Scotia um, who, from my class, everybody went to Maine, to Texas, everywhere else, and worked, worked further afield. So it really is about increasing supply. And, and in, we, it's important from a, an economic development perspective. When we go out and speak in community, I tell people everywhere we go, there's a, a hospital or a pharmacy or healthcare services of some description in almost every single community in Nova Scotia. And so we want young people to work here. And so if you live in rural Nova Scotia particularly, what a great opportunity for you to be able to live and work in your community. And healthcare worker now is data analysis, it's industrial engineering. I mean, it's just so broad because of the complexity of the system that we work in. So really trying to promote it as a viable and important income across the province for, for students so people don't have to go away anymore to work. I recognize the honorable member from Dartmouth North. Well, I feel your pain because when I graduated from acting school, uh, there was only two people that stayed here too. <laughs> but that's a whole different story. Um, <laughs> but I was one of them. Uh, um, but no, uh, seriously, so when we're looking at retention and we're looking at making you know, bridging attractive and that kind of thing. We know that in some cases, CCAs are having their tuition paid for, books paid for. What about people who want to transition from LPN to RN? Now, we've heard, I've heard from people, like people I know in Dartmouth who are doing this and really like putting their lives on, on hold to pay for that, uh, for that extra training or that bridging training. Why aren't we financing them? If we need more RNs, which we do, we need more everything, but we, we do need more RNs and we do need more LPNs, why are we not financing the training uh, for people who are already working in the system? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health. So there is some work that's happening. So there is a $5,000 incentive through Nova Scotia Health for LPNs who are um, transitioning from LPN to RN. Um, I will tell you that, uh, so I graduated from a diploma nursing program. I had to do my entire degree. I got zero credit for my years of experience as a registered nurse. So I spent $20,000 and I was a registered nurse and I was a registered nurse when I started. So one of the things that's been really important is that they've actually now give people credit for the time that they've worked. So when now when you go into uh, nursing um, programs, registered nurses programs as an LPN, you actually have time taken off that it is a it's a bridging program. So the fact that rec people are being recognized for the, one, their knowledge, to their um, experience is really an important part around shortening that. So there is some work that's underway. There are also, um, for registered nurses, in some cases, there are um, programs where uh, individuals in hard to, um, hard to employ areas where uh, registered nurses will be supported um, through uh, the nursing strategy to become nurse practitioners, but it does come with a return to service agreement. So um, it is important that people go into that uh, knowing that the expectation is that you know, once the nurse practitioner program is completed, the expectation is you will work in a rural community as an example or hard to a community that needs primary care for a period of time for that return to service. So there are a number of things. These are some of the things that Office of Healthcare Professional Recruitment are looking at. Uh, and also I think, you know, when we look at at pay scales, it's really important to consider the investment and people's ability to um, make a wage afterwards and what that wage is. So um, we're really pleased with the, with the contract um, that we've settled with. Um, 
LPNs, RNs, um, and nurse practitioners as a result to support them. There's also some debt relief programs as well through the federal government. So trying to leverage all of those things in order to help people attain education. I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth North. Thank you. Do you know how much it costs if you're an LPN and you want to go and become an RN? Do you know how much that costs? That's a that's a like that's a genuine question. Like twenty thousand. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. I I really don't, uh, and it, I guess it would depend. I think that's one for. Um, Minister of Advanced Ed, there's the tuition, whether you live at home, you live at school. I mean, there's just a million factors, whether or not, you know, so I really don't have a number for that. I recognize the honorable member for Dartmouth North. Okay, yeah. Well, anyway, my point is, is that $5,000 is not that much. When you, when you think about it, like, it's better than nothing, but, like, is, is there any consideration of doing, you know, given that, really, if you're a primary care nurse, family practice nurse, that's, I mean, we know that there's 150,000 people on the wait list and we know that all across the province needs support in primary care clinics, health homes, et cetera, if that's the goal, right, which it is, I think, um, then what if there was a return to service or what is it called, fee for, what is it called? Return to service agreement if people can get paid to become our, I mean, if people, yeah, if people are financed to become RNs, if they're going to work in family practice. I mean, I really feel like, I, I do believe that the office and that you, you as the minister, the minister is looking at all angles. So can we look at that one? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. So I would say that that work is happening all the time and is underway and there's been a lot of action that has been taken. So um, there is a provincial nursing strategy that helps recruit, retain nurses through orientation. We have mentorship programs. So it's not that there's no investment. There's been significant investment in the, in the nursing profession. Um, and also, um, you know, some of that professional development is covered. Like, um, if you're going, as an example, for like, there's a lot of support for nurses uh, in those systems. So if you're going to a specialty area, as an example, very often the program that you require in order to work and maintain your specialty or to receive your specialty is actually covered by the employer. Family practice nursing, um, it isn't just nurses going into that. It is experienced nurses and you know, several years ago, I can't say for sure right today that there's still a program, but there is a program around family practice nursing. So some of this professional development is already covered. So I don't think it's just one thing. And we do have entry level nurses that are coming in and there is an investment and a long career ahead of them, of course, right, for that return on investment. But we also have to look at how we support our mid-career and end of career nurses as well. So um, arguably what I would say is when we look at some of the data, when I look at it um, nationally from when I was teaching nursing, we know that a lot of people leave the profession in the first five years. So there's a significant investment in our novice nurses in terms of making sure that they have senior nurse support at the elbow support whether that's by phone or if that's in person to make sure that their transition into practice is really well supported, which it wasn't always, you know. And then sometimes when people graduate, there's a period of time, an extended orientation program because perhaps they've been able to work in simulation labs and they've learned about things, but perhaps haven't been able to put all those skills together um, in a clinical environment. So I would say across you know, the work span of a registered nurse, an LPN, um, nurse practitioner, there's a number of real-time and in-time supports that are created in order to support the workforce. So we get lots of feedback. There is a, there is a provincial nursing network where universities sit, Department of Health and Wellness, um, Nova Scotia Health, IWK, so all of these leaders in nursing sit together and talk about ways in which they can support the, for the profession and things that we can do better. So believe me, there's lots of discussion ongoing um, all the time around how best to support, recruit and retain um, the workforce. I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth North. Thanks for that. I just I want to go back quickly to the bonus, the retention bonus. Uh, when we uh, were 
in estimate sessions before March break, we talked about, I asked you about, um, I think I did anyway, uh, about uh, why, so for instance, the healthcare workers at um, the North End Community Health Center wouldn't be getting the nursing bonus because they, you know, largely their funding comes from Nova Scotia Health or for the department. Uh, I believe your answer was, you know, there has to be a cutoff and, you know, it's like they're not technically employed, the employer's not Nova Scotia Health, et cetera. Um, and I just wanted to come back to that for a minute because then I've, since then I've had another uh, constituent contact me who is a Nova Scotia Health employee, uh, who is fairly new to the nursing profession, but is, you know, worked casual for the first year and now is working full time, but is not eligible for the two year, uh, like I promised to work for two years, $10,000 bonus. Uh, and, you know, again, it's this like discrepancy where it feels like, it feels like, you know, colleagues, working together are not being treated the same way. So I want, that, so that's A part. And B part is, I came across an article yesterday and now I can't find it, but I'm pretty sure I can, but that said that long-term care nurses were getting um, the $10,000 bonuses and they don't work, like they're employed by Shanax, so they're not uh, employed by Nova Scotia Health. So how come they, they, as non-employees of Nova Scotia Health, are able to get the bonus and, you know, someone like a nurse at the North End Community Health Centre wouldn't be able to. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, so I will give you um, a bit of the who was eligible. So um, in order to be eligible this year, you had to receive the uh, recognition bonus last year. Um, you remained employed in an eligible position, uh, working more than casually. So it had to be an FTE, whether it was a 1.0 FTE or 0.4, 0.2, you would be compensated based on the complement that you held for a permanent full-time position. Um, you had to be employed as a, by an eligible employer in an eligible, eligible position and be willing to sign a two-year return of service agreement for March 29, 2024. So that really is in a, a, you know, the broad swath of people who are working in Nova Scotia Health. Um, and in terms of the question, I, I think I know why um, nursing homes are in, in, um, included, but I really would rather um, have Minister for Seniors and Long-Term Care answer that because it does sit under her department and I don't want to misspeak on her behalf. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Okay. Uh, respectfully, to me it does not make sense that the eligibility for this year would be that you were eligible last year because this is exactly why the person I'm talking about, the person who contacted me, is not eligible because last year she was casual, then this year she's working full time and she's planning on staying. But she, so like it is, seems bananas to me that it would, that the, the eligibility for one year would depend on eligibility for the year before because is the not the point that we are trying to convince people to become full time employees uh, and sign on for lots of years. Thoughts?
I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, so it is. Uh, it would be. It's preferable that individuals speak to their employer directly about their eligibility. It's really hard when you don't have all of the information to speak directly about um, a situation with. And you don't want to offend anybody, but there has to be criteria. I mean, just there has to be inclusionary and exclusionary. And so uh, I know that there are a number of people who are not eligible based on last year. Have, you know, if they're newly signed employees, but we. We need to. We're trying to extend the people and ensure that there's stability over the next couple of years. There's also sign-on bonuses in some places. There's a number of different incentives that are happening. So I appreciate that it's you know it's always difficult for the outliers that don't meet the criteria, and it's it is hard to have lines, but we have to have lines. And so the um, eligibility criteria um, was listed, and and there's no um, there's no movement afoot to change that. I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth North. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to, I only have eight minutes or seven minutes in this round, so I'd like to just ask a couple of sort of th questions, loose, loose uh, questions from various <laughs> topics. So, um, Diabetes Canada finds that Nova Scotia has high rates of indi individual level modifiable risk factors. And one of the factors they highlight is that 75.8% of adults in Nova Scotia, including this one right here, are not eating enough fruits and vegetables. Uh, so is the department working on a strategy to reduce the occurrence of, of diabetes, and in particular uh, in terms of you know, uh, healthy diets and that kind of thing? I recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. So thank you, and thank you to the member for this question. So um, there's a number of things that are happening. So I, Solution 6 is really important. Um, it is around the determinants of health, and it looks at uh, you know what are the things that affect health. So we know through um, work that was recently done with an, a partnership with Nova Nordisk, which I'll tell you about in a minute, that 67% of Nova Scotians 12 years of the age and older have one or more chronic diseases. And we know that 37% of children and youth in Nova Scotia are obese or overweight or obese. And so we need to really look across sectors at how we're going to tackle this. It doesn't just sit in health, it sits in the education system, in the municipalities around active transportation and the work that happens with MPALs. You know, it, we're, it sits in you know, seniors in long-term care. But we do have a program with Nova Nordisk. So Nova Nordisk is a foundation that has a subsidiary drug company from Denmark. They were involved with the um, with um, developing insulin. They worked with uh, our own Canadian physicians to develop insulin. And their primary goal is, is to eradicate diabetes. And so when we uh, were in Denmark, we learned a lot about that work. And Nova Nordisk, um, is partnering to help they have a program called lighthouse that's over there marrying health and wealth so we have just entered an agreement with them and we will be going out to rfp not just for government but for private um private industry municipalities to come and work with us 
on projects out of a $3 million pot to positively impact obesity in children. And, you know, we, we, we need to look at how we marry that. So there has to be an economic driver behind it, right, in order for us to really kind of have an impact across the community. But looking at a variety of different things, we have to work across government, um, looking at best practices in some um, organizations. The school food nutrition program will be really important. We have a school food nutrition policy, which kind of mandates um, what can be uh, served to students uh, in our school system. We know that there are guidelines around physical activity. So we, we want to really start to have conversations with Nova Scotians that yes, there is a genetic predisposition, of course. And we now know about epigenetics. And so there's opportunities through um, behavioral interventions that support people, but we, we need to enable them. We can't blame people, right? We have to be really careful, but we need to make sure that we create environments where we enable people so that the healthy choice is the easy choice. So it's very top of mind, I want to assure you. We're working across government and a variety of different departments in order to address it. It's going to be a generational improvement for sure, but we absolutely are committed to, um, to really starting at preschool and right across uh, that, that childhood span to, to support health and well-being. Thank you. I recognize the minister for, or sorry, the honourable member for Dartmouth North. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'll just with my last little uh, bit of time for this section, I'll just do do my tirade on sugary drinks. So on this, like it just makes me crazy when I see in like you know municipal f rec facilities pop machines, or if there's no pop, it's, they're just filled with juice or power drinks or whatever those call, are called, uh, like Gatorade or whatever that's called, <laughs> thirst quenching drinks. They're packed with sugar. And I will tell you that as a, as a person who has like tried and feeds my kids pretty healthy food, the battle against Gatorade after a hockey game is a, it's like a real, it's a real thing. And so even to ban, like even uh, you know, I I know everyone needs to have choices and all that stuff, but like to ba to to ban that stuff from schools or you know uh, public buildings or whatever, like we you know we're putting period products in public buildings. Why can't we take Coke out of them? You know what I mean? Uh, it it just seems like a low hanging fruit for the health and well being of our of our societies. If people want to buy them, great. I buy I buy pop for my kids, uh, and we have it at home. But it's like it's like the public battle when it's everywhere it's at every grocery store aisle it's in it's at in every pop machine it's really bad for, for the health and wellness and the economy of this province and so with that little tirade i will take my seat and i look forward to asking another hour of questions in an hour thank you order that concludes our time for the ndp we'll now move into the Liberal round of questioning. I recognize the Honourable Member for Bedford Basin. Uh, I, I'd just like to see if the Minister or uh, Deputy... You're good? All right. Super duper. Um, so I think we'll probably move on now to... Um, Earlier today at, at Health Care Committee, we did hear about physicians leaving and we had, I think it was 31 who had left so far this year. We had, and that was a lot when we compare it with last year. So I was just wondering if the minister had any insight into why we had so many leave in that short period of time. I think it was, it was the first two months and What, what's being done to ensure that, that doctors are staying and what are we preparing for in the upcoming slew of retirements because the baby boomers are retiring. Thank you.
I recognize the honorable member or minister of health and wellness. So uh, thank the members. So from April 1st, 2023 to January 31st, 2024, there were 44 family physician starts and 31 family physician departures, 20 of which were due to retirements across the province. So that was a net gain of 13 family physicians province-wide, what I would say. Like whether you can break it down in different ways, but from January 19th, 2023 to January 18th, 2024, there were 595 family physicians whose primary billing uh, location was Central Zone, uh, and that number has remained consistent since 2021. We've had a net gain of 47 nurse practitioners in the last two years. Um, there has also been other investments, though, I will say. Um, since May of 2023, we've actually prevented uh, more than 28,000 patients from going on the Need of Family Practice Registry because we were able to invest in, practice, in, in practices. So part of that is through the hotline. Um, there's been some changes too at the college, so we know that there are 20, around 20 uh, American physicians licensed um, since making the American Board Certified Physicians eligible for full licensure in Canada. So licensure obviously is the first step to moving, right? You need to make sure that you can work here before you come here, so that work has happened with the college. Um, and also, um, we did... Um, the folks that are on the list, not all are static. So we know that there has been um, almost 46,000 people who have been removed um, from the list and placed with a provider from the registry in 23-24. So in terms of what we're doing, so there is a new contract with better pay and new compensation models for physicians. Um, and that was um, developed through interest-based negotiations, which was very um, successful and positive. We've increased the physician incentive uh, budget, expanded incentive program to include central zone, reduced red tape for physicians, um, we're extending virtual care options, um, added new positions like physician ex uh, assistance as an example to care teams. We've created the Atlantic Registry, we've increased the number of medical school seats, increased the number of residency seats, supporting new graduates and doctors to establish their practice through incubator clinics um, like we see at Dow Family Medicine and, and like the model that we're always so proud to talk about in Clare. Faster licensure for internationally educated physicians, our Patient Access to Care Act that allows physicians um, who are registered in other parts of the country to come and work here. And we also are looking at how we utilize our physicians. So, you know, we're expanding scope of practice for other professions. But as an example, we're piloting um, family practice anesthetists in Yarmouth just to, to see how we can curate and keep a more novel practice for, for physicians. So if they have a special interest, we want to keep them in family practice, but maybe you can do a bit of obstetrics, maybe you can do a bit of palliative care, et cetera, so that we can give people some options. And also investing in health homes because our new physicians, um, they want to work in a different environment than perhaps some of our more senior physicians. Recognize the Honourable Member Bedford Basin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, but keeping the same number of uh, family doctors doesn't work when your population is growing and when family doctors are not taking the numbers of patients that they used to. So it ends up being that although we may have roughly the same number of family docs, we need more family docs because the ones that are in the system now are not taking as many as they used to, as many patients as they used to, and and we've had an influx of people into the province. So we, we need to make sure that we actually have the services that our, our current population has, but also the newcomers, because we want to set people up for su success. So um, I just, uh, I appreciate everything that the minister had to say. I would just like to say those those incubator clinics sound terrific, and I think we it sounds to me like we need more of them throughout the province, because what we hear is that you know new doctors come in and they don't want to go through you know setting up a practice and dealing with all the billing and all of that stuff so it'd be really great if we could have some more like that outside of just halifax and, and the other thing I, I will say too is that the um the weekend clinic at Cobbaquid Multi-Service Centre, and I think I touched on this last time, but I just really want to make sure that I mention that. Having that available 
Saturdays and Sundays for a population that has experienced a 400% increase in the number of people without a doctor. Having that available to people on the weekends is huge, not only for people who don't have a doctor, but for people who, whose doctors don't practice on the weekend. And there's a lot of people like that and a lot of the walk-in clinics have closed down. So having that service is really valuable. And I feel like, you know, if we had some more of those during the week, uh, it, life would be better, but it would be better still if, if patients could be attached to doctors at those clinics because there are still too many people um, throughout Metro who just simply do not have a family physician or a nurse practitioner. So I think that's probably the last thing I'm going to say on that because I've probably um, talked about that a fair bit uh, since we began uh, estimates last um, two weeks ago. So I thought maybe I would move on now to the issue of rural emergency rooms. So um, this past December, the annual accountability report on emergency departments came out for fiscal 22-23. It reported that emergency departments across the province were, were scheduled to be closed for 37,890 hours that year. And in fact, Nova Scotia ERs were unexpectedly closed for 41,923 hours that year. So all told, that was over 3,000 days of closures. And so the unexpected closures increased substantially from the year before. So I'm just wondering, what was the cause of the increase? I recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. So thank you to the member for the question. So um, certainly, um, so Nova Scotia Health operates 30 emergency departments and eight urgent treatment centres across the, the province. Um, and then uh, we also have St. Anne's Centre, uh, which is a long-term care facility and also operates as, a, as an urgent treatment centre as well. So. We do, what we've seen is a decrease in the scheduled closures. So it's been very important in particularly our rural communities that we work with the available clinicians to schedule hours uh, because the primary reason that we see emergency department closures is a couple things, but always staffing. So predominantly physician staffing. Um, we also see in some rural communities where we have um, physicians who, um, uh, some are, are more senior physicians and, and want more um, predictable hours, and so that, res that develops into more predictable um, scheduling of emergency departments, uh, appreciating that emergencies are not schedulable. Right? Um, where we can, we have urgent treatment centers as well, so that we know the majority of things that come to most of our, to our sites are very often able to be addressed through urgent treatment. So we even look at things like lacerations that need suturing, we may have very simple fractures, etc. We do also have some nursing shortages as well, um, and it is, um, it's a very daunting environment to work in, so um, nurses have many skills, but I will say working in an emergency department, particularly a rural um, nursing department uh, or emergency department is very, very different. So the work that I did in Guysboro and uh, the worry that I experienced when I worked at Guysboro Emerge versus when I was able to work at St. Martha's in a very different environment because of the supports that are available, obviously. 
our emergency system has changed as well. So there are things that historically went to our emergency departments in rural communities that no longer need to go there. It's not best practice. And I use the example all the time of stroke. If you have stroke symptoms, we actually want you to the most immediate regional hospital in order for you to have diagnostic imaging to make sure that you get the care that you require and go into an intensive care unit or a stroke unit. Similarly with trauma, there are different levels of trauma emergency departments, and so the bigger the trauma, we actually want you to bypass our smaller sites because we want you to have access to a trauma team and ultimately to the, the um, tertiary and quaternary services in the city, and that allows us to do that, diagnostic imaging, lab resources, all of those things. So physician um, availability is the single most um, difficult, uh, I think, resource that we have. Uh, it also, in, in days gone by, our more senior physicians um, were trained in a different way, and so they ran the emergency room, they covered, uh, you know, they did a little bit of everything, but our new emergency room physicians require a different type of training, and so we are working across um, the province to support physicians that have that skill set and you know where we can train them in a regional environment and support them um, outside you know in kind of those community clusters um, so we do see an increase in the unplanned closures and that generally is related to an illness or something that comes up uh, occasionally nurses but often often physicians so uh, the urgent treatment centers have been a very good option i will say as well um, the emergency services um, we are looking at that continuum. So what is our ability um, to support um, different modalities in different places? So as an example, in Canso, they have a model where um, support is given. There's extensive training done with the nurses and support is given through the medical comm center, as an example, in that week where the physicians are not in community at all, and also the support that's available to them through Guysborough Hospital and St. Martha's, as one example. So we have to work in community. It starts at, with recruitment. It's, it really is around supporting uh, practice. And, and the other thing I would say is making sure that when people come to work uh, in rural environments, particularly, they understand um, the complexity of doing a, like a level three uh, emergency room type of care and the last thing I'll say um, is just I'm sure there'll be other questions but I think one of the things that that Nova Scotia Health and healthcare workers in this province should be very proud of we're actually one of the only jurisdictions that have never had a disruption in our regional hospital emergency rooms and when we look at colleagues and other um, jurisdictions across the country they've actually had disruption in their regional hospitals so I will say that there are times that there is um, that there are resources in smaller emergency rooms that are uh, reallocated to our regional hospital sites for just that reason: the access to diagnostic imaging, um, you know, lab testing, um, ICUs. Um, specialty services like internal medicine and surgery so there have been times that we have had to reallocate um, uh, resources to uh, to different areas in order to support the regional sites and maintaining uh, the care that they provide recognize the honorable member bedford basin thank you mr chair um so to be clear what the minister said was there are times when we have to take from the smaller centers and bring them into the regional center. Otherwise, we're going to have a regional center shut down. And I'm assuming that serves more people and higher acuity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we need to do that. Uh, first, it's like, I don't know, putting your mask on on the airplane when it drops down before you help somebody else. So, okay. Thank you uh, for the clarity on that. Do we have any idea what the emergency room closure numbers are looking like for this year? Um, can we expect those, the planned ones to come down? I realize it's pretty hard for you to know whether the unplanned ones will come down. We'll, we'll get those numbers at the end of the year, but the, the planned ones, are those coming down?
recognize the Honourable Health Minister. So I can tell you that in 22-23, um, in the total hours of closure uh, were uh, 79,813. Year to date, at the end of January, in 23-24, our closures were 53,424. So it appears to me that it's trending to be less. However, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't have this quarter. So I cannot, I don't want to tell you something that's not accurate. Um, and I don't have quarter over quarter. So I don't, I am, um, you know, hopeful that it is either going to hold or be a little bit less. That would be what I would expect. Um, but again, until the last quarter information is in, I really can't guarantee. I recognize the Honourable Member, Bedford Basin. Could the Minister point to some specific um, investments that are being made to keep emergency rooms open? Recognize the Honourable Health Minister. So there is, um, so in emergency care initiatives overall, there's uh, eight million dollars that will be invested uh, this year additionally in the budget. So we would look at a couple of things that I would point to specifically. So there is um, a bundle to support emergency um, care, which would include new positions, um, looking at different service plan planning and care delivery models. We, last year, we made a number of investments in the emergency room, looking at physician assistants, looking at nurse practitioners, waiting room uh, advocates and care providers. All of those things will continue. We have the offload teams, the float MD, et cetera. So those things will continue, but we are looking at the different models. Um, we're also looking at virtual emergency care for individuals of, with less urgent needs in order to support um, to support folks. We also are investing in a, um, a trauma consult service as well. So I, again, I don't think there's just one thing. The, again, I go back to the contract. We are working with emergency room um, physicians as the contract continues to be around an accountability framework, supporting them in their practices, particularly in our rural communities. So there is a number of things underway. Uh, and, and what I would say as well is some of it's very site specific. So there are things that are happening at our bigger sites, um, but, but maybe are not appropriate in our smaller sites. So we really do have to look at the, uh, the environment that we're in and the capacity and the skills and abilities of the workforce that are there. So I will tell you there's a simulation, um, a, a mobile simulation unit as an example that travels around. Um, in Eastern Zone particularly that supports, um, because sometimes we have um, really high acuity but low frequency interventions um, in these rural sites, and it actually can be a deterrent for physicians that maybe don't insert chest tubes, as an example, or intubate on a regular basis. So we do have an investment in mobile simulation that allows physicians and emergency room nurses to keep their skills. So it is, um, it's a high acuity environment, but the pressure is low, of course, because we're using um, simulation environment and uh, um, I don't think they're called mannequins anymore, but you know what I mean, yeah. The Honourable Member, Bedford Basin. Um, so Muscadabit Valley Memorial Hospital's emergency department was only open 39% uh, of its scheduled hours. Um, and that would be according to that particular report that came out in December. Uh, what, what will this budget do specifically to help keep that ER open longer?
recognize the Honourable Health Minister. So Muscadabit Valley Memorial Hospital uh, is an urgent treatment centre. Has been transitioned to an urgent treatment centre. Uh, I recognize the Honourable Member Bedford Basin. So are you, so it's an emergent em, emer, an urgent treatment centre. So it's not. Um, an emergency department, it's just urgent treatment centre. Um, according to this report, it was only open 39% of the time. So what are we going to see in this budget that helps to keep that urgent treatment centre open? Recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you. So um, I will get back to you about that. I feel that there have been changes around stabilizing workforce uh, in that area, and I don't have that right in front of me, but I will get back to you about uh, the work that's been done there. But in terms of the urgent treatment, and there's a virtual urgent care there as well, um, but I just, uh, I just realized I don't have that exact document. I'm trying to remember where I put it. <laughs> Recognize the Honourable Member, Bedford Basin. So I have some, a few other questions about specific ERs. And I just looked one up, the next one up to make sure it is still an ER. <laughs> so I'm not asking about something that doesn't exist anymore. Um, but the, um, so for example, the Straight Richmond Hospital, its ER was only open 42% of its scheduled hours. Uh, so looking to see, you know, what investments have been made there so that it can remain open or that so it can be remain open more often. Recognize the Honourable Health Minister. Uh, so again, we go back to uh, staffing levels, of course, in some of these spots. So um, we have introduced a rural specialist incentive bonus of up to $16,000 a year uh, for those practicing in rural Nova Scotia for three years plus. So there is recruitment efforts underway. And in um, 
Straight Richmond. Uh, they're in progress. We are developing a virtual urgent care model there as well. Uh, so there have been some changes there to support uh, the staff in terms of offering urgent treatment um, when when uh, they're able. But we again, we continue to um, look at how best to recruit to uh, some of our more rural sites. I recognize the honourable member, Bedford Basin. So. Um, Again, on the same theme, uh, Soldier M Memorial Hospital's emergency department was open during only 42% of its scheduled hours. So um, is there anything in particular that's being done for that ER to keep it open more, more often or longer? Recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. So in regards to Soldiers Memorial Hospital, uh, there has been work done um, there at the hospital overall. So there is a new uh, emergency room physician uh, started at Valley Regional in January who will start to cover shifts at Soldiers Memorial um, one day a week, hopefully to Im increase. There's a new ambulatory care unit there um, that's also helping um, patients access care. Um, Working with Mid Valley uh, Region Physician Recruitment and Retention and the Annapolis Valley Chamber of Commerce, we've invested in those community groups in order to support um, their recruitment efforts. They have a really robust um, and interested group in terms of supporting, and in terms of the, uh, you know, there are primary care options uh, there as well. So. Um, there are a number of things underway. We know that uh, there has been uh, ED closures, but again, we go back to the availability of physician services and making sure that there is opportunities for people to access mobile care units, as an example, and uh, and uh, also um, primary care services when available. Yeah. Recognize the honourable member, Bedford Basin. So staying focused on the valley, this government closed the emergency department at the Annapolis Community Health Centre. Will the minister commit to investing in this emergency room so people can access the emergency care that they need? Or is there something in this budget that we don't know about that will actually do that? Recognize the Honourable Health Minister. So in regards to the Annapolis Community Health Centre, um, in October of 2022, it was actually converted to an urgent treatment centre, uh, and that was done in collaboration with the physicians. The physicians uh, are, are, have been there a long time, much loved, uh, and working with them in order to stabilize access to urgent treatment centres, uh, Nova Scotia Health was able to work with them to find an urgent treatment model. So it's currently open uh, Monday, Wednesday and Friday from 9 to 4 and these are very consistent hours and prior to that um, really there was an inconsistent pattern there. So um, wherever we can we want to improve or increase that um, but again so at their CC there were about 1,608 visits in six months um, and uh, most of the 83% of the uh, CTAS patients were level 4 or 5. Uh, so really, we continue to work uh, with the clinicians there and, and uh, continue to support um, attracting new healthcare professionals. Recognize the Honourable Member, Bedford Basin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we have ambulances being turned away from Soldiers Memorial because there are no doctors and the emergency room is closed. And the Annapolis Valley Community Centre uh, no longer has an emergency room. Really across the valley, the situation is rough. So what is this budget doing to ensure that residents in Annapolis can get emergency care and aren't stuck in ambulances being, if they can get one, uh, ambulances being driven around the province?
recognize the Honourable Health Minister. So I'll talk a bit about the emergency services. Some will be Valley, Western Zone specific, and others will be a bit broader. So there have been significant investments over the past two and a half years. and. Um, you know, not only addressing deferred maintenance, but just really trying to, um, you know, increase the workforce um, from from um, and trying to modernize the system. So, overall, the call volumes um, of EHS are up uh, about five and a half percent over the past five years, which is which is pretty significant. Of of the calls that EHS receives, thirty percent of those calls would be high acuity calls, and seventy percent would be considered lower acuity calls. Um, so we've uh, done a couple of things. So I just want to talk a bit about offloads. So the staffing um, access and flow work that's happened, um, looking also at supporting um, patients who are alternative level care waiting for um, uh, long-term care or community supports, there's been a number of investments. So a, a good story, Yarmouth ED had offloads uh, this time last year of about 60 minutes, but through the work of, and the investments of the Safer F bundle that I talked to you about and access and flow initiatives, um, we actually have reduced those. So in January, um, that team at Yarmouth had their um, offload times down to 37 minutes, which is pretty impressive. And then in February, those uh, that offload time went down to 27 minutes, so 10 minutes in a month based on some of the new things that are happening there. And certainly that happens because, you know, we provide resources, but the team really implements that and sees what works in their environment. So I just want to give uh, Yarmouth ED staff a shout out. Um, so, um, you know, we'll be, we're excited to see, uh, and then of course they're going to get a new emerge. So that is going to be even more helpful to them. Um, you know what, uh, we've talked about the clinical transport operators. Uh, I really do think it's important to talk about the dock in the box. So um, we now have um, emergency room physicians working 24 seven in our medical comm center with EHS. And we've supported them with a registered nurse, as you know, and we're actually, there's been a um, senior paramedic working in that environment, and actually that program's been so successful, we'll be adding a second senior paramedic in that environment as well. Um, the RNs are experienced, um, they're wanting to utilize more of their skills, and so you can anticipate that over time, those nurses will expand their, their scope of employment. Um, so the RNs um, in that comm centre uh, answered 8,500 calls and were able to redirect a good portion of them um, away from, like finding different care pathways for them. The other thing that we've recently implemented is, um, it's called the Good Sam camera. So the Good Sam camera uh, is a video link that can be sent to medical first responders uh, and also to paramedics in the scene so that the medical comms physician can actually visualize. It's like a, it's a video call. And it allows a physician uh, in the medical comm center to see what's happening in the area. So it's a huge support. Um, there was a, um, we're supporting medical first responders too in the rural areas. So I think it was uh, three weeks ago, three Saturdays ago, there was a medical first responder conference province-wide, um, which was I think 170 people attended, Dr. Andrew Travers, Jeff Fraser, working with those folks about how we can support them in the field because we know that they respond in communities early. So there's new um, kind of first responder packs that have been offered to them. There's Wi-Fi now on a number of the um, uh, fire trucks throughout the province in order to enable them because when we worked with uh, mutual aid across the province and Nova Scotia Fire Association we knew that there were gaps in cellular service so enabling the trucks with Wi-Fi has been an important communication tool. Um, we uh, also have spear units uh, that are supporting in more, con more densely populated areas so it's a single paramedic unit that allows um, one paramedic to go into you know, questionable calls, not those 30% of those high acuity calls. Um, and as a result of that, um, between four and six out of 10 individuals um, have been diverted from being transferred. And when they look at the quality of that program, less than 5% bounce back to hospital as a result of that, and there's been no adverse events. So that's been a really positive program in terms of supporting. 
Uh, and we will see that um, emergency medical responders, our first class of emergency medical responders is currently being trained. So they're going to work in offload areas where they would support um, patients in getting our paramedics more quickly out on the road. They would also work together at times doing low acuity calls. If the spear unit comes and treats a patient and they need to be transferred but they don't actually need ambulance, um, the emergency medical responders will be able to transfer these individuals. And they'll also work with paramedics on the trucks um, and we're investing in equipment and spear unit and supervisor trucks and the video link to support. So their recruitment, we've settled a good contract um, with our paramedics and we're pleased to have been able to do that. Um, recruitment is a top priority and the company and uh, some members from the department recently had a mission to Australia where there's a uh, quite an equivalent program and that has been very successful in other provinces and they have some really good leads and uh, the new um, Chief Operating Officer of uh, EHS has, was really pleased with that trip and had around 25, I think, kind of bites on paramedics. We're training more paramedics. We've expanded the program. There's one in Yarmouth with a tuition rebate. So, I mean, there's a few more things that I could go on about, but I, I just want to reassure folks that we really are investing in the uh, pre-hospital emergency care and also, of course, the clinical transport operators. And the other thing we've done to support, I'll just say, is that the plane. So we have a fixed wing now um, that will support patients who need to come into the city from Yarmouth and Sydney and come in for tests or procedures or whatever it is. And that actually has put over 5,000 hours of ground ambulance back into um, into uh, into the, the system. So we really do have to focus on our regional hospitals. When our regional hospitals get tied up, the impacts are felt rurally. And so that starts with the mothership, the QE2. And there's a lot of work happening around offload there and access and flow, which inevitably will support the rest of the province. And then if we go out from a hub and spoke, similarly, um, different uh, interventions in our regional sites across the province. I recognize the honorable member for Bedford Basin. Uh, thank you uh, to the Minister for that um, in-depth answer. I appreciate that. We have, however, been hearing about people who have been taken from, say, Sydney to Halifax for tests, and they're released there, and they're told to find their own way home. And they're there in a Johnny shirt, and they're not dressed appropriately. They don't have any... They don't have anyone who lives here. They're just kind of left there. So. This is all of what you just told me sounds great, but we also have to think about the human side of this, which is you can't just, you know, take somebody uh, four hours from home and say goodbye, get your own way back. If they were sick enough to be flown in a plane, they probably shouldn't be going home in a Johnny shirt. Uh, sticking their thumb out trying to get home. So I, I do want to leave that with the minister. We've, we've heard of cases like this here in Halifax where people are just left. Recognize the Honourable Health Minister. So I think that speaks to the work that's happening uh, in Nova Scotia Health around um, our access and flow teams. So really looking at discharge planning. So part of Safer F is not about how long a patient is in hospital, which is what we've talked about through our my entire career, but it's actually how long a patient <coughs> is away from home. And I think really that the key to that sits in discharge planning and the expectations of um, families' ability to pick folks up. We've heard that. I've heard that throughout the course of my career. Patients go for a procedure, diagnostic procedure in the city, and they're, they're, di they're discharged from the city. And so how do we make sure that families understand what the potential outcome is before people leave? And in the event that people don't have family, what are the alternative ways in which they can be transferred home? So it is always, we do have uh, transfer units now, but we also need to make sure that we're communicating really clearly with families about what the expectation is and what the potential issues are around discharge. So if you have a stress test and you pass it, you may be discharged directly from Halifax. And I think perhaps it's a communication issue and uh, that has happened historically over a number of years uh, in my career. And so really uh, that does start with discharge planning, making sure that we have good supports in place for, for patients as they go. Um, outside of their regular hospital. Similarly, there are people who are discharged home from, from local community hospitals and for a variety of different reasons, uh, transportation is an issue. So it really is about knowing the patient and making sure that we work with them and their loved ones in order to support them in having a dignified discharge and transfer back home. 
recognize the honourable member, Bedford Basin. I, I like what the minister said about a dignified discharge because I think there's nothing particularly dignified about, you know, being ushered out the door and said, find your way home. And, it, you know, I'm sure it happened under us and we're hearing it's happening now. And now with a fixed wing, it's an even greater distance because it used to be, you know, it was your community hospital that was closing for the night, etc. And they were saying, you can't stay here and that kind of issue. But now it's literally people being flown great distances and with no way home, no money, no, no, no clothes, and they have to get home. So that, uh, you know, I think that is something that we need to ensure that that isn't happening to Nova Scotians because uh, needing a test so desperately that you have to be flown to Halifax for that, uh, and then being discharged like that uh, must be a deep concern. And, you know, there's money involved, and, and quite frankly, not all Nova Scotians can afford a trip home. Um, whether it's on a bus or via taxi or, or whatever, and uh, if they have to buy clothes on top of that, it, it would be very expensive. So I just, I, I'm just hoping that people would be very sensitive to that particular concern. Um, we're also hearing from residents in Bedeck, and they're calling for the Victoria County Memorial Hospital's emergency room to be reopened. Is there any commitment in this um, in this particular budget to to actually do that so that folks in uh, Victoria County can access the emergency care they need? <clears throat> Recognize the Honourable Health Minister. So I thank the member for the question. Um, I would say Bedeck is in a very unique situation. Uh, so there are a number of physicians that work in Bedeck, uh, and um, currently they are operating under an urgent treatment model. The reason uh, they've uh, move to that model uh, is that uh, the physicians currently feel that they're not able to work in that emergency department. So we do really need to look at a resource plan. There is a community liaison committee that's working uh, in Bedeck with um, Eastern Zone uh, leadership, uh, local um, leaders in the community and certainly some local community members, um, problem solving. Uh, but there is significant access to primary care in that uh, area. And uh, again, we, there are some part-time physicians there, et cetera. So the commitment is to, we've heard from them. Um, I have connections in Bedeck, so I hear on a regular basis, as I do through my colleague uh, from Victoria the Lakes. And uh, so I want to assure um, the folks of, of Bedeck and surrounding areas that there is a commitment to reopen that emergency room and we'll continue to work uh, in community with them and with the physicians in order to find a solution. Recognize the Honourable Member, Bedford Basin. So during the 22-23 fiscal year, more than 10% of patients left uh, emergency rooms throughout this province without being seen, and this is up um, quite a bit from the year before, even though overall emergency room visits were apparently steady. Does the Minister find that concerning, that 10% and, and the increase? Uh, you find that concerning? Recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. 
So thank you uh, to the members. So the uh, left without being seen um, percentage has stayed um, relatively the same. Um, so the number of patients who left without being seen uh, in 22-23 was around 10.4% and it was the same in 23-24 year to date. We actually are seeing that there's been a reduction in the patient visits from the previous fiscal year to our emergency departments and I think that's a testament to the 60,000 um, primary care appointments and different pathways that people can take and um, I'm not I, I can't cross-reference the numbers in my head but I wonder if half of those are strep throat tests to be perfectly honest because our, our um, pharmacists are able to do that now so we are seeing a reduction in utilization in our emergency room which is really encouraging because there are different pathways to access for for episodic uh, care as an example so we obviously whenever anybody leaves we do worry about that um, and and wherever possible through the triage process if someone is triaged at a low acuity we want to be able to actually provide them with an alternative sometimes that's urgent care or virtual emergency room care in the ed but there are other times as well where people will, will um, could could be seen in community or perhaps the next day, depending on the presenting um, concern that they come with. So, um, we do encourage people to stay. I I would say too that the. Um, the impact that our um, patient our waiting room advocates has have. I've heard really really positive things about the care that people receive from the from those folks uh, making sure that folks are comfortable as they wait and also from the care providers as well who are able to perform some of the some of um, you know some lower acuity uh, care in in and around the waiting areas so again we do worry about that we watch it very closely but we are pleased that it's not increasing actually the percentage and that we are seeing a reduction in er visits overall um, throughout the province I recognize the Honourable Member for Bedford Basin. So are there specific investments being made in this, in this budget to ensure Nova Scotians who enter an emergency room get treated? Um, you know, if they're there and they actually need an emergency room uh, versus, you know, could go to uh, another kind of uh, care centre. I recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. So thank you. Um, so we'll, there will be a continuation of the investments we made in the prior year um, in regards to emergency room uh, supports. So there are 10 sites, as an example, that have the, um, the flow lead and offload assessment team. We call them floats. Um, there are a number of sites that have a waiting room care provider, patient advocates. We do now have four sites with physician assistants. Uh, and certainly training our own physician assistants will help us maintain that supply. Uh, our nurse practitioners, eight sites have nurse practitioners that are working in the emergency room. Uh, and then the virtual urgent care is in six sites. When we look at um, investments in optimization for emergency rooms, one of the things that's been successful, particularly in our busiest ER environments, including the IWK, has been um, are the rapid assessment zones. So particularly during peak times, um, the rapid assessment zone. So you really are separating your census of patients so that there's opportunities for folks to be seen. Um, I'll give an example. Truro Hospital has seen very, very positive results, as has the IWK. Especially when we're in those peak respiratory seasons, it allows us to them to see people on a, um, you know, just a quicker basis. Very kind of um, complaint specific or condition specific environment, which has really been very helpful. I will say the greatest thing that we can do. Um, to support our emer the emergency room congestion starts at the very, uh, out is it at our outflow. So the work that's happening in seniors and long-term care around building the facilities, our transition to care facility, which will open this year, is an essential part of making sure that patients who are lower acuity and ready to be 
physically or um, medically discharged, uh, recognizing they may have some frailty and et cetera, can move to a different care environment, which will open beds. C3 as well has been very, very effective in terms of helping us manage the system. Integration with our um, with our EHS partners. So as an example, in the city, when we know what's going on in our emergency rooms, how do we then share the care load across Dartmouth General, QE2, Cobequid, et cetera, in order to support um, you know, different opportunities so not everybody's coming to the same place? And, and really respectfully diverting people to different um, access points to care. Not everybody knows about that. And of course, the app, right? Giving people the opportunity. So we know people on the Need a Family Practice Registry have access to virtual care. But in fact, all of us uh, in Nova Scotia do. We can get two appointments a year, which has also proven to be effective in terms of diversion. So diversion around the primary care pieces is essential, but also the outflow in terms of making sure there's spots for people to go so we have beds to bring people into. Recognize the honourable member for Bedford Basin. And I do want to thank the um, minister for mentioning that virtual, um, the two virtual appointments, because it is sort of one of those things that I have to sort of remind myself to tell people when they are talking about the healthcare system. There is this twice a year you can use this particular uh, service, and I probably would. I wouldn't go to the ER twice a year normally, right? So um, I might not ever might, might not need to use them for quite a while. But there's lots of people who do, and and having that is is good. And because I do believe that we should give uh, props where they are due. Um, although my job is not to be your cheerleader, right? <laughs> Just to be clear. <laughs> um, one of the things that we are. Um, we have been looking at is is one person one record we did discuss that earlier um today i think it was i think it was today um and 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 the minister did in, in, indicate that it was supposed to come on stream in 2025 um is there any money being spent on one person one record this particular year and if so how much Recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. So, one person, one record is a huge uh, project, humongous. So, this year we will be investing $62.1 million in the one person, one record. Um, $27.2 million of that um, is around the compensation um, associated with it, administrative, at the elbow support, change management, etc. And then um, operating um, is around 15, um, 15 million. And then we have some contingency built in as well. So uh, it is a significant investment. Obviously, there would be some infrastructure work around um, space and, you know, gear, equipment, whatever it is. And uh, yeah, so it's a total of about 62.1 million dollars. I recognize the honorable member, Bedford Basin. Um, in the few minutes that I have left, I'm just going to briefly touch on offload times for ambulances. In January of this year, the average ambulance offload time at Cape Breton Regional was 201 minutes, and that's 73 minutes longer than the month before. Uh, I wonder if the minister could speak to that. And, and perhaps, actually, I'll just ask my, my last question as well, and then she can just answer the, the both. Um, will the minister commit to releasing monthly offload time data for all hospitals across the province?
recognize the Honourable Minister for Health and Wellness. So I do thank the member for the question. Um, so we do know that offload times, there's a variety of things that impact those. And I did uh, share some uh, early successes. So we are seeing some success in Truro Hospital uh, and also uh, in Yarmouth Hospital as another example. So that offload time, because it's at the top of my head, went from 60 minutes, it went down to 37 in January and is now down to 27. So we are seeing in some areas, when we look at the offload times in our bigger centres, we know that there are some challenges there around offload. And again, that speaks to the throughput. So um, some of the things that we're, we're going to be looking at, it won't change perhaps the time the individual may be on the stretcher, but it, what we are trying to affect by introducing um, emergency medical responders is the time paramedics are in the hallways. So making sure that their individuals are triaged, those floats are available, that we can um, put paramedics back out onto uh, the trucks because that's going to change response time. So it all works together. Um, so we have uh, in the department moved from more of a contract manager to a regulator and are developing our own data systems and I can assure the member opposite that we, um, the, the regulatory branch of the Department of Health and Wellness who are managing EHS are creating their own data sets to watch that. I would also say um, that there are a couple of places uh, in the province that regularly meet their offload times, and I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to the Aberdeen and to St. Martha's Hospital for um, their regular attainment of their offload times. Um, so average offload times are updated weekly on the Action for Health website. Yeah. I recognize the Honourable Member Bedford Basin. Thank you very much. That's a that's a. Uh there's a lot of little tabs on that particular one, right? So thank you very much um, for that. Um, yeah, I, I will just I will just say the the minister has talked about you know folks who don't have doctors and they can get uh, referred so that they do have someone following them, and we, we've discussed that before here in the House. Uh, sorry, I, the reader, so I couldn't read your lips there, but, um, and I'm not sure all the people who need do a doctor, who like really need a doctor, are getting referred on to that new service um, that's available, and so I just wanted to draw the minister's attention to that because I really feel that there are some people who are slipping through the cracks and as MLAs we often hear about them and we try to bring them to the department's attention but my concern would be that that with some potential solutions in hand if they don't if we don't know how to get access to that new service uh, and maybe just some information about that uh, dropped at our desk would be helpful so that we Order. have that Thank you. Uh, as we are reaching approximately the two and a half hour mark, we're going to 7:42. Would you like a, a quick, very quick recess, or? Yeah, uh, we'll, we're going to take a, a quick five-minute recess uh, and then be back. We're now in recess.
Order, order. Uh, the subcommittee on supply will resume. Uh, it's now um, time for the NDP's round of questioning. I recognize the honourable member for Halifax, Citadel, Sable Island. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Um, so I wanted to turn to some issues around um, gender affirming care. You know, it's been a slow road um, to uh, having Nova Scotia actually um, follow the WPATH standards of care version 8. Um, and as far as I know, we actually are still not at that place, that there are um, procedures under the standards of care version 8 that are not currently uh, covered um, automatically by MSI. Um, last year we learned that despite that, that there had in fact been um, at least one surgery um, of, a, of one of the, the procedures contained in WPASS uh, standards of care version 8 that was completed in Nova Scotia, or what, sorry, was completed, was funded by MSI, but was also subject to an NDA around that um, experience. So I'm wondering if the minister can uh, uh, let us know how many voice feminization surgeries have been approved and, and completed for Nova Scotians over the past fiscal year, and how many facial feminization or masculization surgeries have been approved and completed for Nova Scotians over the past fiscal year. I recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. So um, we will get some of that information for the member opposite, but I, I do have to say that um, I'm actually very proud of the work that's happened in this province around gender affirming care. Um, we have a new gender affirming care policy that was implemented in July 2023, which is actually the first of its kind in Canada. And it was created uh, with the department and through um, fulsome consultation with the, with the community members, with a number of people who represented uh, the pride community with the trans community across this province, um, rural and urban, and it provides equitable and culturally appropriate care. It outlines the standards of care, coverage, eligibility criteria, and the process for ac uh, accessing gender affirming care. And, and so I appreciate, uh, I know that one of the, the problems with implementing WPATH standards, um, I think they were supposed to be out in July, they didn't come until September, but we have been very committed in working, um, working with community, working within the department to improve gender affirming care. Um, we've also ensured that, that um, there are fee codes as a result where physicians can take their time, make sure that physicians and uh, nurse practitioners who are offering primary care are trained and make sure they follow WPATH. This is going to be, um, you know, all the many people uh, in the province want to offer excellent gender affirming care and it's going to take some time to ensure that those individuals have first of all the education that they require to make sure that they're standard compliant and they're getting the appropriate information and that they gain some experience and confidence. So we're going to continue to work with clinicians across this province. We need to continue to work with people in community and organizations that support people accessing gender affirming care. But I believe as a province in the last two years, we have made great strides. I don't believe it's perfect. I couldn't tell you that any part of the healthcare system, but I can tell you that there is a commitment from the department and from government to continue this work to expand and support and uh, help individuals seeking care, uh, gender affirming care, and across the Pride community. So there has been investments. Uh, as well throughout Nova Scotia Health and IWK to that end. And so while I appreciate it's not perfect, I do believe that uh, the individuals involved both in community and in Department of Health and with the care providers should be celebrated for the work they've accomplished in the past two years. Just before I recognize the honorable member, just periodic bits of chatter here and there and with the fans and stuff. So I just ask, maybe take it down a touch. Um, I recognize the honorable member, Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so just to clarify, um, uh, the minister will be able to follow up with the number of voice feminization, facial feminization, and face, facial masculine, masculinization uh, surgeries that were completed in the past fiscal year um, and uh, whether there were <laughs> NDAs used in that. Can I just confirm that the minister will follow up with that information? Recognize the Honourable Minister Health. I will confirm the numbers, but if there's an NDA associated with any of those, I will not disclose that. Uh, recognize the Honourable Member Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. 
So in 2023, the department committed an additional 1.7 million to increase access to gender affirming surgeries. Um, the Canadian Census uh, says that about 1.17 percent of the Nova Scotia population is trans or non-binary. So, uh, did the addition of the 1.7 million result in increased surgeries um, or increased types of surgeries? And could the minister speak to how that money was dispersed? Can I see Honourable Minister Health and Wellness? So, uh, in terms of uh, individuals receiving out of province um, gender affirming surgery, uh, in 21 22, there's 65 individuals, 22 23, there was 118 individuals, and year to date, 23 24, there has been 109 individuals. So, I don't have the last uh, probably six to eight weeks. <clears throat> I recognize the Honourable Member, Halifax, Citadel, Sable Island. Thank you. And so, uh, you know, we could probably assume that this fiscal year will end up around the same number as was last year. So I'm wondering what the, the budgetary allocation of 1.7 million, how was it, how was it used um, to increase access? To recognize the Honourable Health Minister. Uh, so, obviously, the utilization has increased in terms of gender affirming uh, surgeries that have uh, been uh, completed. But in terms of gender affirming care, in terms of the investment, not all of it would sit necessarily in a singular budget line. So, there's new and expanded fee codes, as an example. Um, there's increased funding to uh, Health Act Sexual Health Centre and Pride Health. There's health care provider. Um, work that's happening that they can declare. There's um, education and modules to make sure that they have the credentials um, to ensure uh, quality and safety for the patients accessing gender-affirming uh, care. Um, there's, an intra there's also an in-province travel support program and an out-of-province tra uh, out travel support program. And um, there's also been ongoing consultation with um, the trans and gender diverse community uh, in order to make sure that we're removing barriers in a timely fashion. So I don't know that it's in totally encaptured in just that 1.7 million. There have been other areas in which we've been supporting um, um, uh, ensuring that there is increased access. Recognize the Honourable Member, Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Thank you. And um, yeah, I will go back to last year's budget because I'm, I'm quite sure that that amount was actually specifically about increasing access to surgeries. So, uh, you know, just uh, wondering about that. There was also last year uh, an additional investment to Pride Health announced. Um, and again, I apologize, I don't have the exact number right in front of me, but I think it was around uh, seven to 800 thousand for the year um, and that was to um, engage more navigators across the province as of January 2024 no new navigator positions had been created advertised or filled so the money that was allocated towards pride health um, I uh, and, and and more importantly increase access to support and services, right? So the folks from Pride Health are the folks that can be on the ground in the regions, supporting folks who want to access gender affirming care, um, supporting physicians and other healthcare professionals who have questions, um, and just doing the general awareness raising that Pride Health has done amazingly well with, with one person in place for many, many years. So I'm wondering what the plan is to actually get navigators in place for Pride Health. I recognize the Honourable Health Minister. Uh, so in the 23-24 budget, there was $368,000 in new funding. Um, so in, according to my notes, um, that there was a navigator, for a Pride Health navigator in, uh, hired in October of 2023. I recognize the Honourable Member, Halifax, Citadel, Sable Island. 
Okay, I mean, in discussions with uh, the leader of Pride Health in January, uh, he said he had not seen any of the money and that no one knew had been hired. So, um, but perhaps the minister could clarify. So for the 368,000, I think I thought the intention was to hire four navigators, one for each zone. Um, and is the intention still to fill those positions? Recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. So that money would have gone to Nova Scotia Health. Um, so that I'd, I'd have to check with them to see um, whether there were people that applied, if they met the criteria, etc. But certainly, there's been no change in the funding as a result of that. So we'll we'll have to check with Nova Scotia Health around their uh, recruitment efforts. Recognize the Honourable Member, Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Um, so the two amounts that we're talking about from 2023. Have they been made uh, permanent funding lines in 2024, or is there additional funding allocated to gender affirming care and to Pride Health for this budget that we're currently discussing? The Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. Yes, that funding is permanent. I recognize, recognize the member, Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Um, uh, during the um, past year, there was the Premier led a contest to find healthcare ideas that didn't cost money and brought in over 2,000 ideas. When the initial voting list was published publicly, um, it included the idea that uh, healthcare providers um, use appropriate pronouns when working with members of the public. Um, I believe that that was removed from the list because <coughs> we don't have a habit of voting on human rights um, in public contests. So I'm wondering if the minister can talk about the process by which those ideas were selected and whether uh, the minister had a chance to review the list before it was published. I recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. Uh, so I, I did not review it before uh, it was published, and um, you know I think uh, the team worked really hard to um, discern amongst themselves what the best approach would would be. So it was recognized by an individual who we don't know. It was anonymous. It was submitted. We don't know. Uh, the reasons why it was submitted, if that was someone who um, is part of the Pride or trans community, we really didn't know the genesis of that. So trying to balance the importance of recognizing that that was submitted as an idea and seen as a gap in the system, and then recognizing as well with the feedback from the community that that was hurtful to some individuals. So it really, there was no ill intention around that. Uh, I, Whoever that individual was, however they identify, it was important enough for them that they felt it needed to be brought to the attention of, um, you know, of of the team, of the the folks. I I don't think it was um, meant in the spirit of a contest. I think it was a pure and. Um, <clears throat> considerate way for that individual to express the concerns that they had. So it's very, very helpful for them to bring that forward. So it, it is a balance. Perhaps there would have been outcry, you know, if we hadn't been able to go back and, and if we had left it off. So it really is a, a learning. We're not going to get things right all the time. We wanted to respect the individual that brought that forward. We heard directly from community members that it was hurtful, uh, and so we removed it. But it doesn't change the commitment. We know that there needs to be increased education throughout our healthcare system. We know that the healthcare system has historically um, been and felt unsafe for a variety of individuals throughout our province, um, 
you know, equity seeking communities. And so it is a balance and it is a learning. And so I, I don't want to discourage people from coming forward when they see a gap, um, if they have a concern. And I also appreciate the fact that it was the, probably not the most sensitive way in order to bring that forward. So it is a balance. I think, um, you know, the care in which we, we manage that, it was a learning for individuals involved. And I want to thank the person for bringing it forward. I want to acknowledge that we, you know, could have done something differently. And I want to thank the community for bringing forward their concerns. And we will continue to do, the, do what we can. We will make mistakes and we will correct when we know that there's been an issue and we'll continue to learn as a community. And that's really all I can, can offer is that deep apology for the people we hurt, a deep appreciation for the individual that brought that forward because it was important to them and they wanted that to be on our radar. And so we will continue to, uh, to work through this um, with humility and with respect to do the right thing uh, whenever we possibly can. I recognize the Honourable Member, Halifax, Citadel, Sable Island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And certainly, or Mr. Chair, certainly in no way uh, was I uh, commenting on uh, the person or the idea being brought forward in, in that context. What I was concerned about with 2,000 ideas, that there hadn't been um, a professional level of rigor that allowed departmental staff to identify that this was problematic or governmental staff. So, um, so I, I just, you know, I just feel like, you know, I, I just really want to make it clear that I was absolutely not uh, in any way um, disrespecting the person's experience who brought that forward. Um, and so in terms of departmental capacity um, around 2S LGBTQI plus issues, um, I think last year we determined that, uh, there's, that at that time there was no one in the department for whom these issues were formed part of their, their work package that they were evaluated on in terms of um, their expertise in this area. I know you have a health equity team, but my understanding is that there wasn't anybody on there specifically tasked. And I'm just wondering if I could have an update on how the department is building its own capacity around 2S LGBTQIA plus issues.
I recognize the Honourable Health Minister. So thank you to the member for the question. So we do uh, have an office um, of health equity, of course, but we also work across government. And I, my understanding is that um, the Office of Anti-Racism and Equity um, uh, is looking specifically at two SLGBTQIA plus um, uh, policy across government. And, and what I do want to point out is that um, health, the health equity team works very closely with a number of uh, individuals throughout Nova Scotia. And so we work very closely with individuals um, from the Pride community in order to inform our decisions. So um, I, I can't really speak to the lived experience or, um, you know, the particular specialty related um, um, to the 2SLGBTQIA plus community. However, I can say that relationships um, with some leaders within the community have been uh, built and we continue to consult uh, and understand. So lived experience is present uh, in the department, um, whether it's from within the department or from relationships that, that the department staff have built um, throughout the province, uh, that that uh, first voice is present uh, in the department in, reg in regard to um, issues around Pride Health, gender-affirming care, etc. I recognize the Honourable Member, Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Um, I'm wondering if the Minister could identify the groups with which she has met in the past fiscal year. I recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. Uh, so I would have to get um, some information from the department about some of the consultations that they have undergone. Um, certainly, I have not had any formal meetings in particular um, with um, any groups in the um, in the, in the province. I, I, I don't know. I'd have to check to see if I had requests. That's not to say that I don't work really hard at maintaining my own competency um, around health equity issues um, and I've been very fortunate in the past to um, attend particularly when I worked in the school board attend a number of um, educational issues so that I can be a better health care provider and representative so you know I um, there may be individuals who have come uh, into my life that I've met with and I'm not uh, you know privy to um, whether or not they're they're trans or they're um, uh, sexual orientation, etc. That's not something that I would have met with someone specifically about. I recognize the honourable member, Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Um, so one of the things that I propose is actually a standing ministerial committee, uh, advisory committee on gender affirming care, and uh, you know one of the reasons for this is um, concerns about you know for community engagement to be really. Um, valuable and to build the type of trust that you need, particularly to talk about, uh, you know, health issues, private health issues, um, having an ongoing standing body um, that uh, has a terms of reference to guide its work, um, that to whom the minister can turn to on a regular basis, um, and, and they themselves, the members of the standing committee who are accountable to their community organizations and to their communities. Um, I think is really important, and I, I, you know, with all respect, I think has been sorely lacking um, in terms of engagement with um, the the two S L G B T Q I A plus community across government, um, and you know, and I think that uh, you know when government wants to uh, think about Indigenous health, there are clear community organizations and organizations with whom the government has partnered. Um, with whom government has regular relationships and can go out and meet with. And the same is true for the African Nova Scotian community. There are clear community partners um, that uh, the minister and departmental staff would have ongoing relationships with. And as we expand our concept of health to include gender affirming care, what I would suggest is that we need to be building that capacity as well. 
So um, if we've supported it with other diverse groups, and you know, even uh, in it for the Acadian community, there's a health organization. So, um, and one valuable thing that the government could do, that the minister could do, would be to support that type of capacity building and organization within the community by establishing um, a ministerial advisory committee. Because I think at this point, um, it's been, you know, some, some of the people I love the most in this world have been on the other end of the phone, um, of random ad hoc issues and ways that they've been contacted. So, um, so I don't think it's ongoing. I don't think it's respectful. So would the minister consider establishing a, a, a permanent ongoing advisory group with whom she could build a, a relationship and would be also accountable for working hard and providing their input into government's actions. I recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. So through the consultations and the work that's been done, uh, particularly around the new gender-affirming care policy, uh, there has been work that has been started through the department uh, with some of the individuals that have worked uh, with the department. So there is no standing committee presently, but the clinical branch is looking uh, at developing a more formal avenue in order to hear concerns from community and lived experience. So that work is preliminary, but ha is well underway um, in terms of uh, relationship building, uh, understanding you know who are some of the individuals uh, and organizations that could support the work in the department and so uh, you know, that's already been started. I recognize the Honourable Member Halifax Citadel Sable Island. Um, the Minister spoke uh, you know about the importance um, to work with healthcare professionals to ensure that they have the competency and capacity to um, engage with members of the 2SLGBTQIA plus community and to offer gender affirming care in, in all of its forms. Um, and I'm wondering how is the department identifying healthcare professionals who, who have competency, who are interested in gaining competency, and is there an estimate in terms of, like I know there's training, like how a percentage of, uh, you know, different healthcare groups that have taken the training that's available. I recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. 
So in order to support um, a safe um, and appropriate and quality care environment, there have been a number of things uh, that have been undertaken. So first of all, um, in order to use the gender affirming care fee code, um, there is a declaration and there is a requirement that um, physicians would uh, take a certain a number of courses. There's work that's happening with uh, the colleges, particularly uh, the nursing college as well as physician college, to ensure that folks are getting uh, um, good information, WPATH compliant information. We've also been working um, with universities and community colleges around curriculum to make sure that there's a foundational um, entry-level understanding uh, and education, and also through employers. There is an expectation through Nova Scotia Health and IWK that there is ongoing professional education in regards to a number of health equity initiatives and um, uh, gender-affirming care, as well as creating a safe and inclusive environment for the 2SLGBQIA+ uh, community as well. So it's got to be a cross-sector. We know that it needs to start in foundational education, and we're working with uh, curriculum and universities and, and community colleges. We know employers have a responsibility, and we know the colleges have an opportunity, and through physician services. There is uh, education that needs to be taken in order for uh, physicians to use the gender affirming care uh, fee code. I recognize the Honourable Member Halifax, Citadel, Sable Island. Um, and I'm wondering if I could ask the Minister how many healthcare professionals um, are certified to use the gender affirming fee code in Nova Scotia. Um, and actually, for my own information, if the minister could explain what that fee code includes, because when I think about gender affirming care, you know, it's uh, it's a spectrum of things. Uh, it's not it's not like a straightforward pathway. So it's everything from that first conversation that someone has um, about um, you know feeling uh, gender dysphoria, um, feeling body dysphoria, um, and you know can range from physician counseling um, to you know. Uh, hormone therapy to assisting with social transition and obviously can include surgery. So I'm wondering if, if I can understand what's in that code and how many people are able to provide whatever's in that code in Nova Scotia. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. So I'll start. We're waiting for some more information from the department. So I think there's a variety of different things that are happening. I would say um, making sure that primary care providers um, um, have uh, good knowledge, that they understand the pathway to more specialist care, if required, I think is very important. Certainly, um, the um, care that's offered um, for children and youth at IWK is essential because, to the member's point, 
there is a variety of age-appropriate ways in which we intervene and support children and youth um, through a variety of reasons they access the health care system and this specifically uh, a very important um, and specialized care so I think you know we're in the early stages of it we'll look for the numbers the um, it's it's been a year um, that we've we've had these and so I would say from a primary care provider I think part of the things that we'll be looking at in the future is making sure that specialty uh, people with specialized more specialized specialized training um, have the opportunity to support primary care physicians particularly for those primary care providers who are in rural communities so we know because of the density of the population that there is different resources available in a more urban environment and perhaps uh, in some cases it may be um, a little bit easier for some folks um, who you know can use public transit etc to access care um, whereas we do know that there are different challenges in our rural communities. So <clears throat> we can get the number about uh, how many providers. I expect that it will be low but increasing, that folks are committed to taking the training that's required in order to use the fee code. I think it's also important that we continue to build the network um, throughout the province so that primary care providers um, don't feel alone and don't, um, you know, aren't aren't going to avoid an issue that perhaps they're uncomfortable with. So it is going to be a gradual uh, improvement and increase in the level of service available. But certainly um, uh, for uh, children and youth in particular, uh, we will lean on our IWK clinicians. Uh, very um, important that they, again, the spectrum of, of seeking care, support, and, and knowledge and understanding is really important that we have specialty physicians like we do at the IWK who can discuss and talk to people in an age-appropriate way about what they're feeling and, and what they're experiencing. So um, the gender-affirming uh, fee code includes um, gender-affirming readiness assessment and post-up follow-up as two examples of what would be included in that. So again, this is a work in progress. Um, we are committed to um, working in community, making sure that we are improving services and that they are safe and accessible to all Nova Scotians. I recognize the Honourable Member Halifax Citadel Sable Island. Um, so one of the things that I've heard um, from uh, sexual health providers and uh, community organizations um, like AIDS Coalition of Nova Scotia, as well as from individuals, is concerns about the access to PrEP in Nova Scotia. So pre-exposure prophylaxis treatment for HIV and AIDS, or PrEP, is of course of enormous use to all of us, but um, particularly in the 2S LGBTQI plus communities, to prevent virus transmission and to treat infection to a safe and manageable level. It's currently listed as an exception status drug in the MSI formulary, so it requires extensive physician notes. So it can be difficult to obtain if someone doesn't have access to a regular family physician, which of course we know many Nova Scotians don't, or, or primary care provider. Um, as well, uh, similarly, uh, I, I believe it, it could be covered under PharmaCare, but again, because of that exception status, um, people, individuals, and I know they've been in contact with you, Minister, um, and have, have written you letters, have experienced um, the inability to actually access PrEP because they just don't have access to a regular primary care provider and thus cannot meet the requirement. So I'm wondering if the Minister will consider um, how to increase access to PrEP in Nova Scotia in the coming year. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. So thank the member for the question. So uh, the member's correct. Um, in 2018, PrEP medications were added as a benefit under Provincial Pharmacare Program. Um, and and uh, the other thing I'll just let the member know, in partnership with Nova Scotia Health starting in February of 2023, um, Nova Scotia College of Pharmacists uh, have, let, have been leading a first-of-its-kind project in Canada consisting of 10 pharmacy sites uh, prescribing PrEP and monitoring patients alongside the Halifax Sexual Health Centre. So um, the results at the end of this study, which you know, will probably be very soon, um, at the end of the study the team um, will then share those and we'll better understand uh, what the next step is based on, on that, so on that uh, pilot test and try. So we are looking at how to uh, improve access. Um, additionally, there is um, uh, free HIV testing um, available through primary care providers, including family physicians and nurse practitioners walk in as well. Um, there is some access through Virtual Care Nova Scotia. I recognize the honor. Oh, 
The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm just going to um, uh, switch over to ask some questions about midwives now, midwifery care. So the expansion of midwives in Nova Scotia has been stalled for years. Nova Scotia Midwifery Association is currently running a public engagement campaign right now, which uh, is of, uh, as of Monday, had seen about a thousand signatures from Nova Scotians asking the government to expand care. Considering this is a priority to so many Nova Scotians, as well as a priority area for the Perinatal Newborn Care Council of Nova Scotia, why has uh, midwifery care not been targeted for expansion this year? Recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. Uh, so uh, there is um, a, a bit of a, a midwife program. There are 16 midwives registered in Nova Scotia, and they deliver approximately 5% of births. Um, they're attended um, by midwives, um, and that's lower than the national average, which is about 13%. So currently, um, there are uh, four midwives uh, between Fisherman's Memorial Hospital and Bridgewater with a vacancy. In Anaganish at St. Martha's, there's four FTEs with one vacancy, and IWK uh, has eight FTE uh, positions, uh, with two new midwives recently hired in January of 2024. So one of the challenges that we have had repeatedly is actually filling the vacancies. Um, so this is a small workforce, as uh, the member opposite will know. There is some work happening uh, through the Atlantic provinces to understand uh, the impact of a potential midwifery program, and that's being led by Newfoundland. So uh, we're also working, um, you know, with midwives throughout the province, and also uh, working with Dudgeagamic to understand what could the model look like um, in First Nation communities with midwives. So it's not that there is nothing happening. I would also say that um, midwifery care, um, you know, because. It isn't widely used in Canada. Um, we need to make sure that midwives are nestled in a very um, uh, in a continuum of a team. So while many many births are natural, there they also ha can be quite high risk, and and things can happen very quickly. So we see particularly in our rural regional hospitals where we perhaps have. Um, primary care physicians who are doing some obstetrics. We also have um, our obstetrics and gynecology physicians who are working throughout the province. So it's really important that mom and baby are the centre, that um, we make sure that there is a continuum of healthcare providers who, if and when um, complications are, uh, occur, that the midwives are well supported, that there is backup for them. So it has been a, a program that's been, um, you know, difficult to expand. We have a variety of providers in the system who are who are providing prenatal as well as obstetrical care, and the midwives are part of that. But it has been very, very difficult to stabilize the workforce and fill the positions that we have, let alone expand. I recognize the honourable member Dartmouth North. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I just want to dig into this a little bit because this is a conversation we've had several times now, the minister and, and me and, and at estimates, and I just want to challenge what I'm hearing. So the program is difficult to expand because it's small. And I know that doesn't make any sense, but if someone is coming from another province to work as a midwife, they're not, it's not going to be attractive to go to a rural area where there's only two other midwives practicing because they're going to be on call every third night, for instance. So, or, or whatever, I don't know exactly how those things work, but you know what I mean. So, does it not make more sense to actually invest in the program? The Midwife Association is asking for a $5 million uh, uh, expansion 
and that would double the amount of midwives, taking us from 16 to 32. It would make a huge difference. And I guarantee you, well, I can't guarantee anything, Mr. Chair, actually, except for death and taxes. But um, uh, I would be willing to bet a lot of money <laughs> uh, that uh, a doubling of the midwife program would actually make a huge difference. Now, the other thing that I want to sort of sort of pick apart for a second is the minister's assertion that, and I, it's not an assertion, it's true, uh, what she's saying about, um, you know, that midwives need to have, you know, a backup, there needs to be a, a nest for them, there needs to be a, a continuum of care for people who are having babies. But if we go with that logic, then that suggests that we don't have that now for people who are having babies. And people are having babies every day in Nova Scotia, some very few, 5% with midwife care, uh, but 95% without midwife care. And so, though, presumably, those babies are being born and cared for, and uh, you know, we have very good maternal outcomes and, and birth outcomes in Nova Scotia, so presumably those services exist. What midwives would do would take the pressure off our system, because even if uh, I don't know what's happening over there, but it's distracting. Uh, even if, um, even if uh, every birth with a midwife needed backup care, we have that care in place. Because if we didn't have midwives, it would be happening that way anyway. So I, I just want to challenge the minister's assertion, and I want to ask, what is really like? I don't know. I, I don't know how else to ask this, but. Is there another reason why Nova Scotia is not prioritizing midwife, midwifery care? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. So what I would, would say is that we have a very well-established um, clinical pathway for um, maternal child care in the province. It, uh, has, it involves primary care providers, nurse practitioners and physicians. There are maternal child nurses in our regional sites where they deliver babies and certainly specialty care uh, throughout the IWK, generalist nurses as well as specialty nurses. Uh, so midwives are a part of the team. They are not available everywhere as the, uh, the member has said. Um, these uh, programs have existed for a long period of time and even when there are permanent full-time positions, they are very difficult to recruit to. So what we need to do always is ensure mom and baby safety. The, the current model that we have now is heavily dependent on primary care providers. We have specialized um, nurses who work in our obstetrical and gynecological units across this province, whether that be at a regional site or whether that be at IWK, and we have obstetrics and gynecology. So the system that we have does not mirror systems in other parts of the world, which is predominantly staffed by midwives. We do not have the capacity to um, train a whole bunch of midwives, and, and certainly the work that happens in our own nursing programs enables registered nurses to become more specialized in terms of obstetrical care. We are grateful for the midwives that we have. We appreciate that there are individuals who would prefer that. And at this time, there's no current uh, movement to expand the program. We need to stabilize the, uh, the complement we have. And even when there are uh, permanent full-time positions, it's very, very difficult to recruit to those. So I appreciate the members' comments. I think the midwives are an important part of the team um, and, and the continuum of obstetrical care, but there is no movement to expand that program. I recognize the Honourable Member, Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, I'll just say, yes, these pro these positions are very difficult to recruit to because they are they are positions with tiny little teams in rural Nova Scotia, and it's very difficult to do midwifery when you don't have a ton of support from other midwives. If we doubled with a five million dollar investment. We could double the amount of midwives here. I, I, I implore the minister to just try it and see how, see how it would be. I know lots of midwives who have expressed interest in working in Nova Scotia, but it's very difficult to come when, those, when the positions that are being advertised are not permanent or when they're, uh, you know, or when they're with small practices. Um, so let's just try it. I mean, the, 
we are trying to uh, make uh, take the pressure off primary care. Midwife, midwifery is a way to do that. We are trying to make sure that people have a continuum of care in a family practice or in a in a in a family health home. Midwif midwives should be part of those models. It's 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 befuddling to me that we're not. Uh, planning on an expansion of the midwife program. I'm deeply disappointed in it. The current model of midwifery care uh, is, um, is, would be, well, is the, the model we have now is expensive uh, because we do need all of the backup care. Um, but the model of care of, of midwives does not require a parallel increase in nurses and specialists in order for them to practice. In fact, it alleviates the demand on those and leaves time for the OBs to work on more complex cases. I uh, am a perfect example of this, Mr. Chair. As I've said before, now I was labeled a geriatric mother, of course, because I was 38 when I had my first baby. Whew. And, uh, and my family doctor at the time was nearing retirement and didn't want to deliver babies anymore and so I was sent to the perinatal center where I got excellent care but it was really expensive for the people of Nova Scotia for me and my pretty healthy pregnancies like me basically totally healthy pregnancies which I am very grateful for just for the record um, but I wonder if more midwives midwives being hired could help with the existing demand the province has strategies to recruit and retain primary care providers, doctors, and nurse practitioners, but midwives are the third, t are third type of primary care provider that we're also practicing in Nova Scotia. Why are there not resources devoted to a similar strategy of attraction and retention for midwives? I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, and I thank the member for the question. So um, we will check. Um, they're hired by NSH, so um, you know I'm, I'm, I'll have to look at, at um, whether or not there are, as an example, hired to fill positions in rural communities, whether there's sign-on bonuses, etc., as other nurses are are available, are available to other nurses. Um, so uh, you know I also can't. I'll have to just check and see what what uh, how those individuals keep up their competencies, what type of investment. I don't think it's fair to say that there's no investment at all until we really find out about professional development, until we find out about some of the um, supports that are in place um, with for midwives uh, from the employer and also in terms of the support that they get from um, their uh, primary care and obstetrical colleagues. And as I've mentioned before, we are working with Dudge Gamek uh, with, with the midwives um, to understand if there's a, a new or different or expanded role where they can support First Nation communities. But currently in this budget, there is no, uh, there is no um, uh, expansion of midwifery services. I recognize the Honourable Member, Dartmouth North. Thank you. Um, with the short amount of time I have left tonight, I want to ask about um, some drug policies. I just have to find the question, sorry. Um, I wanted to ask first about the, um, oh yeah, the um, COVID drug, uh, Paxlovid. Is that how you say it, Paxlovid? Paxlovid. Uh, some of our constituencies, constituents have, had noted, have noted a great deal of difficulty in obtaining Paxlovid prescription when it's needed. Does the department or Nova Scotia Health have set criteria for Paxlovid to be prescribed? Do these criteria uh, vary based on patient demographic and how does it compare to criteria and access in other provinces?
I recognize the Honourable Health Minister. So through the infectious disease, um, there is a, a table of individuals who support we uh, individuals who are accessing uh, Paxlovid. So there's a couple of ways in which you can access it. Um, there is a, f um, a report and support form that's available online, but there's also a 1-800 number that um, you can use to call and report. And of course, the sooner you have access to that medication, uh, the better it is. And so those uh, ID um, physicians that work um, across the province uh, then will work with local pharmacies in order to support uh, access to uh, Paxlovid. I recognize the Honourable Member Dartmouth North. Um, thanks. Um, so, but how does that how does that uh, compare with other provinces? Um, you may have answered that. The minister may have answered that, but I didn't catch that part. I recognize the Honourable Minister Health and Wellness. So there's a, a variety of different ways in which other provinces administer that medication. Um, through the expert table of public health and ID, this was the model that was chosen here, but there is a variety of models across. Um, and as we move further out from the pandemic response, uh, it may be that we will change the model. I believe there are discussions underway now about changing the way in which uh, there's access. Obviously, if you're in hospital, there is an IV, there is an IV version that is readily available for those with severe illness, um, but we will be looking at more of a community-based model moving forward. I recognize the Honourable Member Dartmouth North. Just while I'm on COVID response, um, I saw the announcement yesterday that the uh, booster vaccine is available now for, you know, the sort of most, um, uh, uh, whatever the word is, well, the, the most vulnerable people, uh, you know, the people over a certain age, people with, um, uh, yeah, anyway, all those groups. When is, uh, when will, will, we, will we be looking at a, a booster again available for the general public uh, later on in this year and, and when can we expect that? I recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. So we continue to move away from that critical period of time when, you know, at the peak of the pandemic. And I, you know, I, I would say that we, we work, we listen very closely to public health experts. So, um, you know, we have a pan-Canadian table that is advising us in terms of how and where we provide uh, immunization. So there was a fall campaign. It coincided with um, our influenza vaccine campaign, and I expect, but don't have confirmation right now, that that will continue. Um, we are looking at obviously those uh, at highest risk, those most vulnerable individuals, having access to the vaccine on an ongoing basis. I, I think this is something that's going to continue to evolve um, as as the COVID virus becomes more and more um, ubiquitous, really, in our in our society. So um, I, I can't really tell you. I know that this is out right now. I expect that there will be a fall um, vaccination campaign again. But we we lean on the, the experts and the public health docs, like Dr. Strang, like Dr. Deeks, um, and the public health team to kind of give us the next steps. So this is the step that we're at right now. Um, we're going to provide um, high-risk individuals with another booster and then uh, following that we'll take our direction from um, from public health so I can't confirm anything right now I recognize the honorable member Dartmouth North thank you mr. chair over the past 18 months the Canadian Agency for Drugs Technology and Health has positively recommended several new biologic treatments for Crohn's and colitis including and pardon my um, pronunciation Rinvoc Omvo and Skyreasy. Does the department plan to allow coverage for these new options under MSI? <coughs> I 
Recognize the Honourable Health Minister. Uh, so I'll have more to say the next time we meet, um, but generally after Cabbeth, if it's going to be considered by provinces, there's a PCPA, which is a pan-Canadian pricing um, exercise that is undertaken. So I don't know if those drugs are in there. I will have to check to see where we are. Recognize the Honourable Member uh, Dartmouth North. Well, Mr. Chair, yes, it's Dartmouth North, and uh, I'm just going to slowly say thank you for this excellent question and answer period. I look forward to the next one. Order. That will conclude time uh, allotted for our NDP caucus. We'll move on to our Liberal caucus, and before I do that, just a gentle reminder, everybody, about uh, chatter in here and keep it down. But okay, I recognize the Honourable. I recognize the Honourable Member for Annapolis. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank the Minister and staff for being here. Uh, I've been sitting through tonight, and I think I have around 28 minutes. Kind of? Yeah. So my first question is around uh, parking revenues at Nova Scotia facilities. I'm continually asked uh, a number of questions around this, and I said I would ask the Minister to get more clarification. So. Um, I know that <clears throat> these monies are reinvested uh, in health care and used to fund equipment purchases. I know that they're to support operations, but what I really want to know is in Annapolis and Middleton, soldiers and Annapolis facility, how much of those revenues are kept uh, on site for those, uh, for those practices? Thank you. Recognize the Honourable Health Minister. Uh, so that is uh, through operations at Nova Scotia Health, so I'll have to confirm. But what I have here is that all parking fees are reinvested into the health into healthcare and are used to maintain the parking lots, fund new equipment, support operations, and support patient care. So from that note, it sounds to me that it would be kept uh, at the facility where the fees are collected. Um, but I will have to confirm that with Nova Scotia Health. Recognize the Honourable Member Annapolis. I appreciate that answer. So I would appreciate, yeah, just knowing if that, a lot of questions are, are is the money collected kept at the site that we use? And that would go a long way with residents that I'm representing. I, I'm interested in how much uh, is collected at each site, both Annapolis and at Soldiers. And if you don't, if the minister doesn't have that information, if she could follow up or the department could follow up. Recognize the Honourable Health Minister. So uh, we will have to check. We don't have the uh, the revenues uh, from that um, by site, um, but I do know that overall uh, in 22-23 um, there were 18 out of 41 hospitals that um, offer um, either uh, daily or hourly rates, and uh, the total collected was 7.3 million in the province. What I will also say um, is very important for individuals to know that um, you can also get in many of the hospitals, people should check at the business office when they go into the hospital because there's also monthly parking if you have someone that's there for extended periods of time. Um, if it is a burden for families, there are chits that are available and parking passes and business offices are very discreet. They deal with all kinds of, of delicate issues related to um, money for patients and their families. And so um, it's not a hard and fast rule. Certainly if there are individuals who require some support or some assistance, they should really um, go to the business office and talk to the individuals there um, and, and they will be able to assist them. I recognize the Honourable Member Annapolis. Thank you, and I'll certainly uh, encourage people to visit their local business office. Uh, you know, when I look at the fees that the Minister just mentioned, there's a number here where, you know, in Niels Harbour it's free, 
in Inverness it's free, in Bedeck it's free, in Windsor it's free, and I could go on and on. In Annapolis we pay $3 at least at a site. I think in Digby they pay upwards of 4 um, And I'm just wondering if the minister would consider lowering that amount or having the department lower that amount. It's, it's, uh, it's hard for people to understand why they pay 3 and so many sites are free of charge. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Health Minister. So it, I don't set the parking fees across the province or decide where they are. So there's 18 out of 41 sites that have paid parking, and it is through the operations of Nova Scotia Health. So um, you know I can't really speak as the for the operator in terms of that policy. Um, I'm sure we can certainly um, let them know that the question was asked on the floor today, but that's not something that I'm able to uh, really commit to or understand or, or tell the member any more about. It is an operational decision of Nova Scotia Health. I recognize the Honourable Member Annapolis. So I do have uh, correspondence back from leadership at Nova Scotia Health, uh, not on that particular question, but I'm wondering, you know, does the minister not have oversight on those decisions at Nova, Nova Scotia Health to make that decision? Thank you. Recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. Uh, so again, I can I can certainly uh, pass on to Nova Scotia Health that the question was asked on the floor, um, but respectfully, I can't get into the operational at that um, level. That's why we have those administrative teams in hospitals, and there are a number across the province. I appreciate that it's not a standard policy, and certainly I can give that feedback to Nova Scotia Health and the executive leadership team. Um, but. You know, respectfully, for me to get into the minutia of all of those operational decisions, I wouldn't. I would really never be able to get anything accomplished. Although I do appreciate that it's a hardship, and I do for some, and I do think that there is an opportunity for people to, to uh, you know, work around it in their community at their local hospital with with the business office. I recognize the honourable member Annapolis. Thank you to the minister. Um, just switching topics, uh, housing for healthcare workers is certainly a challenge. It's a gap throughout Annapolis. It's a gap throughout the province, I imagine. But uh, you know, I know there's certain projects being looked at, or maybe they're already underway for housing for healthcare workers. Are there any plans underway in uh, Annapolis, either through Soldiers or Annapolis, uh, or even Digby? for looking at housing funding, anything in this budget for funding for housing for health care workers. Thank you.
I recognize the Honourable Health Minister. So uh, to the member's point, we are seeing housing and actually childcare as two of the biggest uh, challenges that many communities are facing. So in 2023, we did commit $20 million uh, to the Housing Trust of Nova Scotia. Um, to um, look at modular housing and another, um, uncover other housing solutions for healthcare workers. So uh, there has been some work uh, in the Western Zone, uh, in Lunenburg, um, also in Bridgewater as well. Um, there's also been some work that's happened um, in Guysborough County. Um, uh, and also there's been some investment um, working with um, um, community-based organizations. We need to work with municipalities. There's the um, uh, the Mid Valley Region Physician Recruitment Retention Committee, and also the Lawrence Town Village Commission have also received funding, and and so those would have been on a grant application based on what they what they feel they need to enable them to look at some of the solutions locally. And I know that uh, those. Uh, uh, this year's round of funding will also be coming out. So it really is, uh, we want to enable, but we do need local solutions. So I know that uh, as an example in my area, I, I know folks are looking at uh, surplus properties, what is the opportunity for, for additional housing units, working with developers as well um, to create spaces, especially for locums. Um, you know, um, when I visited Digby as an example, I met a person who basically just turned, I, I think he took all of his furniture and, and furnished an apartment. And so working with the foundation so that when those individuals aren't there to pay rent, the rent is covered. So there's a designated space. Yarmouth, I know, have um, Yarmouth uh, Foundation has built uh, housing as well. So um, we want to enable and we want to support. So if there are some solutions locally where we want to hear about them, uh, and certainly I, I can't speak uh, directly for the Minister of Housing and Municipal Affairs, but really those local local solutions, working with the um, Nova Scotia Health uh, municipalities, recruitment, all of that stuff, um, and ourselves to try and find solutions. Um, it may be a family home, it may be a single apartment. So it just really depends on who we are, who is re who has the barrier that we're trying to address. I recognize the Honourable Member Annapolis. So, you know, I'm always looking for ways to support our health care workers. Uh, I recognize those two groups the minister mentioned. Um, I have taken steps to reach out to leadership in the zone about housing. This is, you know, months ago. And there was an indication that um, there was, you know, conceptual support to proceed in turning a, a building on soldiers' property into housing for health care workers. But, I haven't heard anything since, and I'm not sure if anyone uh, here tonight can can speak on that, but there is a, a building that's been identified. The community has come to meet my office, dozens of people asking what's going on with that building. Uh, I elevated it to leadership, and again, uh, back in the fall, was told that uh, there's support for the idea for that housing, but just would like to have some kind of update on that, if I could. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Health Minister. So thank you. Um, I think that we would have to uh, reach out to Nova Scotia Health, but also to um, the Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing. That would be a joint venture between them and Municipal Affairs so I, and Housing. So I don't have an update for you, but certainly we can look into that to see if there's something that we can find. I recognize the Honourable Member for Annapolis. Appreciate that from the minister, and uh, yeah, excited if there is more housing options for healthcare workers in my riding. Um, just to switch over to uh, paramedics, certainly have shown support here in the house and locally for uh, the paramedic schools in Yarmouth and I believe Picto. Um, what I'm interested in is beyond the pay raise for paramedics, what kind of retention efforts? Uh, is the department taking with EMCI to retain the paramedics that we have on the ground now? <coughs> Pardon me.
I recognize the Honourable Minister, Health and Wellness. So thank you to the member for the, the question. Um, I fully expect that I'll be back tomorrow, so I'm not going to rush through this uh, answer because there's lots to say. Yeah. So I, I will say that I'm really pleased with the new collective agreement that we've um, settled with paramedics. Um, so there was an eight and a half cost of living increase with 16 and a half percent classification adjustment for paramedics uh, to signal to them. I think it was very, very important. There's a retention allowance of up to $5,000 per year of the contract for paramedics employed in a permanent or a term position. There was improved extended benefits, including enhanced mental health coverage of $2,500 and increased um, things like orthotic and hearing aid coverage for them. Resources to support the clinical transport operators to return to school uh, and become trained as a primary care paramedic if they choose, and certainly that's an entry-level position. So, really important to in that workforce to have a ladder. And uh, you know, of course, now we have the emergency medical responders whose first three months will mirror the first three months of paramedicine. So, it's an opportunity there as well. Um, salary increases in recognition of the training required uh, for clinical transport operators and aligning the classifications for various roles in the, in the system. Um, I will say as well, there's a lot of work that happens in the Western Zone, in Yarmouth, in fact, around fleet, um, the ambulances themselves at TriStar, and any changes are really built on feedback from uh, our paramedics throughout the province to make sure that they have the type of truck and vehicle that they need, whether that be for emergency transfers or, or transportation. Um, also looking at, you know, different roles for paramedics. So um, it's important that, you know, over a career, there's an opportunity for some novelty. So the single paramedic units um, also um, prior to the fixed wing um, purchase and implementation, primary care paramedics um, didn't have as many options. So actually primary care paramedics can work on the fixed wing if they are in, um, you know, Western Zone or, or uh, Cape Breton, which I think is quite novel as well, that certainly was exciting. And always looking at ways in which we can, you know, give them support to try and do new things is what I would say. Um, also looking at evolving the role around extended care paramedics and community paramedics to the point about giving different work environments. So supporting long-term care facilities in the province and what's the opportunity to do that. And it gives folks a break. Right, 30% of those calls we know are really high risk, 70% are lower acuity calls. But still, I mean, I don't think any of us fully understand, except for paramedics uh, and their colleagues and their families about, you know, some of the experiences they have when they're on the truck. And sometimes it's the actual experience and sometimes it's the anticipation of what could happen. And so by providing novel um, opportunities for people to work in a different environment and get a bit of a break mentally and physically, I think is a really important retention tool that you will see us evolve over time based on the feedback. I also think the support that we now offer in the medical comm centre is really important. Um, so making sure that paramedics in the field are well supported by a multidisciplinary team, which includes an emergency room physician, registered nurse, and two um, senior and skilled um, uh, paramedics uh, to support them in the field and allows them to divert and use their scope uh, as well as respond to, to emergencies. We've invested in equipment to prevent injury um, you know, and really looking at um, the health and safety of paramedics is a really difficult job. And so there is um, an introduction of power loaders and power stretchers, lighter medical kits, um, devices, um, stairs, like getting somebody from downstairs always amazed me. So really looking at how we get better equipment in order to support paramedics um, and ergonomic adjustments um, to, to, the, um, to the trucks. Um, short-term disability premiums um, have been covered now. So there's just been a variety of ways in which um, we're supporting paramedics and we want people to come into this profession. It is an amazing um, profession. I have worked with incredible colleagues um, over my career. So um, there is a um, course in Yarmouth, Dartmouth, Stellarton and Sydney and uh, there is an 11,500 tuition bursary available to individuals going into that with a three-year return to service. Um, and then also just a very successful recently um, trip to recruit in Australia, uh, really encouraged by the, um, the feedback that uh, EMCI, EHS and, and Office of Healthcare Professional Recruitments have gotten. I talked about the Good Sam 
So, uh, and then also working with medical first responders, building that relationship. We know we've relied heavily on MFRs as a system, as an EHS system and as a, as a department uh, over the last number of months and things were really disrupted during COVID. So really leaning in and working to build that relationship and that collaboration between um, the first responders and community, the MFRs and paramedics. I recognize the Honourable Member Annapolis. Thank you to the Minister for that detail. I appreciate it. Easier for me to promote that, that as well and be positive about it when I have more information. The Minister mentioned, um, I think a couple hours ago, the plane or the fixed wing uh, out of Yarmouth. And I think the quote was 5,000 hours saved in ground transport. Could I find out how many hours was saved on ground units in Annapolis? So between the catchment of and if not tonight, could I have some kind of uh, information on that, please? Recognize the Honourable <laughs> Health Minister. Yeah, so I will check for the member, but I, I think the short answer is probably not. And the reason being, it's a system, it's, a, it's not a static system. So, you know, when you hear that people are responding, that, that you maybe have people who live in a certain area of the province, it actually is very difficult for, I think, I mean, I will check, but because the system is so fluid and it's always responding to what's in front of it, that there isn't really a way that we can say, this is from here and this is from here, because that model of a base filled with trucks with people that we knew from our community is not really the system we have anymore, right? So it, our uh, EHS system is a provincial resource. It flexes, it moves based on patient care, on emergencies, on transfers, um, on significant events uh, throughout the province, and it is a very dynamic system, so always in real time. So just because you might get a crew um, down in, in Lawrencetown that's originally from Anaganish, that that could that truck and crew could be redeployed from a transfer to Halifax, but there is a recognition that Western Zone needs coverage. So, I, I you know I know that folks are watching, but I do believe that it will be very difficult for us to isolate it. It's really the whole ground ambulance system, and to put 5,000 hours, 5,200 actually, back into the system means that we have paramedics on the ground who are responding in real time, um, you know, full shift compliments, um, you know, and also in addition to the paramedics themselves, the fatigue of driving that amount is significant, uh, the wear and tear on the trucks, but also the patients. I don't know if anyone has ever been transported in the back of an ambulance and we've come a long way over the years, but it is, it can be very, very uncomfortable for patients. So the support that patients get when they have a shorter flight in terms of skin integrity and pain control and Comfort, um, is it, it is absolutely um, superior to some of the ground uh, to, to the ground transport. I recognize the honourable member from Annapolis. I, I imagine and can appreciate that's a difficult thing to answer, but would appreciate any feedback. Maybe I'll ask the same question a different way, not to be tricky, but just uh, you know, in September, Middleton M140, that's a truck, was fully staffed 50% of the time. Uh, Middleton M142 staff 53% of the time, Bridgetown M144 16% of the time, M146 fully staffed 18% of the time. I wonder, that's September 2023, could I have the updated numbers since that time of what, uh, how fully staffed and the percentages of those trucks at those bases? So Annapolis, Bridgetown, Middleton. Thank you. May I recognize the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness? Um, so what I, I will check that as well, but to my earlier point, um, there will be time that those trucks are off the road, those particular truck numbers, because they're in service. There will be times that they are redeployed to a different area. So when we look at the system status plan, we actually look at the, at the number of trucks. We do know that there is some allocation, um, you know, based kind of on provincial coverage, but we can put 
what, what they can tell, what the regulator and what the company can tell is when people get pulled in close to the city or pulled out far to some of those more extensive sites. So the truck numbers themselves, the, it, it probably is not helpful. What we can look, what we do look at and we regularly look at is the number of trucks we're down in a system at any given time and then what the mitigation strategy is for that. So there are times it's really busy in a certain place, maybe the Valley Regional as an example. And so the system is always moving towards that. So if we know if there's with C3 and with the work that's happening around integrate, integration with Nova Scotia Health and EHS, if we know we have a lot of trucks at Valley Regional, there will be and a response within the hospital to clear the trucks, to help with access and flow, and there will also be a response from the EHS system around coverage. If there's a big event, system the system moves towards the big event. So it, I. I know it doesn't, it, it actually is the system we want. It's dynamic, it moves, it always has flexibility in it. There are times that we are down paramedics. We've seen some really good, in, you know, with the classes. I think they hired 39 people or 35 people in, in uh, January. So it really is about bringing the, the number of paramedics in the system up so that the, the system itself is staffed as opposed to maybe a particular area. Because if you're, if, if your ambulances, Western Zone ambulances are deployed to do transfers to Halifax, you want the ability for other trucks to go and cover the area. So I don't think it will be as straightforward and as simple as just this is the truck and this is the team. I recognize the Honourable Member, Annapolis. I'm trying to be the MLA of positivity around health care and uh, if you look at, you know, I've spent hours and hours here each year on health and asked to spend as much time on health. And uh, I'm just looking for ways to sell the positive stories at home. So uh, fixed wing aircraft, 5,000 hours pulled out. Carmen, what does that mean for us in Annapolis? I don't know, let me find out. So I hope the minister can appreciate that. Um, <coughs> with uh, the minister just, I've only got two minutes, but mentioned the graduates in Yarmouth uh, could she comment on the budgets for maybe both, maybe the Yarmouth program, paramedic program, uh, for this year, and maybe how many will graduate or have graduated in the past year? Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Health Minister. So, um, before I do that, I just want to, I want to tell the member opposite that there are good news stories in his area. I just want him to know that. So, um, like the Annapolis Urgent Treatment Centre, it is open three days a week in providing care. There's a new community pharmacy clinic in Lawrencetown um, that's been launched. We are looking at, you know, in Soldiers Memorial, um, doing um, cataracts in that surgery. Um, you know, there's a number of things that have happened. We have an expanded practical nurse program um, at the Annapolis Valley campus in Middleton. Um, you know, there is um, community wellness um, initiatives that have happened. The Middleton Recovery Support Centre provides in-person assessment. Rural Aging uh, is at NSCC Annapolis Valley in Middleton. Um, there's something here as well about... Um, Oh, the primary care clinic was strengthened. Uh, Annapolis Valley King's primary care was strengthened in 2023. Um, so I just, you know, oh, and in 2022, a medical day services um, program was relocated from the Valley Regional to Soldiers Memorial, which increased day surgery capacity um, for endoscopies and cystoscopies. So I just want to encourage the member that there is investments in the community. We're looking at Western Zone. You have a lot of hospitals in a small, you know, reasonably close proximity. And how do we create create centers of excellence in that area so that we can divert lower acuity um, cases or services to different areas in order to, to build up services overall. So I just, I want you to know that there are good things happening, that we are looking at soldiers, we are looking at Annapolis, we're looking at, you know, where the resources are and how we, we find the things that raise all boats. So I just want to encourage him and I can give him that list if he's interested. Sorry, I, I couldn't leave it. I recognize the Honourable Member Annapolis. I think I'm out of time. No, I'm certainly aware of most of those initiatives at home uh, have promoted a lot of those with Lawrencetown and Annapolis and beyond. So thankful for the minister uh, for giving that overview and I'll save some time for tomorrow. So thank you. Yeah. Order. The time allotted for consideration of supply today, unfortunately, has elapsed. Uh, I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that the committee do now rise and report progress and beg leave to set again on a future date. Okay, the motion carries. We'll now rise and report business to the House. Order. The House will uh, resume. Uh, the, the Chair of the Committee of the Whole House on Supply reports. So recognize the Clerk. That the Committee of the Whole House on Supply has met and made progress and begs leave to sit again. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I ask that you please call Government Bills for second reading. Government bills for second reading. Would you please call Bill Number 419, the Financial Measures 2024 Act? Bill 419, the Financial Measures 2024 Act. To recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> that, was, that was exuberant. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I move that Bill 419 be now read a second time. Our government is making important investments in health care, housing, and affordability. That includes tax relief for Nova Scotians. This bill is a key part of our government's budget for 2024-25.
indexing personal income tax brackets and non-refundable tax credits, which are the basic personal amount, spousal amount, the dependent amount, the infirm dependent amount, and the age amount. In the fall of each year, the annual adjustment will be determined based on the Provincial Consumer Price Index from Statistics Canada. The new rate will be communicated to Nova Scotians and then CRA and employers will adjust the tax they deduct from the source. As of January 1st, 2025, a person's paycheck will reflect the indexation of brackets and credits. Less money coming off paychecks and more money landing in people's pockets. Madam Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotians have been asking for tax relief and these changes mean they will pay less income tax every year this is in place. It is going to grow every year, this tax relief. We expect it to grow to an estimated $160 million per year by 2028. <clears throat> this bill advances priorities like housing. We're extending the Executive Panel on Housing in the Halifax Regional Municipality for two additional years and amending the Municipal Government Act to support housing development across the province by cutting red tape and streamlining the process of getting new housing approved. These amendments include enabling electronic submission of planning documents, allowing development officers to approve non-substantive development agreement amendments and municipal councils to provisionally approve a development agreement, and permitting councils to sell or lease property below market value for any purpose deemed beneficial by council, such as housing development. This bill will also create a new pathway for villages to request a name change and establish a framework for municipalities to create codes of conduct for mayors, wardens and councillors where none currently exists. Mr. Speaker, this bill includes amendments to other legislation that have budget, financial or governance implications. I'd like to go over those for the benefit of members. Nova Scotians rely on professional accountants to help them manage important financial ma matters. They want to know they're getting qualified professional services under a regulated system so that they're protected. We're updating rules for chartered professional accountants working in Nova Scotia. Amendments to the Chartered Professional Accountants Act will ensure only chartered professional accountants can perform compilation engagements and require out-of-province accountants who wish to provide accounting services in Nova Scotia remotely to be registered with the provincial regulating body. This provides greater protection for Nova Scotians using these services. Mr. Speaker, this bill adds protections for Nova Scotians using credit products like credit cards and loans with variable interest rates. Changes to the Consumer Protection Act will mean lenders like credit unions, retail companies, financial companies and vehicle dealerships can offer lower interest rates immediately instead of waiting 30 days. This allows them to be more responsive when the prime interest rate changes, similar to larger financial institutions, which are regulated by the federal government, and requiring them to disclose annual interest rate to consumers. These changes also align Nova Scotia with information disclosure requirements found under similar consumer protection legislation in Canada. Mr. Speaker, our fishery is important to our economy and illegal actors should face serious consequences. We've heard concerns about illegal activity and we're taking action. This bill increases maximum fines to deter illegal activity in the fishery sector to $1 million from $100,000 for the first offense and up to $2 million for subsequent offenses. Increasing the potential maximum fine amounts is a deterrent to illegal activity. Mr. Speaker, authority for gaming control falls solely under the Minister of Finance and Treasury Board. Updates are required to keep our legislation current with today's structure and operations. The Gaming Control Act will be updated to remove outdated references. Gypsum is a material, is a mineral found in many items we use every day. 
Following a review, the current approach to calculating provincial royalties for gypsum mining were deemed excessively detailed. <laughs> Amendments to the Gypsum Mining Income Tax Act will move the royalty calculation for mineral and non-minerals to a simpler calculation and capture those changes under regulations. We're making this change so that royalty amounts for gypsum can be more responsive to market trends. I am pleased to support the Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables, who is consulting with stakeholders to develop a new royalty regime for this sector. We live in an age when citizens expect fast, easy ways to do things. This bill will modernize the toll system on the McDonald and McKay bridges. Amendments will allow Halifax Harbour bridges to go entirely electronic. This will lead to removal of toll plazas and allow for a cashless system. This is a faster and easier way to deliver the service to Nova Scotians. Options will remain for Nova Scotians without methods to pay electronically. Highway 104 is an important corridor in and out of the province. This highway must be maintained to a high standard for personal and commercial travel. This bill broadens the mandate of the Highway 104 Western Alignment Corporation to allow for streamlined management of highway infrastructure and to include other 100 series highways across the province to allow excess toll revenue collected by the corporation to be allocated to other highways if it is not spent on the Highway 104. Other amendments to the Income Tax Act extend the life of business tax credits that help drive the economy by five more years. These include the Innovation Equity Tax Credit, Digital Animation Tax Credit, Digital Media Tax Credit, and the Venture Capital Tax Credit. Today's bill also gives the Minister the ability to add occupations to our more Opportunity to Skilled Trades tax rebate program for young workers in in-demand occupations. Invest Nova Scotia works to drive economic growth, attract new investment and expand our economy. We want businesses to invest and grow here and we want to make it easier than ever for them to work with government. Invest Nova Scotia is delivering on that mandate. The Invest Nova Scotia Act is being amended to update definitions and remove references to outdated regulations. Peggy's Cove is one of Nova Scotia's iconic attractions. The province and residents representing the area work together to preserve the unique scenic beauty, character and atmosphere of the area for the enjoyment of both residents and visitors. This bill updates the Peggy's Cove Commission Act to ensure the Commission can carry on its business if there is a vacant position. This will ensure continuity in the work to preserve the unique beauty, character and atmosphere of Peggy's Cove for residents and visitors. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, Every Nova Scotian wants peace of mind in their retirement years. And pension plans are a reliable source of income for many. Under some circumstances, it may be possible to withdraw or transfer pension funds instead of being transferred to a locked-in account. Amendments to the Pension Benefits Act update the pension fund unlocking rules to apply to people with shortened life expectancy or non-residents of Canada. Our government's steadfast priority to fix health care means looking for new ways to tackle old problems. <clears throat> Giving people access to their own electronic health records in their control, right in the palm of their hands. This will help Nova Scotians make in informed decisions about their own health and navigate the health care system faster and more conveniently. Amendments to the Personal Health Information Act will require health providers to provide records so that Nova Scotians can continue can view their health information through the Your Health NS app. We always keep the protection of Nova Scotians personal and private health information as a top priority in any circumstance. This bill creates two pieces of legislation. Our government is introducing protections for firefighters in our communities. The new Professional Firefighters Volunteer Act will protect them when duty calls. It will prohibit organizations from refusing to employ volunteer firefighters and from penalizing or otherwise disciplining a professional firefighter because they work as a volunteer firefighter. Last year's wildfires taught us that we need to be able to use all the resources at our disposal to fight forest fires. 
We are also laying the foundation for Nova Scotia's first office for children and youth. We need to ensure the rights and well-being of children and youth are protected. This office will help to do just that. The creation of this office was the commitment of the Honourable Premier and will be one of the legacies of the restorative inquiry into the Nova Scotia Home for Coloured Children. Madam Speak Matt, Mr. Speaker, I look forward to debate on the provisions in this bill and I, uh, yeah, actually I, I look forward to debate. I'm sorry I got caught up in my lines here. So with that, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I look forward to the comments of the members opposite and uh, there are a lot of items in this bill and uh, we look forward to hearing people's thoughts on them. I recognize the Honourable Member, King South. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I'm pleased to rise on uh, Bill 419, the Financial Measures Act, second reading. And uh, I want to uh, begin by making a few comments uh, with respect to this bill being an omnibus bill. I think in my 11 years here, I've never seen such a piece of legislation cross the floor of this House. It actually touches on 15 pieces of legislation and creates two new ones. It's only the third piece of legislation that this government has introduced in this House. And although the Premier has promised more in, uh, legislation during this sitting, which is supposed to go on, according to him, for another two or three months, uh, in the last week we've not seen any new legislation. So it appears uh, uh, there's a clear intention uh, to limit debate in this House by creating an omnibus bill for the first time in recent memory. It's 30, 39 pages long. I stand today here as the finance critic, uh, but most of this legislation doesn't involve finance. Uh, and I uh, am actually, or maybe I'm hoping that the ministers responsible for parts of this act uh, will get up and to speak to their elements of this act. Uh, I have a count now of probably eight departments, eight ministers responsible for elements of this act, and uh, I think Nova Scotians deserve to hear from the Minister of Fisheries, who uh, was very proud of the clause in this act uh, uh, just tabled or uh, presented here today for second reading. So why should Nova Scotians be concerned about an omnibus bill? Sounds, most Nova Scotians wouldn't understand that uh, phrase, an omnibus bill, but I think they get the idea here is that government is putting 15 pieces of legislation in one bill and creating two new, new ones. Practice in this legislature has been when you bring in new legislation, the minister gets up, introduces their new piece of legislation, and we debate that in the House. In my time here, governments bring in and pass, this legislature would pass 17, 25 pieces of legislation. We would go through all the steps, we would go through law amendments, and we would carefully examine each one of those pieces of legislation on behalf of Nova Scotians. Now today here, this government clearly has an ulterior motive. There is no need to create an omnibus bill. And I looked to do a little bit of research on omnibus bills and the pros and cons. Well, most of the pros that were listed were in the context of the U.S. government. The pros of omnibus bills are a sign uh, where parties from opposite sides of the House in the U.S. can find some sort of compromise to slip into an omnibus bill, something for my riding from the Democratic minority to get a bill through uh, when, the, when the Republicans have, uh, have control. So it's used to, in, in the U.S., to create compromise. 
That's clearly not what is happening here. We know we have a majority government. The Canadian parliamentary system is quite different than the U.S. So it's the advantages of creating compromise are not part of what's happening here. So why is this happening? Nova Scotians why are ask, need to ask why is this happening? Clearly, this government has shown a track record, and this reinforces it, that they want to be in and out of this House as quickly as possible. I think the intentions of this government was to finish this week. Three pieces of legislation, 10 days of estimates, drop the budget. Order. Just, um, just remind the honourable member that we're we're, we're speaking to the to, to the bill. Yeah. Okay. Uh Apologies to the honourable member. Um, it was the, the word impute, insinuating the, the government. I, I, I would ask if you would retract that word and then you can continue on. Okay. I recognize the honourable member, King South. The government. Oh, oh, the mic is on. I, I retract that, that, that wording. Thank you. Um, so the government has a track record of very short, very short sittings. They seem to be getting shorter and shorter. And this bill, this use of an omnibus bill, reinforces the desire that this government does not want to be in the People's House debating legislation. Instead of having, let's say, with 17 pieces of legislation in here and the two that have been passed, there would have been about 19 pieces of legislation that would move through this House in any normal sitting. This government has decided to make that three. Shortening the session eliminates question period. Short, shortening the session by using an omnibus bill limits questions to the Premier. So, should Nova Scotians be concerned that we in this House are not giving due consideration to the ideas of this government, the 17 ideas, by having individual pieces of legislation to debate in this House, and to have those ministers, the eight ministers that I've identified that are associated with this act, and I'm not sure that I've completely got them all because uh, the minister actually keyed me into some departments that are involved in this. The Minister of Finance, obviously, on the FMA, the Minister of Service Nova Scotia, the Minister of Transportation, the Minister of Fisheries, there's long sections of the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, the Minister of Community Services, the Minister of Natural Resources, the Minister of Economic Development, and I'm not even sure that I've got through the, the whole list. So I'm hoping during the various stages of this debate that all of those ministers will get on their feet and give their views of their piece of this legislation. I think it's reasonable for Nova Scotians to expect their minister of fisheries to talk about the fines that he is increasing and why he's doing that with his expertise. I just spent time with the Minister of Finance and Estimates, and he went out of his way to decline to answer some of my questions during estimate because he's the Minister of Finance and not the Minister responsible for health infrastructure, and that I would be better placed to ask my questions of the appropriate 
ministers. So I think it's important that we hear from those ministers on this bill. The other concerning element of an omnibus bill with 17 pieces of legislation touched is it prevents us as legislators from voting for one and not the other. So on behalf of the citizens of King South, if I want to vote for higher fines on fisheries, or I want to vote for the ability for firefighters to fight fires, but at the same time, I'm unhappy with elements of the budget. I have to vote against things I believe in and I want to vote yes on. And each member of this House voices get silenced by an omnibus bill. You get one vote on 17 pieces of legislation. So I think it's really, really important for us as legislators to think what we are doing in this House when we are silencing our ability for ourselves, each and every one of us, to on behalf of our constituents be able to say to them, I supported this because of that and I voted against this because of that, but with an omnibus bill Nova Scotians get less from their MLAs. 55 members of this House, Nova Scotians are getting less from each and every one of us because we cannot stand and vote for this and against this because this government has chosen for their own political expediency to continue the practice of shorter and shorter sessions in this legislature. And I think that's sad and concerning. And not giving Nova Scotians the respect that their voice deserves. So it's a very, very disappointing piece of legislation. Clearly, for political, I will try not to impute intent. But what I can say, as I have said, is we are silencing the voices of Nova Scotians with an omnibus bill. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the financial elements in this, and I won't uh, go on at too much length uh, because it is second reading and we, we do need to hear from Nova Scotians. And uh, certainly, uh, again, one of the negatives of an omnibus bill is it's titled the Financial uh, Measures Act. So I don't know that a firefighter in Cape Breton is going to know what this is about because it's called the Financial Measures Act. But let's talk. Uh, a little bit about uh, bracket creep, and we've talked about it. We introduced a bill on it. We're happy that the government is is uh, including bracket creep, ending bracket creep uh, with this legislation. We're the only province. We are the last province to end bracket creep. Important thing to do 
I thank the government for bringing in that in the legislation. But what I do take issue with is the government's position, its spin, that this, that this is the biggest tax break in history. This is not a tax break. I asked the Minister of Finance in Estimates whether he agreed with this statement. If we end bracket creep, in real inflation adjusted dollars, after they pay their tax, Nova Scotians will have no more money to spend than they did before bracket creep. He did not answer yes or no. He got into a confusing discussion about higher wages and uh, inflation. Well, let's be crystal clear. Bracket creep is not a tax cut, a tax break. It's removing the hidden tax increase that has been part of our tax system for far too long. It is not a break for Nova Scotians. It is simply being fair and honest with Nova Scotians and not taking more tax by inflation to the, to the government's advantage and to the taxpayer's disadvantage. So this is not the biggest tax break in the history of Nova Scotia, and I've spoken about this. In 20, it doesn't take place till 2025, $13.4 million. on, and I don't have the number now, I think it is $4.2 billion in personal taxes. And we've advocated for some tax relief, and this is not tax relief. And surely, in the windfall amounts of equalization and federal transfers, and an economy doing better, and taking in $2 billion from Nova Scotia taxpayers, $2 billion more the government is taking in from Nova Scotia taxpayers than they did three years ago. $2 billion. And the best tax relief is to remove $13.4 million of a hidden tax increase next year. I don't know anyone in this House except maybe one that would say this is the biggest tax break in the history of the province. It simply is not. It simply is not a big tax break for Nova Scotians. So let's do a couple comments. I think there are six parts of elements of this bill um, that are related uh, to finance. Um, I don't have too much to say on them, uh, but I just do uh, want to uh, comment briefly. The Chartered Professional Accountants Act amendments, um, uh, you know, on, on first blush, uh, looks like some housekeeping and updating of standards and uh, I think the ones that are best uh, positioned uh, to comment uh, on this would be the Chartered per Professional account Accountants and uh, I'm hoping we will hear from them at law amendments. Um, the second item is the uh, Consumer Protection Act amendments uh, to align with other consumer protection legislation in Canada. Sounds like a housekeeping item. Uh, can't see that there would be many problems with that. Um, 
the Gaming Control Act amendment, um, again, minor, uh, but is significant. It's to align legislation with, with this government's desire to eliminate boards. So in 2022, the government, this government eliminated the board of directors for the Gaming Control that Act, as they have done in so many parts of government. And we've taken issue with most of them. I, now, I don't know the, the functionings of the Gaming Control Act board and how serious this is, but it is a uh, standard practice of this government to remove boards, get them out of the way so that decisions uh, can be made in ministers' offices. And, uh, and certainly we have uh, some questions with many of those decisions that are being made. Then there's the Gypsum Mining Act, uh, uh, Income Tax Act, uh, maybe more of an issue with uh, natural resources, but uh, it's probably associated with finance. Um, I think uh, the ability to amend royalties are long overdue. Um, again, we might want to hear from the Mining Association on that, and hopefully we will uh, hear from them uh, during the uh, during law amendments. And then finally, uh, the changes to the Income Tax Act, uh, which is in essence the indexation uh, with respect to bracket creep and uh, other uh, surtaxes and thresholds. Again, uh, welcome news for uh, Nova Scotians, um, but clearly not the biggest tax break in Nova Scotians history. And, uh, and it's not just me saying that, it's the Taxpayers Federation, it's the Fraser Institute. Anybody in the financial world uh, recognizes uh, that it is, uh, recognizes it for what it is, and it's not a tax break. Uh, so with those uh, few comments, uh, Mr. Chair, um, I look forward to uh, hearing from uh, folks at Law Amendments. I look forward to hearing from the ministers responsible for portions of this act, and I will now take my place. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member, Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so I'm uh, happy to rise and start um, the debate on the Financial Measures Act as tabled. Um, we share concerns about this omnibus bill um, that has 15 pieces of legislation and creation of two new acts, neither of which have major financial implications puzzlingly. Puzzling and I think uh, I would have to uh, agree that, you know, this bill that came out uh, when it was tabled is, is evidently um, an attempt to rush debate on a number of different issues that have no financial implications, um, that go across, you know, a range of departments. Um, and, you know, I think uh, it will limit um, public understanding of what's in this bill, and there's some really important pieces in here. It will limit the ability of stakeholders um, to respond. So, you know, a lot of stakeholders who are, say, concerned about personal health um, information and how it's kept and accessed by the government um, might not recognize that they should be concerned when they see an act respecting certain financial and other government measures. Um, so, you know, we are starting to hear concerns from physicians about the changes recommended in the Personal Health Information Act, and I certainly hope that we have the chance uh, in, these, uh, in law amendments and in these chambers to hear from uh, folks uh, and, and get an explanation about why this change when, uh, you know, we're not sure the health regulators are in support and people are concerned. Um, one of the pieces that uh, we are pleased to see moving forward, although why as Schedule B in the Financial Measures Act is um, 
you know, is a question to me. Uh, but you know, we're fi we're glad to see the government finally moving forward on an office for children and youth. It's long overdue. It's the results of decades of advocacy, and as well uh, as part of filling the recommendations from the 2019 <coughs> Nova Scotia Home for Coloured Children Restored Inquiry. Yet, it's buried in Schedule B of the Financial Measures Act. And again, people who are uh, working with children and youth, um, working in terms of uh, child rights, might not know that this act pertains to them, although we are doing our best to get the word out. Um, and this starts the process, but uh, there's, there's not enough here. So there's no timeline for the actual um, implementation of even these actions in terms of um, identifying a commissioner. Uh, there's no budget for the office, uh, and there's nothing on the actual structure. And so I think this piece is really important, and that is actually going to be the focus of my comments tonight, maybe into tomorrow, um, is about uh, why we need a commission, a commissioner for children and youth in Nova Scotia, and how that should be structured. So I think it's important to start by asking ourselves, what do we know about children in Nova Scotia? Um, many of us know children in Nova Scotia, uh, but we also need to look at some of the aggregate data that we have available to us. So the 2023 report card on child and family poverty in Nova Scotia from the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives highlights that in the previous year, the child poverty rate in Nova Scotia increased by 11.4%. This was a record-setting single-year increase. And it results in 35, that more than 35,000 children, or one in five children in Nova Scotia, living in poverty. Nova Scotia's child poverty rate is the fourth highest in Canada and the highest in Atlantic Canada. We often like to try and be leaders in Atlantic Canada. This is a list that we need to move uh, to the bottom of. Um, you know, uh, I was looking at the One Chance to Be a Child report, which I'll also take some time to go through. Um, and when that was published uh, in 2022, really the research started in 2018, but there was, you know, a pandemic and people were busy. Um, you know, at that time, we were talking about one in five children living in food insecure households. But this 2023 report, we're looking at more than one in four children live in food insecure households. Um, and, and we know from reports of folks working on the front lines at food banks, um, the increasing number of children that they see coming seeking uh, food with their families. And, uh, you know, the other thing about uh, child poverty is it's, it's something that the government can do something about. So we can actually say no child in Nova Scotia should live in poverty, and we can identify some actions to fix that. And by not doing that, I mean, we actually really, you know, it takes a, a quite a sophisticated analysis to understand what the end result is of having people, of having children growing up without their rights, rights to safe housing, right to food, right to education, right to a healthy environment, all their rights being violated. The cost now is, is exorbitant, but it only increases, it only compounds. Um, as uh, when people don't have what they need to flourish and to develop. Um, so there's lots of, you know, like I said, there's lots of things uh, that we could choose to do today. You know, if we had, say, had a <coughs> separate bill on ending child poverty, maybe then you could put the act respecting the commission as part of that. That might have been, that might have been a good fit. Um, but time and time again, folks who spent the time looking at the data, understanding the stories of Nova Scotians and followed this for decades, um, are pretty clear of a couple of steps. One is to implement a poverty reduction plan for Nova Scotia and end child poverty by 2026. We could do it. We're literally sitting in this building choosing not to do it. Um, and we can establish the Child and Youth Commission immediately. Significantly improve income support to lift families with children out of poverty. Fundamentally transform the child welfare and social assistance system. Remove barriers and expand access to universal public services. Uh, and protect children's rights to housing, address racism, decolonize systems, and there's others. So, uh, 
you know, so that's one uh, expert and one one group that's been advocating for the creation of a commission. Um, <laughs> One of the challenges we have had in Nova Scotia, actually, is that we haven't actually had a, a good amount of data on how children and youth are doing. Um, and so a major initiative was launched uh, through the IWK, uh, through uh, with Dr. Strang involved, and with folks at the Healthy Populations Institute at Dalhousie, as well as partners from uh, in Indigenous communities, African Nova Scotia communities, and youth themselves to gather what we have in terms of understanding what's happening with children and youth in Nova Scotia and to understand to, well, as it says, one chance to be a child, a data profile to inform a better future for children and youth well-being in Nova Scotia. And, you know, the, the as I gathered this for today, you know, one of the things I reflected on is that when we started this in 2018, uh, and you know, and we're still using this as our basis today. But actually, there were some kids who were like a little bit younger in 2018, and now they're a little bit older. There's kids who were teenagers and are now adults, and we've missed our chance along the way to make their lives better. Um, so the one chance to be a child data profile tried to answer um, a number of questions about the experience of children and youth in Nova Scotia. Are we secure? Are we learning? Are we healthy? Are we happy? Are we connected to the environment? And do we belong and are we protected? The questions were guided by USF Canada's Index of Child and Youth Wellbeing, um, which was also a process that I was involved in. And again, brought together youth, uh, youth advocates, youth service providers, researchers, government officials, to really understand, you know, of course we want all children and youth uh, to have the best possible best possible start. We want all children and youth to have their rights fully recognized, both for their experience each and every day and for their future and for our future. Yes. And so these, we need to know how, how folks are doing. And so the information in One Chance to Be a Child uh, was gathered from provincial, national, and international surveys, and as well was, was then contextualized working with, as I said, um, indigenous communities, African Nova Scotia communities, and youth themselves. And uh, really grounded in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which I also think is really important to understand in the context of uh, establishing a commissioner for children and youth in Nova Scotia, because this is really the basis. So um, this was ratified by Canada in 1991, really as a result of recognizing that children around the world uh, were not achieving the outcomes that we want. We're not having access to uh, safe housing, safe food, safe schools. Um, they weren't developing in the way that would actually both ensure that they are uh, respected fully as individuals at that time, but also become the, the population of the future sort of in the best way they can be, in the strongest way they can be. So the Convention on the Rights of the Child um, contains a number of articles around uh, you know, different areas of children's rights, including an adequate standard of living in Article 27, access to education in Article 28, and opportunities for play, leisure, and rest in Article 31. Just to refer to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, there's also some other key pieces that I think should be guiding all of the work that we undertake in this house, uh, because this, I feel, is the most important work we could do. So in the preamble for the, um, uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, it does include you know, recalling and linking back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that the United Nations have proclaimed that childhood is entitled to special care and assistance. And I think we can all agree with that. Um, there's some key principles. State parties shall respect and ensure the rights set forth in the present convention to each child within their jurisdiction without discrimination of any kind irrespective of the child or his or her parents or legal guardians, race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national, ethnic or social origin, property, disability, birth or other status. 
and state parties should take all appropriate measures to ensure the child is protected against all forms of discrimination or punishment on the basis of such status. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child also takes as one of its guiding principles the best interests of the child. So determining the best interests of the child is a primary consideration and reminds institutions, services, and facilities of state parties responsible for the care and protection of children, that's us, uh, shall conform with the standards established by competent authorities, particularly in the areas of safety, health, um, and other areas. And then another key article is Article 12, which guarantees um, children and youth the right to participate in decisions that affect them. And that's also been an important part of the work around One Chance to be a Child and uh, should also underpin the work of the Office for Children and Youth. So Article 12 reads, state parties shall assure to the child who is capable of forming his or her own views the right to express those views freely in all matters affecting the child, the views of the child being given due weight in accordance with the age and maturity of the child. And for this purpose, the child shall in particular be provided the opportunity to be heard in any judicial and administrative proceedings affecting the child either directly or through a representative in a manner consistent with procedural, with the procedural rules of national law. And so I think it's really important that we ground ourselves in these pieces. So um, it's, you know, it's a, yes, it's a, it's a document, it's a convention, um, but it really articulates uh, what we want for children and what we need to be working towards. So in the one chance to be a child um, recommendation section, so they reaffirm the principles guiding the work in terms of from the CRC, including non-discrimination, best interests of the child, the right to survival and development, and the views of the child. And the recommendations focus on what this group, and it's an extensive long list of authors and collaborators, um, and uh, I, you know, I suggest you go check out the report yourself. But so the two recommendations uh, on what we view the most urgent threats to children and youth well-being in Nova Scotia is poverty and systemic racism and discrimination. And we've already had a walk through some of the poverty statistics that let us know that, in fact, children are not doing okay in Nova Scotia. And so here are some of their recommendations. One, listen to children and youth, consider their rights, and focus on their best interests when making decisions. And so, you know, I think what we can ask ourselves here is, are we, are we focusing on children and youth? Are we making decisions in their best interests? Um, the One Chance to Be a Child report also called for the creation of an independent office for children and youth rights. So they say, we recommend the provincial government in Nova Scotia take clear action to fully realize Article 4 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child regarding appropriate measures needed to fully implement the breadth of unique children's rights. Um, and so, enact in action 7, enact legislation to establish an independent body dedicated to children and youth rights. And that's what we hope is happening uh, with the Office for Children and Youth. And as I noted, um, children and youth were part of the process of developing the One Chance to Be a Child report and the recommendations um, throughout the process. And having worked for years with children um, in uh, uh, situations and, and uh, projects that seek to realize their rights, I can tell you that uh, I would say almost universally that young people uh, prioritize the idea of having an independent body within uh, within their province and within within Canada as well um, that is looking out for them and that's looking out for their peers because they know it it, it's, it resounds with them that they are holders of rights but that uh, their rights are not always realized so um, I'm, I'll just read you a couple of um, highlights from the one chance to be a child youth forum and I'm not using this as a prop, I swear to God, but it's really beautiful. You should all go have a look at it on the website. Um, and, so, uh, and so here are some summary notes. So uh, here are some of the issues that really stood out to uh, the young people. Poverty, bigotry, healthcare issues, mental health stuff, bullying, housing, 
high-risk behavior and accessibility. And so they tried to answer um, you know, some of the questions in terms of um, you know, what are their values around social justice, honesty, kindness. They tried to answer the questions, um, you know, are we connected? And you know, people reflected that they're not taken seriously, um, that vaping isn't being dealt with amongst young people. Are we secure? And they reflected that the poverty and the racialized economy were huge barriers. Um, and they also identified some of the things that would make an ideal province. Um, so this is interesting, I think, for all of us when we think about the budget before us, um, as well as establishing a commission for children and youth, a commissioner for children and youth in Nova Scotia. So um, some of the things that they talked about were more physical activity in schools, better and affordable education, address bullying, practical skills taught in schools, um, focus on future, not the past. Education demystify and destigmatize substances, make it harder for kids to buy drugs, alcohol, and nicotine, uh, harm reduction, access to mental health services, clean energy, wildlife protection, housing solved. So that's a that's a big expectation of these young people that that we should be trying to to uh, fill healthy ecosystem and and there were more. So um, so this you know and I think. From this uh, exercise and from the youth that were engaged throughout the development of the um, One Chance to Be a Child report, they actually did a lot of thinking about what is necessary to consider in terms of the establishment of a Child and Youth Commission in Nova Scotia. I'm just going to take a... Um, and so some of the things that they recognized was that children and youth in Nova Scotia need independent, specialized representation to promote the implementation and protection of their unique rights and interests as a matter of fostering their well-being. And uh, they identified the high-level principles that represent a vision for how the Nova Scotia Child Youth Commission or Commissioner could provide independent human rights representation for children and youth in the province. So here are some of the things that they identified that in fact are not uh, articulated in the act um, establishing the office and uh, thus not contained in Schedule B of the FMA. Have an independent legislative mandate. Here was a great opportunity uh, to safeguard and promote the rights and best interests of all children and youth in Nova Scotia. The mandate must serve all children and youth, not just those inter interacting with systems of care, and be explicitly rights-based, as informed by the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It should be established in keeping with foundational norms for independent human rights institutions for, for children. By doing so, children and youth in Nova Scotia would enjoy the full breadth of the representation provided by similar entities internationally in other parts of Canada. And in fact, we don't have to guess at what these norms are. This is the great part about setting up uh, the Office for Children and Youth, is that we know advocates have thought a lot about it. We have data. We know that there's young people across Canada and across Nova Scotia who've thought lots and lots about what this role should look like. And we also have models in, in many, uh, almost all provinces across Canada, as well as at the national level and jurisdictions in the UK and Belgium. Um, and so, so in particular, some of the norms uh, include the general comment number two of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child and the United Nations Human Rights Principles relating to the status of national institutions, otherwise known as the Paris Principles which are the international minimum standards required for effective and credible protection and promotion of human rights. They provide critical guidance on mandate, recommended activities, resources needed, and accessibility to children and youth required to establish effective independent human rights representation for children and youth. And this is one piece that we, you know, is uh, actually quite concerning not to see in Schedule B um, and not to see outlined here is that um, a child needs commissioner or commissioner needs to be independent of government. It needs to direct its own agenda and establish priorities and activities that best serve children and young people within the bounds of legislation. This independence means the commission should be adequately funded 
and given sufficient infrastructure to carry out duties. And what I would also say is that uh, across the country, there are also um, really uh, strong best practices about how to engage young people in the identification of the priorities for the commissioner and how to engage young people really throughout the research, uh, representation and consideration of the issues that an office or commission uh, looks at. And there's so many things that an office for children and youth could do. So, uh, you know, some of these are proactive, right? So some of these are educate, provide outreach and raise awareness amongst children, youth, families, professionals, and the wider public about the best interest and rights of children and youth. <coughs> this means that members of the, the, the office might give presentations, plan conferences, collaborate or initiate, initiate research initi initiatives, support practice networks within professional groups or within communities, develop rights awareness campaigns, or even help design education curricula around children's rights. And that piece is really important. So, you know, in the work that I have done over the years in children's rights and engaging young people, um, young people are well aware of the world they live in. Uh, they're well aware of the experiences that they're having, their families are having. Um, and, uh, and they're really able to reflect on what's working and what's not working. <coughs> they, they are the people living this experience, and so, but they often don't even know they have rights. So the first thing, uh, you know, that an office can do is to develop education curricula around children's rights and to share that and to let children know that they have a body in the province of Nova Scotia on their side. Um, currently, you might wonder what happens now for children and youth in Nova Scotia. So currently in Nova Scotia, um, children who access or are involved in special systems of care, so the child welfare system, who are in detention, uh, and, and you know, and you know, or advocating for their rights when they're seeking services, can access services through the office of the ombudsman. But it's not; it's only in the interaction between uh, that child and their individual <laughs> circumstance. So, you know, uh, when there's when there's uh, folks who are when there are young people who are detained, for instance. Um, they are able to reach out to the ombudsman's office to make sure that they have everything from access to education, access to being outside. Uh, I know that uh, children and youth have contacted the ombudsman's office because they have not been given a toothbrush, so to ask that they be provided with a toothbrush. But an office can go further than that. So I've worked with um, advocates' offices across the country, Nunavut, the Yukon, British Columbia, uh, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and PEI, and New Brunswick, um, uh, in uh, in various um, on various different issues, and seen how powerful their work can be. So, for instance, in uh, Saskatchewan, the Saskatchewan Advocate for Children and Youth undertook. Um, a youth engagement and a community engagement process where they visited um, all the northern Saskatchewan First Nations communities um, because of the crisis around youth suicide in those communities to really understand from young people what, what was creating this crisis, what were the barriers to them um, feeling safe, what were the barriers to access and care, and what ideas do they have and do their communities have for strengthening their experience. And they, in that, engaged over 1,000 young people across northern Saskatchewan and then uh, with young people presented their report to government. They presented their report nationally, they presented their report internationally to talk about what they had learned and to advocate for themselves and their communities. Um, another example would be um, in New Brunswick, the off is now the Office of Children, Youth and Seniors. But again, uh, has a you know standing youth advisory <laughs> structure that um, uh, advises on the work undertaken by the office. Um, I think we are running to the end of our hours for tonight's debate. Um, I will move to adjourn debate on this uh, on the Financial Measures Act second reading. 
The motion is to adjourn debate on Bill Number 419, the Financial Measures 2024 Act. With all those in favour of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Contrary behind it, nay. That motion carries. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That concludes government business for the day. I move that the House do now rise to meet again on March 20th between the hours of 1 p.m. and 11 p.m. Tomorrow is Opposition Day, so I will turn it over to uh, my Honourable Colleague, the Opposition House Leader, to call business. But after Opposition Business, and um, we'll move into Committee of the Whole on Supply, Committee of the Whole House on Bills, and second reading of the FMI. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, following daily business and question period, the bills that will be called are Bill 422, 434 and 144. Thank you very much. Motion is that we do now rise to meet again tomorrow, March 20th, between the hours of 1 and 11. Will all those at 1 p.m. and 11 p.m. Will all those in favour of the motion please signify by saying aye. Contrary minded nay, that motion carries. We stand adjourned until tomorrow.